Okay, good morning and welcome to the City Council's 12th day of hearings on the Mayor's Executive Budget for Fiscal 2020. My name is Daniel Drum and I chair the Committee on Finance. We are joined by the Committee on General Welfare, chaired by my colleague, Councilmember Steve Levin. We've also been joined by Councilmember Keith Powers and Adrian Adams, and I think others will join us shortly. Uh, today we will hear from the Human Resources Administration, the Department of Homeless Services, the Office of Civil Justice and the Administration for Children's Services, and the Department of Parks and Recreation. Before we begin, I'd like to thank the Finance Division staff for putting today's hearing together, including the Director Latanya McKenney, Committee Councils Rebecca Chasen and Stephanie Ruiz, Deputy Directors Regina Pareda Ryan and Nathan Toth, Unit Heads Dohaney Sampura and Chima Obacheri, Financial Analysts Julia Haramis, Frank Sarno, Daniel Krupp, and Monica Bujak, and the Finance Division Administrative Support Unit, Nicole Anderson, Maria Pagan, Latina Brown, and Courtney Summarize, who pull everything together. I'd also like to thank Robin Forth from my office, who has been with me at all these hearings. Thank you for all your efforts. I'd also like to remind everyone that the public will be invited to testify on the last day of the budget hearings, tomorrow, May 23rd, beginning at approximately 12 p.m. in this room. Please note that this is an updated time. Originally, we were supposed to start at 2, but we will now be starting at noon. For members of the public who wish to testify but cannot attend the hearing, you can email your testimony to the Finance Division at financetestimony at council.nyc.gov, and the staff will make it a part of the official record. Today's executive budget, uh, start, the budget hearing starts with the Department of Human Resources. The human, it starts with the Department of Human Resources Administration and the Department of Homeless Services. HRA's fiscal 2020 executive plan introduces new needs of 30, $37.2 million in fiscal 2019, $78.6 million in fiscal 2020, $41.2 million in fiscal 2021, and $42.2 million in fiscal 22 and fiscal 23. However, none of these new needs include the items called for in the Council's budget response, which included additional funding for employment services and hiring more eligibility specialists. Similarly, in DHS's fiscal 2020 executive plan, new needs were added to the budget without addressing those items called for by the Council. DHS's executive budget introduces $85.5 million in new needs, in addition to $4.2 million in other adjustments and $22 million in savings for fiscal 2020. The administration did not heed the council's call to provide funding for social workers in hotel shelters and to prioritize permanent housing. At today's hearing, I look forward to learning on how HRA and DHS plan to fund several of its core programs while addressing the various types of budgetary risks identified by the council. Before we begin, I'd like to remind my colleagues that the first round of questions for the agency will be limited to three minutes per council member, and if council members have additional questions, we will have a second round of questions at two minutes per council member. I will now turn the mic over to my co-chair, council member Steve Levin, for his statement, and then we will hear from the commissioner of the Department of Social Services, Steve Banks. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. Thank you, Chair Drum. I'm council member Steve Levin, chair of the Committee on General Welfare. Uh, I want to thank you all for joining me for the Fiscal 2020 Executive Budget Hearing for the General Welfare Committee, held jointly with the Committee on Finance. The City's proposed Fiscal 2020 Executive Budget totals $92.5 billion, of which approximately $15 billion, or 16 percent, funds HRA, DHS, and ACS. With each social services agency here today, we will be asking how new needs, savings programs, various funding and headcount adjustments, and new policies will impact and enhance each agency's ability to serve the most vulnerable populations in New York City. This morning, we will begin with testimony from the Department of Social Services, which encompasses the Human Resources Administration, and the Department of Homeless Services. As the largest social services agency in the country, HRA provides cash assistance, emergency, emergency food assistance and SNAP, HIV AIDS support services, otherwise known as HASA, legal services, anti-eviction services, rental assistance and rental arrears, and many other public assistance programs for low-income New Yorkers. DHS provides transitional shelter for homeless single adults, adult families, and families with children in accordance with New York City's right to shelter mandate. DHS also helps clients to exit shelter and move into permanent and supportive housing. Since the adoption of fiscal 2019 budget, of the fiscal 2019 budget, HRA's fiscal 2020 executive budget has grown by 
$6.2 million, or approximately 1% to $10.2 billion. New needs added to the fiscal 2020 executive budget totals $78.6 million. These new needs include funding for cash assistance as clients stay on cash assistance longer, requiring the city to contribute more towards caseloads, and the city's share for higher rental assistance levels for the family homelessness and eviction pro, uh, prevention supplements, otherwise known as FEPS, and end the epidemic. Funding for technology for, uh, for te technology upgrades for both HRA and DHS, additional funding for HRA's current leases for office space, funding for IDNYC card renewals and outreach, funding for the translation services at the June, June primary election in conjunction with the Civic Engagement Commission, and funding for additional public engagement unit headcount to focus on voter engagement and polling outreach in conjunction with Democracy NYC. Additionally, the fiscal 2020 executive budget backfills $125 million in state funding as a result of the enacted state executive budget, which now requires the city to contribute 10% of temporary assistance for needy families as well as, well as TANF funding. This funding shortfall impacts both DHS and HRA and supports, and supports shelter and support shelter costs and cash assistance. It's uh, very unfortunate that the state um, uh, transferred that burden over to New York City and, as part of their budget. Uh, for DHS, this since the for DHS since the adoption of the fiscal 19 budget, DHS, DHS's fiscal 2020 executive budget has grown by 55.8 million dollars, or approximately 2 percent, to 2.1 billion. Overall, DHS's proposed fiscal 2020 executive budget is largely comprised of the cost of providing shelter to the over 60,000 individuals a day that are in New York City's shelter system. For the upcoming fiscal year, the agency's executive budget includes two new needs totaling $22.9 million. These new needs are for shelter security reorganization to transition from city-employed peace officers to contracted security providers, and for funding to upgrade information technology systems covering nine projects, one of which is the CARES system. This year, the administration reintroduced the program to eliminate the gap, otherwise known as PEG program, uh, where each city agency had a PEG target to reach that would be reflected in the executive budget. HRA and DHS had a combined PEG target of $50 million. In the executive budget, they have a combined citywide savings amount of $50.9 million, slightly exceeding this target for fiscal 19 and 20, and that we would like to learn more about today. Even with these impactful investments, more can and should be done, and we need to think more deeply about where we can most effectively allocate city resources. The Council put forth several proposals in our fiscal 2020 preliminary budget uh, response for additional programs at HRA and DHS, none of which were funded in the executive budget. Of these proposals, I am particularly, particularly disappointed that no funding was allocated towards social workers at hotel shelters. Social workers provide vital support services to the city's homeless, including case management and access to mental health services, especially given that the average length of stay for families in shelters over 400 days, families, including children residing in shelters and, hot and hotels, need social workers and should be provided with the same support services as those residing in purpose-built shelters. And just as an aside, I think that it's deeply unfair that for a family that goes to PATH uh, to receive shelter in New York City when they're in need, um, that, uh, that it's, a, it's, it's entirely a gamble where, which type of facility they can go to and what type of services they will then receive. If they're lucky enough to be at a tier two shelter or purpose-built shelter where, uh, where there are social workers and wraparound services available to them, um, uh, that's, that's one avenue, um, however, uh, increasingly families are, are placed in hotels where they don't have access to those types of services, and that's just not fair. We need equity across the board, and we need a reasonable amount of services for these families, particularly in hotels where there are not uh, linkages to a lot of their community supports and, um, and, and the resources that they really need on site. And so, I'd like to continue to work on that with you moving forward. 
Before I welcome the commissioner, I'd like to acknowledge my colleagues who are here today. I think uh, Chair Drum did, but we've also been joined by Councilmember Brad Lander and Councilmember Barry Grudenchik, Councilmember uh, Antonio Reynoso, and Councilmember Keith Powers. Um, and we expect to be joined by more throughout the course of the hearing. I'd like to thank the General Welfare Committee staff for their incredible work in putting together today's hearing as well as the preliminary budget hearing, which has been an enormous amount of work. Uh, Julia Haramis, finance, financial analyst, Dan Krupp, financial analyst, Frank Sarno, financial analyst, Dohini Sampura, unit head, Aminta Kilowan, senior counsel, and Tanya Cyrus and Crystal Pond, senior policy analysts. I'd like to also thank my chief of staff, Jonathan Boucher, and my legislative director, Elizabeth Adams. And now I'll turn it back over to Chair Drum uh, to swear in Commissioner Banks and administrators. Uh, I'm going to ask the council to swear in the, the panel, please. Do you affirm that your testimony will be truthful to the best of your knowledge, information, belief? I do. Thank you. Whenever you're ready. Good morning, and thank you, uh, Chair Drum and Chair Levin and members of the Finance and General Welfare Committees for the opportunity to testify today about the Department of Social Services fiscal year uh, 2020 executive budget and our reforms to improve benefits and services to low-income New Yorkers. Before proceeding, I want to congratulate Chair Levin again on the uh, birth of his uh, second child and appreciate the time you've been spending with us. And I also want to thank the staff of both the Finance Committee and the General Welfare Committee and uh, Chair Levin's uh, office who have been spending a lot of time trying to work through with us various details. The baby's watching at home, by the way. <laughs> okay. Well, Live on our stream. conference call yesterday, I thought the baby made a tremendous contribution on some of the points that came up uh, agreeing with a lot of our policy yes, choices, I thought. Uh, my name is Stephen Banks, and I am the Commissioner of the New York City uh, Department of Social Services. In this capacity, I oversee the Human Resources Administration, HRA, and the Department of Homeless Services, DHS. Uh, joining me today is DSS First Deputy Commissioner Molly Murphy, HRA Administrator Grace Bonilla, DHS Administrator Jocelyn Carter, DSS Chief Program and Planning and Financial Management Officer Ellen Levine, and DSS Chief of Staff Scott French. My testimony today will outline the major components of the DSS HRA DHS FY20 Executive Budget, which reflects our continued efforts to improve our policies, programs, and operations to address income inequality, fight poverty and homelessness, and help New Yorkers in need get back on their feet with dignity. We know we have much more work to do, but we have made progress over the past five years against the backdrop of operating in a housing market with limited affordable uh, options for our clients due to decades of underinvestment. However, our progress is imperiled by the funding cuts from the state. When I testified before the council at the preliminary budget hearing in March, we were fighting to prevent a cut to New York City's reimbursement for family assistance, funded by the Temporary Assistance for Needy Families, or TANF. Despite our efforts to eliminate this cut uh, from the New York State budget, we are now facing a very real $125 million cost shift for our annual public assistance and family shelter funding to New York City. The city's executive budget accounts for this lack of support from the state, along with other reductions in other agencies whose funding is included in the DSS budget. Nevertheless, we remain firmly committed to addressing the underlying structural barriers our clients face and improving the ways in which clients interact with our agency and access the benefits and services they need. For HRA DSS in the FY20 executive budget, the FY20 HRA DSS budget is uh, 10.21 uh, billion, consisting of $7.92 billion in city funds, an increase of $34 million in total funds, and $192 million in city funds from FY19. This increase is primarily due to one-time revenue adjustments in FY19, funding to address, address the state budget cost shift to the city, an increase in city funds for cash assistance and rental subsidies, and collective bargaining adjustments in FY20. As part of the citywide savings plan, DSS HRA will eliminate 379 vacant positions in FY19, and in FY20 in the baseline, the reduction is 107 positions. The primary new funding that is reflected in the FY20 HRA DSS executive budget is as follows. Addressing cuts in the state budget. 31 million in city funds has been added in FY19, and 62 million in city funds has been added in FY20 and in the baseline to cover the new 10% city share of TANF-funded family assistance, which is a cost shift from the state to the city. Cash assistance, 40 million in city funds was added in FY19, and 35 million in total funds, and 75 million in city funds were added in FY20. 
This funding addresses an expected expense increase resulting from HASA ending the epidemic program, which provides enhanced HASA benefits for people with asymptomatic HIV, fewer sanctioned cases, and higher uh, costs related to rental assistance, including the additional city share of the city FEPS program required under the Tejada litigation against the state. HRAIT, $37 million, $12.5 million in city funds was added in FY19, and $38 million, $26 million in city funds was added in FY20 to support planned DSS HRAIT projects to enhance client services. IDNYC, $2.4 million all city funded was added in FY20, and $1.6 million in FY21 in the out years to support enhancements to the IDNYC program uh, related to the renewals. Implicit bias training, 1 million was added in FY19, 2.2 million for FY20, and 1 million for FY21 to implement implicit bias training for all 17,000 DSS, HRA, and DHS staff. We've already launched de-escalation training, and we're implementing anti-bias, trauma-informed training this year. Body-worn cameras, $330,000 was added in FY19 and $100,000 for FY20 to provide HRA peace officers with body-worn cameras. Last year, we conducted a pilot program in which 40 DHS peace officers were trained in and wore body-worn cameras in their daily work, serving, supporting, and protecting New Yorkers in need as they get back on their feet. With the success of this DHS pilot, this FY20 budget allocation will complement the funds previously designated for, for DHS to provide body-worn cameras to DHS peace officers to increase transparency and accountability as we continue to improve policing and safety for New Yorkers experiencing homelessness and seeking services from our agency. Capital funding. The HRA DSS 10-year capital plan for FY2029 totals $275 million. 192 million city funds, including 183 million for technology to streamline operations, 88 million for facilities, maintenance and equipment, and 4 million for vehicles. Savings initiatives to support the FY20 budget, HRA DSS will build on efficiencies we've already achieved over the past five years, including repurposing 550 central administrative positions to frontline staffing in FY15 and integrating HRA and DHS in 2017 to streamline operations. Savings initiatives include headcount efficiencies, one-time revenues in 2019, transitioning the last city-operated domestic violence shelter to a not-for-profit operation, assisting eligible individuals to enroll in supplemental security income benefits instead of cash assistance, maximizing revenue from federal grants, and other streamlining administrative savings efforts. For DHS, the FY20 DHS executive budget totals $2.12 billion, consisting of $1.28 billion in city funds. The FY20 DHS new needs include the following. Addressing cuts in the state budget. Similar to the HRA DSS, $31 million in city funds has been added in FY19, and $62.6 .6 million city funds has been added for FY20 and in the baseline to cover the new 10 percent city share of the TANF-funded family assistance, which again is a cost shift from the state to the city. Further, $85 million was added in FY19 only as a federal funding adjustment. For DHSIT, $12.5 million was added in FY19 and $11.5 million in FY20, all city funded, so to, to support planned DHSIT projects to enhance client services. Security, $11.4 million was added in FY20 and $18 million in FY21 in the out years to support shelter security reorganization initiatives. Initiatives included in the preliminary budget that are now reflected in the executive budget uh, are primarily street programming. $25 million was added in FY19 and in the out years to fulfill the FY18 funding commitment for outreach services, drop-in centers, and safe haven beds. For the DHS capital budget, the 10-year capital plan for FY20 to 29 totals $649 million, all city funded, including $108 million for homeless family facilities, $425 million for single adult facilities, $44 million for technology projects and equipment purchases. To support the FY20 budget and continuing efforts to achieve savings, the savings initiatives include the elimination of vacant positions in FY19 only, enhancing efforts to secure federal funding, transitioning a shelter that's partially operated by a not-for-profit to a full not-for-profit operation, and reorganizing shelter security to enhance de-escalation. We've worked over the past five years to reform policies and practices to enhance access to benefits and services for clients. 
Most recently, we successfully advocated for a change in the state regulations that will eliminate finger imaging requirements for cash assistance clients. This change in policy will treat clients with the dignity they deserve, continue our efforts to fight against the stigma that some associate with receipt of our assistance and services, and eliminate an extra barrier for families and individuals to obtain much needed benefits. Many clients were forced to take a day off from work or find childcare just to complete the unnecessary administrative requirement of finger imaging. As we found when the state eliminated the finger imaging requirement for SNAP food stamps clients uh, several years ago, we already have other effective mechanisms in place to prevent and detect public benefits fraud. This regulatory change will allow clients to more easily assess, access cash assistance and is an important additional step to help us reduce in-center wait times by eliminating as many in-person appointments for cash assistance as possible and continuing to move cash assistance transactions online as we've already done for SNAP food stamps. Some additional examples of these reforms which are supported in the FY20 budget include the following. Clients no longer have to work off the benefits and the work experience uh, WEP program at city and not-for-profit agencies, completing tasks that would not prepare them for gainful employment. We eliminated the WEP program and replaced it with new opportunities and subsidized jobs, more diverse internship and community service opportunities, and education and training programs to help clients move forward on a career pathway in jobs and sectors that are in demand. We successfully advocated for a change in state law to permit clients to count approved coursework at a four-year college program towards cash assistance work requirements and obtained college degrees to greatly enhance the ability to earn a living wage. We successfully implemented a pre-conciliation, conciliation, and pre-fair hearing case review and conference process to avoid work requirement related sanctions and advocated for a change in state law to give clients in New York City an opportunity to cure a work requirement violation at any time and avert previous durational sanctions. We also successfully advocated for reduced state sanction period for SNAP food stamps. That means that clients do not have to lose their housing, go hungry, or forgo buying clothes for their children because of a sanction that lasts a prescribed period of time, regardless of a client's willingness to meet their work requirements under federal and state law. We put in place new protocols to prevent unnecessary case closings and state fair hearing challenges decreased by more than 47%. As a result, clients have access to benefits they need and the city is no longer subject to a potential $10 million annual state financial penalty for unnecessary hearings. To reduce the amount of unnecessary case closing, sanctions and hearings before an adverse action is taken, we make sure that all required support services are in place, reasonable accommodations are honored, mailing addresses are correct and notices are set in the correct language. And now conciliation appointments are scheduled at Career Compass and Youth Pathways employment providers rather than at job centers so that we can re-engage clients immediately and avoid unnecessary extra in-office appointments for clients. We now make it easier for clients to continue their assistance if they submit required documentation within 30 days of a case closing and ensure that missing paperwork doesn't cause someone to lose their benefits. We stopped the practice that required all homeless clients to travel to a single HRA job center in Queens. Now clients can seek assistance at a job center in the home borough. We changed the practice that required all seniors to travel to a single HRA job center in Manhattan. Now seniors can receive services at a job center in the home borough. We work with the Urban Justice Center's safety net project to implement a universal receipt. This provides individuals who completed visit to a job or a SNAP center with a document that indicates the nature and date of the visit of contact and a copy of this receipt is also available at Access HRA. This receipt process is now codified in a local law as a result of legislation sponsored by Speaker Johnson. We've transformed the process for cash assistance to reduce unnecessary office visits. Clients can now submit recertification questionnaires online, submit documents from a smartphone. Through the Access HRA app, clients can open an account to gain access to over 100 case-specific points of information for cash assistance and SNAP in real time including application and case statuses, upcoming appointments, account balances, and documents requested for eligibility determinations, and clients can make changes to contact information, view eligibility notices electronically, request a budget letter, and opt into text message and email alerts. We improved Access HRA with a client benefits portal so that SNAP applications and recertifications can all be done online without having to go to an HRA SNAP op office. Now clients conduct 87% of applications online and documents can be submitted vo via a mobile app on a smartphone. 43,000 documents were submitted via mobile app in April alone. We instituted on demand a practice where SNAP eligibility interviews are now conducted at client's convenience and time preference by phone instead of a rigid four hour window 
to help clients access the benefits they need to purchase food. The percentage of completed telephone eligibility interviews increased from 29% in 2013 to 97% in 2019. We created a provider portal, which with client authorization and MOU with HRA enables community-based organizations to view a client's case record in order to help the client with document submission, various case inquiries and application and recertification requirements. We began accepting a federal waiver without which clients who are classified as able-bodied adults without dependents were limited to SNAP food stamp benefits for only three out of 36 months if they could not find work for at least 80 hours a month in areas of high employment. And we're continuing to fight back against the Trump administration's efforts to make it more difficult for these clients to obtain food they need to feed themselves and their families. We institute a centralized rent arrears processing unit to ensure that rent arrears payments are issued by the required due date. We streamline the system for making New York City Housing Authority rent payments electronically rather than the old practice of paper checks. And we are developing a similar payment system for private landlords. Moreover, using Access HRA, clients can now confirm that the rent was paid to their landlords pursuant to a reform now codified in state law to provide such uh, confirmation. This makes the process easier for clients and gives them one less thing to worry about as they pay their rent. In 2014, 90 clients per year received reasonable accommodations. In settling the 2005 Lovely Age class action lawsuit, we began working with expert consultants to develop tools to assess whether clients need reasonable accommodations as a result of physical or mental disabilities. In contrast to the 90 when we began per year, there are currently more than 51,000 clients who have one or more reasonable accommodations. And working with Speaker Johnson when he was a council member and Housing Works, we entered the counterproductive policy that required clients with HIV to wait until they were diagnosed with AIDS to receive HASA assistance. Now clients have better access to services and housing assistance they need. With respect to DHS, as we reported previously, homelessness has increased 115% in our city from, 100, from 1994 to 2014, while some 150,000 rent-regulated apartments were lost and rents increased by nearly 19% and income increased by less than 5% in recent years. Through our comprehensive efforts, we've finally broken the trajectory and we've begun to reverse the trend. We know we have much more work to do, but these are the results that are beginning to take hold that are supported by the proposed FY20 budget. Keeping the census flat for two years for the first time in a decade, with the census now starting to come down, today the census was 58,000, uh, approximately 58,200 people. Doubling down on preventing homelessness, evictions are down 37 percent since 2013. Providing more permanent housing, enabling 115,000 children and adults to move out of shelter and avoid shelter altogether. Bringing people off the streets and out of the subways. Since Homestat began in April 2016, our street teams uh, have uh, helped more than 2,000 people come off the streets and subways and remain off. And transforming the city's approach to shelter, closing more than 200 substandard shelter sites and citing 43 new borough-based shelters to offer help as close as possible to the anchors of life like schools, jobs, health care, houses of worship, uh, family and support networks. Uh, I'm going to leave the rest of the testimony for the record and just conclude by saying with all of these components of the executive budget for DSS, HRA, DHS, we look forward to continuing our important partnership with the Council to overcome the state budget cuts for our agency and to keep improving the essential programs on which so many New Yorkers rely. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today and we welcome any questions you may have. Thank you very much. We have been joined by Council Member Moya and uh, Geez, uh, Commissioner, that was a quick reading of your testimony, but good reading. It's uh, full of a lot of work that I know many of you on this panel have been calling for for many years, and I wanted you to see your work. Thank you. Uh, very good. All right, let me start off with some questions on the HRA budget. In HRA's executive budget, there are several instances of funding allocated for services and programs that are outside the scope of the agency's mission. For example, the Civic Engagement Commission, Democracy in New York City, ENDGBV, and the Young Men's Initiative are all items that are currently funded in HRA's budget. Because these are outside the scope of HRA's work, it would appear that HRA is being used as a pass-through agency. So why are these programs in HRA's budget? Is HRA working on these uh, offices, and offices and programs, or is it just serving as a pass-through? I mean, essentially as a pass-through, but I want to emphasize these are all programs that uh, benefit our clients, and from the point of view of efficiency and use of city resources, 
to be able to make use of our uh, uh, personnel department and our budget department. Uh, it avoids having to create um, uh, additional uh, supports for those kinds of important citywide initiatives to place them within our budget. So will those programs be shifted to other agencies during the course of the fiscal year? No, those, for example, the uh, formerly the Mayor's Office to Combat Domestic Violence, which has uh, uh, been re uh, renamed uh, NDB, uh, for example, that's part of, uh, been part of our budget for a number of years, uh, and uh, similarly with other programs that are operated within our framework. Again, they benefit our clients, and the city is getting the economies of scale, if you will, by having uh, the HRA support structure, the DSS support structure, uh, support the work of those initiatives. And are these all new initiatives this year into the budget, or did you have them there last year as well? Uh, I believe the democracy initiative is a, is a newer initiative, and the uh, domestic violence office has, has been part of our budget for some time. Was there another one that you mentioned? I'm sorry. Um, Young Men's Initiative and... That, that, that's also been in our budget over, over a period of time. All right, thank you. Um, just want to talk a little bit about the uh, DHA, DHS monitor's report. So uh, the monitor report um, that we received from your office um, was in a different format than what um, council had wanted um, and, um, and, and agreed actually to at the time of the fiscal uh, 19 budget adoption. Um, can we get that form? Can we get that report in a different format so that it um, will be able to assist us in examining exactly what's there? Well, again, I, I appreciate the question. I think we have a good process with the monitor report. Uh, it was submitted exactly when it was required to be submitted, and the information uh, that we're able to provide. Uh, as a result of the agreement we did provide. I thought we had a very productive conversation with finance staff and uh, Chair Levin and, and uh, uh, general welfare staff yesterday about uh, additional information that has been requested uh, f by the council that we want to see how we can provide it. And I know there's going to be a working session uh, to see how to address needs. I think one of the realities is we've got the information in the format we've got it in. Uh, and uh, on the other hand, we've been pretty uh, transparent about providing information beyond that required in the monitor report when council staff are, uh, asked for clarifications and additional inf information. So I, th I think it's a very cooperative relationship between uh, council finance staff and uh, uh, the general welfare staff and, and our staff, and we'll keep doing that. So you'll keep meeting with the uh, finance staff in the future? Uh, absolutely. We, again, as I said, I know there's been staff-to-staff -staff conversations, and yesterday, uh, Chair Levin was gracious enough to have uh, his uh, newborn participating with us on one of the calls. Fully participating, wow. Mm -hmm. uh, very smart, just like the chair. Gurg <laughs> Gurglings of approval. Uh, okay, there you go. Yeah, I think on that call when I said, it, and we've submitted a complete report with everything you need, somebody gurgled, and we thought that that would resolve the whole matter. Um, okay, let's talk a little bit about uh, TANF. As a result of the fiscal 2020 state budget cut to the uh, temporary assistance for needy families, the city is now required to pay 10% local share towards TANF, resulting in a loss of $125 million in federal funding across the Department of Social Services. Can you describe the city's TANF responsibility with the 10% local share and how it will impl uh, implicate future budgets? Uh, thank you for raising this issue. Uh, Uh, by way of context, in the original state executive budget, there was a proposed cost shift of about $600 million from the state to the city uh, uh, overall across, uh, across uh, multiple uh, agencies and initiatives. Uh, at the end, the final budget uh, limited that to a $300 million uh, uh, impact. $125 million of that impact is uh, essentially a cost shift uh, for TANF, it's a state budget cut at the state level and, a sh and an increase to our budget here. Uh, I think it uh, certainly continues to have an impact on real benefits. These are not discretionary things, uh, the, the things that are affected. These are client uh, public assistance benefits, client HASA benefits, uh, DV services, family shelter. These are things that are mandates that clients are entitled to receive. And it means at the bottom line that we have $125 million less of state money available to meet these needs. 
Uh, it continues a trend that we've seen several years ago. There was a 10% cut at the state level, which is a 10% charge back to the city for emergency assistance for families. And I think as you see reflected in our budget, it means we can, we can do less of what we would like to be able to do to meet client needs. I think with the support from OMB and the mayor, we've been able to, to incorporate the cut by, uh, with additional revenue uh, from the city budget. That means additional city tax levy for uh, funding that was once provided by, by the state level. Uh, and TANF, of course, is a federal state program. So uh, it, it's an impact that, that's directly felt for clients, and you see it reflected in our budget. You see the growth reflected on additional dollars that we had to put in the budget related to this. It's a tremendous cut. Uh, thank you for your answers. I want to talk a little bit about emergency food assistance, or EFAP. Uh, as more New Yorkers struggle to obtain and maintain vital SNAP benefits as the result of changes made on the federal level, the cost of food continues to increase in the city and with its uh, increased reliance on the um, food emergency assistance programs. Have you observed increased use of EFAP pantries? And if so, can you describe it? Well, I, I think what we're seeing in this year is the benefit of the partnership with the council in increasing the funding for EFAP. Uh, I think a priority of the administration and a priority of the council is increasing the funding and a priority that we had in increasing the funding was to increase the capacity of the providers to be able to store and distribute uh, additional quantities of food that they're purchasing. I think that the system is adjusting to that change. Uh, but I appreciate that in, in your slide you're highlighting uh, something that I referred to in the testimony, which is the SNAP threat. Uh, and this relates to 75,000 able-bodied adults uh, without children who, um, prior to this administration, were limited to food stamps in uh, three months out of uh, any 36 months as a result of federal rule because the city de determined not to take the, the ABOD waiver, which every other county in New York State had, uh, and uh, 46 or so other states had taken it. New York City finally did in 2014, which preserved benefits for these individuals. Then two years ago, uh, we began to experience limits on, our, on that waiver for New York State uh, uh, by the federal government, and we've now got 5,000 ABOD or able-bodied adults without children in parts of Manhattan and parts of Queens that are no longer covered by the waiver, which means that their food stamps is, are, are at risk if they can't find 80 hours of work a month. Uh, and now, uh, despite the fact that Congress staved off an even a, a deeper cut uh, for, a, for the ABOD uh, clients, uh, there's a, a proposed regulation that we oppose uh, strenuously that's an end run around the Congress. And that's a great concern that there was a compromise in Congress not to impose deeper ABOD cuts and uh, now the, there's a, a Trump administration rule. So we're uh, gonna follow that very closely and we'll monitor what the needs are based upon uh, what we see happening and we'll certainly continue to do what we've done with other Trump administrative proposals. Don't take for granted that they'll be implemented, fight against them. Are any providers reporting shortages at EFAP pa pantries? Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't quite hear you. Are any providers reporting um, um, shortages at EFAP? I think that uh, providers had challenges during the federal shutdown, uh, and uh, we were all monitoring very closely, and uh, fortunately our congressional delegation and others led the, led the way to bring that to conclusion. But we're, we're monitoring the situation very closely, but I want to say again, it was a tremendous infusion of resources jointly by the, by the council administration to get that money into the baseline and resolve a long, long-standing problem over many years of a, a gap in funding. Do you have an, a contingency plan if uh, these proposed changes to SNAP benefits are implemented? Well, I think it, it reminds me of when the Trump administration proposed to eliminate HEAP, which is uh, uh, benefits to help people with their heating costs. Uh, 780,000 people in New York City, many of them senior citizens, were threatened with the loss of HEAP benefits. And we said, we're not going to stand for that. We're going to work with the congressional delegation. We're going to fight back. We're not going to plan contingencies which would communicate to the Trump administration that we can manage the, the draconian cut. Uh, we're going to fight back because people can't bear a draconian cut like that. And we're taking the same approach to this food stamp cut as well. We think it's uh, ultra vires, a legal term for it does, has no support in 
uh, in the statute because the ultimate bu budget compromise specifically did not adopt the policy that Trump administration is now trying to implement by regulation, essentially ignoring the authority uh, of the Congress as, an, as a co-equal branch of government. Okay, thank you. Um, I just want to talk a little bit about the human services contracts and fiscal 18's adopted budget, the administration baseline funding to increase the indirect rate to an average of 10% for New York City's human services providers across agencies. As a result of community organizers stating that the indirect rate was not realistic, however, Council recommended in its preliminary response that $106 million be included in the executive budget to increase the indirect rate to 12%. So uh, why was this increase not included in the executive budget? And um, how does the indirect rate vary across DSS providers? Well, as you know, this is a, a citywide issue, and I know it, it's come up in, in other hearings, and I think the administration as a whole is looking at, looking at the issue and how best to address it. I know that for our uh, Department of Homeless Services, uh, part of our budget, we've invested uh, nearly a quarter of a billion dollars in additional resources in the not-for-profit sector. It's a very important partner of ours, and that's why we've allocated dollars uh, of that magnitude uh, to enhance and support uh, their work. We've adopted model budgets in the, for our adult protective services providers, and we're gonna continue to work with uh, uh, Homeless Services United, which is an important partner of ours, as well as the hum Human Services Council uh, to evaluate what's needed. But as I said, this is part of a larger city, uh, citywide uh, look at what's needed for the sector. But in terms of our budget, as I said, we put in a quarter billion dollars to uh, to enhance uh, the ability of our not-for-profit partners to provide their services. Okay, thank you. I'm going to turn it over to my co-chair, Steve Levin. Thank you very much, uh, Chair Drum. Um, checking to see if we've been joined by anybody else, but uh, we're, we're all set right now. I do want to acknowledge um, the Deputy Commissioner uh, and former Council Member Annabelle Palma, who's here as well. Um, so we're very happy to have her at our agency. Your loss is our gain. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Um, so I'll start with uh, with HRA. Um, uh, the some of the technology system upgrade funding. I wanted to see if you could uh, speak a little bit more in depth about um, where some of the new needs will be in terms of there's a $25 million uh, for DHS IT upgrades. I'm sorry, the, the, the IT stuff is, uh, the questions will be spread across both uh, HRA and, and uh, DHS. Um, uh, there's an additional $24.4 million for HRA IT upgrades, and then you spoke about uh, significant capital allocation in the 10-year plan uh, 183 million dollars for technology to streamline operations. Um, you know, technology upgrades have uh, enormous potential uh, when it comes to service delivery in um, in DHS and HRA, um, right. and uh, I think that it's it's a it's the type of thing that should be um, constantly uh, uh, upgraded uh, as technology continues to be exponentially um, uh, more effective and um, can make a significant, you know, cut down on, on costs, increase efficiency, increase effectiveness of, of the service delivery. Um, so if you could speak a little bit about um, both what the funding is going to be doing uh, and, and then kind of how we're looking strategically at technology integration uh, when it comes to service delivery uh, and uh, meeting the needs of clients. Uh, thank you for, for that question. I think it really goes to the heart of some of the changes that we've made over the last several years. And just to <coughs> highlight again, the investments we've na made so far have made it possible for 87% of the applications transactions for food stamp SNAP benefits to be online and for 93% of, uh, of interviews uh, to be online. You, you'll remember, I know you, 
you and I both were critical of the system. The system used to be you had, you had to be at home and wait to get a call in a four-hour window, and we've created a, a very different uh, system now. The, the, the uh, app on your smartphone where you can submit documents now, all this is aimed at creating the client experience and interacting with our agency like any one of us in the room today might interact in our banking world, uh, not having to go to a teller to get, a, to get uh, a certain things done or accomplished or pay your bills. All of those things are things that we're all taking for granted in the, in the modern world. Our clients didn't have access to those kinds of things in the food stamp program, so everything required a visit to the office. Mm -hmm. And so we can see a decrease in foot track of more than 40% in our SNAP uh, program, and our clients never actually have to come in because they can do all of their transactions. Uh, online. So the, the, that means that the people who need extra help can come into a SNAP office and get that extra help. It also means that clients can get extra help from a CBO, a community-based organization, where they can, uh, uh, through our provider portal, which we encourage providers to be part of, so that if the client can't navigate the system online, doesn't want to come to the office, they could go to any of the reputable groups in your district, for example, and get that kind of, uh, get that kind of uh, help. So that's the vision that really animates the continued investments, and let me talk to you about some of them, uh, and I appreciate the opportunity to do so. Mm -hmm. So for example, some of the investments in, in capital now, for example, relate to uh, uh, case processing and functionality for cash assistance recipients because uh, in order to do the SNAP and the food stamp uh, 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 reforms that we put in place, we needed certain waivers from the federal and state government. We need them as well for cash assistance, and we're moving on that same trajectory with cash assistance with the kind of approvals we need to make the changes. So, Sorry, case processing. What, what, uh, what type of, of waivers are, uh, are, are needed? So again, to go back to what we had to do, you had to get a waiver to allow for on-demand telephone interviews uh, for cat for a SNAP uh, food right. stamps. You had to get a waiver uh, to enable uh, certain documents and things to be submitted online. Right. Similarly, for cash, mm -hmm. uh, various uh, to move our system to give clients the ability to recertify or do certain transactions on the phone, we need various waivers. We have had, I think you can see from when I testified to the uh, proposed state regulation now to eliminate finger imaging right. comes out of those conversations to eliminate the need for these in-office visits. Is it fair to say that um, <laughs> while the number of cash cases is significantly lower than the number of SNAP cases in, in New York City, um, the, the, um, uh, the level of involvement uh, that a client has to go through and uh, um, submitting paperwork, submitting documents, uh, going for, for certain interviews um, is, is, is much more significant for, for cash than it is for, um, and, it's, and it's also the requirements are more stringent uh, from the federal government uh, and, and the state. Um, uh, well, I think that there are potential barriers to access to both the pro programs that are embedded in federal law, uh, but we've been able to uh, bridge those barriers and increase access on the food stamp side with st strategic waivers and increased access through uh, yeah. technology. We're moving in the same direction on the cash side now. For example, uh, the uh, ability to um, submit recertification uh, forms uh, online is a breakthrough. Mm -hmm. The ability for certain clients to be able to, uh, to conduct some transactions by telephone is a breakthrough. But the uh, investments that are reflected in our budget mm -hmm. continue that same vision of reducing barriers even within, as you correctly identify, a more complex series of federal and state law requirements. But we're investing in the technology to create on-demand telephone interview functionality for cash assistance recipients, the same as we did for food stamps. Mm -hmm. And we're also implementing uh, the same sort of functionality to help workers manage their workload that we're implementing, uh, we're already imp uh, in the process of implementing for SNAP. You're correct that the two systems of requirements 
uh, don't line up. It's not a, a cookie cutter. If you're eligible for this kind of benefit through the SNAP program, you're, you're eligible for the same uh, kind of benefit through cash. The different series of questions are asked, different series of, of resources are looked at. But we thought, we think that what we've been able to do for clients by moving to the online system for SNAP, that there's still great potential to realize that for cash, and we're getting a, a cooperation or a collaboration with the state to give us the kinds of waivers we're, we're needing to do that in the budget that was reflected that vision of that, those kinds of funds. Similarly, uh, we are creating a landlord management system to create a payment portal yeah. so that we can, we, we piloted this with NYCHA. As I said in the testimony, the idea that when I came to the agency that we were paying money by check mm -hmm. and delivering it to every individual development yeah. uh, uh, to some degree. We, we needed to eliminate that approach. We created a central rent processing unit. Mm -hmm. uh, we've, we've accelerated our rent payments. Now yeah. they have to be paid by the due date rather than by the date with which the request was made. That was what was we were confronted with five years ago. But the technology is, allowing, is going to allow us to create a, a more seamless payment system between tenants and landlords. Mm -hmm. uh, we also so are putting and that's something just to just to point out. I mean, that's something that that we've been hearing for a very long time as a, a major source of concern from landlords, and one of you know one of the myriad uh, reasons that they um, cite uh, f for why they engage in some sometimes discriminatory practices or in vi violation of our human rights law um, and not providing or not engaging turning down people uh, through source of income discrimination. But often when, when talking to uh, landlords, the, the one thing, one refrain you will hear is, is the, the timeliness of rent payments. I mean, look, we've done focus groups with landlords. Uh, I, I hear from them at town halls. Uh, we took the, the step of creating the central rent processing unit to streamline payments to uh, get out of a system in which checks were being typed by a typist all over yeah. the city, and that's made a major advance, but there's still more to do, which is the reason why we're, we're going to be using technology, uh, which we think will streamline the payment process and address the kinds of concerns that landlords have, have raised uh, about the receipt of payment. Another capital investment is for our one number, uh, which is to create a more streamlined way for clients to contact us. Again, in the same way that we all do in our lives, we, mm -hmm. we might uh, uh, you know, have complaints about calling a central number, but you can call a central number and actually get help. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we're, we're creating a way in which we can have a one number approach and people can call and have uh, uh, things resolved on their, on their cases uh, and that, uh, by that means. And we've already worked on that by giving more ability to our existing info line staff to schedule appointments and resolve uh, certain matters and look up information and, and give information. You know, back to my legal aid days, one of the most common problems clients had was trying to get a budget letter. Now you can get that online through Access HRA. Mm -hmm. So all, every place we're going, we're trying to reduce barriers to access, mm -hmm. improve the client experience, and address worker workload. And so the technology that's in our budget reflects that vision, the technology investments reflect that vision, both in terms of the online work and in terms of one number and additional steps that we're taking. Um, and then I'm, I'm just one other question about this. Or, uh, I'm assuming that, uh, that kind of long-term strategically over the course of the next 10 years, there's a team at DSS that is kind of examining emerging technologies and, uh, you know, kind of, because the, the technology today is going to be obsolete in 10 years. And so trying to stay ahead of the curve a little bit and not, not, not playing catch up, um, you know, so that we're, you know, constantly behind in terms of what the latest, what, what's available to, you know, bank consumers, uh, you know, uh, should be available to, to clients at, at DSS. Th that's the spirit in which we're proceeding. And, and I, but I would add another dimension to it, which is that we have a business uh, a process improvement initiative uh, 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 that uh, resides within uh, 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 Alan Levine's area. And we're constantly looking for ways in which we can address client access and address worker workload. It's, they go hand in hand. Uh, and uh, looking at ways in which we can make better use of technology and what are the trends. We also have an ongoing relationship with Do It, 
uh, so that what we're doing is part of an overall city strategy uh, and, and coordinated as well. Um, and then some of the funding is in the expense budget, some of it's in, in the capital budget for technology. How is that? Well, there are small non-capital, I'll give you a couple of examples. That would be, for example, maintenance and upgrades. And so anything that's capitally eligible, we're going to uh, fund through the capital budget, but things like upgrades and maintenance are not capitally eligible. Got it. Okay. Um, so moving on to uh, client services at HRA, um, we didn't include in the executive budget uh, um, additional headcount for eligibility specialists. Uh, this is something that we've been hearing is a um, could have a, a meaningful impact uh, on the level of client services in, in HRA. Can you speak a little bit to why that is not part of the executive budget and whether there's an opportunity to include that um, moving forward in, in the uh, adopted budget? So I'll, I'll, I want to um, I want to focus very directly on the functions that the, that staff perform. Uh, they're members of Local 1549. They do terrific work. I have great respect for, for, for that local and for the work they do. But there are two trends that are uh, uh, affecting the staffing levels there. And so simply saying, why don't you add more individuals uh, in that particular title don't take into consideration the, the trends. That particular title is within our Medicaid program. And I think as we've testified previously, the, the Medicaid program is transitioning to the state uh, as re through state law. Uh, we have been working very closely with the state to prepare to maintain some residual local district uh, HRA functions because we think that for clients, it makes sense to have some residual local role. Uh, and when I first came in five years ago, this was something in partnership with Local 1559, uh, 1549, and we were very much focused on not having a state takeover mean that there'd be no role at all for us as the local district interacting with people on a local level. Uh, but nonetheless, the basic construct of state law is that, that much of the Medicaid program will be taken over by the state. And so decreases in eligibility specialist staffing reflect that. Having said that, there was, has been a delay in the state takeover as they're piloting, experimenting, make sure that it is implemented effectively. Uh, and so in 2018, we added 188 additional eligibility specialists to reflect the fact that the pace of the transition had been uh, uh, not as uh, not at the pace that both the state and we thought it would occur at. In terms of the SNAP program, remember now that 87% of the applications are online, 93% of the applications uh, of the interviews are by telephone, and so foot traffic has now decreased by 40, uh, more than 40% in our offices. So the need for the exact same staffing that we had in that title before these changes is not continuing. That doesn't mean we don't have a need for people in that title and to provide those functions, because they provide vital functions in terms of processing cases that come in online, vital, case, vital functionality for, for interviewing people by telephone, but the footprint of our offices is smaller. The footprint of our offices is smaller. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, well, what's going to happen when you make this technology change in cash assistance? Again, we have tremendous needs for workers to provide services to our clients, just not in the way that, you're, that you're, you asked us in the budget response to do. Right. Just one job that uh, technology can't supplant that I could think of is an eligibility specialist because somebody has to be there to make these determinations. Um, uh, and have the uh, expertise to do that. Uh, absolutely, that, there's, there's no substitute for a eligibility determination made by a trained uh, 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 staff member, but the numbers of people that you have in your Medicaid staff mm -hmm. to make those determinations will be reflected, mm -hmm. uh, will, will be um, affected by the number of people who are now seeking their benefits on the state exchange. Uh, rather than directly from us, and the numbers of eligibility determinations needed in person mm -hmm. 
changes when there are more determinations that can be made based upon online submissions and telephone. Um, do we believe that, the, so at the moment, you, do you believe that the, the head count is sufficient or, or is it something to continue to examine? Uh, we're always examining it. We're always examining trends. Uh, we didn't add the head count because we, th we were mm -hmm. comfortable that the uh, staffing reflected the uh, workload at the, on the Medicaid level and the staffing reflects the workload on the SNAP level, but we monitor it constantly. And I think as Are you see- Are we overtime for, for eligibility specialists right now? Well, I, I, I'm glad you asked that question because sometimes overtime can be perceived as workload. I think that overtime has to be understood how it is in our programs. So if a client comes to a job center at four o'clock because they're in dire need of hel our help, we can't tell and shouldn't tell the client at five o'clock the office yeah. is closing. Right. Uh, that puts a, a burden on our staff, but our staff came to work for us to help people, and that results in overtime. So looking at overtime as I think frequently it is examined, is it a reflection of understaffing? Mm -hmm. For us, it's a reflection of the nature of the work that our staff does but and the important role they but play. But you're in the monitoring it over time Absolutely. To, to see if it's increasing. Uh, Absolutely. I, I mean, mean as, I think uh, just to go back to the to what I said earlier, the additional uh, the the addition of 188 uh, eligibility specialists for the Medicaid program in that title that you're asking about in 2018 was directly reflected on uh, looking at the staff workload and the client needs and adding additional staffing. And I think it's a we have a very good partnership with OMB and looking at those things constantly. Okay, I'll turn it over to my colleagues for questions, and I'll uh, wrap up at, afterwards. Okay. Okay, thank you. We've been joined by Councilmember Rosenthal. We now have questions from Councilmember Adams, followed by Councilmember Lander. Thank you, Chair Drum, Chair Levin. Good morning. Good morning. Commissioner, always good to see you here. Good to see you, too. I like to see you other places, too. I know, right, right? <laughs> good morning to your staff as well. Uh, welcome. Good morning, Annabelle. <laughs> Commissioner Banks, uh, I just have uh, all roads lead to Southeast Queens for me. For me too. For you too. Okay, good. Good. good, good. Only when we're talking, though. <laughs> <laughs> I should I should have said especially when we're talking. Yes, I apologize. Yes. Special especially. Topic. I hope the record will be corrected to reflect that I said especially. No. I'm sure it no. will. Okay. All right. So, you know, broken record here. We know that District 28 has one of the highest concentrations of hotels used as homeless shelters in the borough of Queens, uh, if not the city. So uh, in looking at this from a planning perspective, uh, we see that the, the decision to house families in hotels has fostered a local homeless hotel industry of sorts. Uh, with a new 10-year capital strategy and a commitment to turning the tide, has the administration considered converting hotels into actual shelters or into affordable housing uh, apartments. I know the last time you were here, uh, there was a big question mark. We know that uh, Southeast Queens has an inordinate number of hotels. Um, most recently, another one has come up in my district on Liberty Avenue, close to the Van Wick. It's a Comfort Inn, and no one in that community is comforted uh, by that Comfort Inn. So, and that's relatively new. It's been there maybe three months. So I had asked the last time whether or not we would be looking at, with the turn, you know, the turning uh, the tide program, whether or not we are now looking at in Southeast Queens something that will be tantamount to uh, zombie houses and turning zombie houses now into zombie hotels. What is the plan, if any, for these hotels? So let me, uh, I appreciate the question, and I also appreciate uh, from where it comes. And you have been a, 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 both a great representative for your area and a great partner in looking with us about how to, how to do better for our clients. Uh, but just to make it very clear for, for you and for your constituents, we've made a, a very clear commitment in, in that particular community uh, uh, district that we're going to be reducing the number of beds uh, for shelter by half because there's about twice as many beds there as are needed to provide the shelter that is the, the vision for turning the tide, which is to give people an opportunity to be housed as close as possible to children's schools, to employment, to health care, houses of worship, family and friends, the anchors of all of our lives. And uh, 
what's happened all across the borough of Queens is, and again, I say this on the record, there are uh, about 9,900 people sheltered in Queens, 46% of them in hotels. There are about 8,100 people from Queens in our shelter system. So we're gonna right size, as our plan does, the, the, the number in the borough in rough proportion to the number from the borough as opposed to what it currently is. Uh, and then though, when we get out of all the hotels, we're gonna have a deficit of about 2,700 beds. So we'll be getting out of hotels even as we're opening some new shelters. In your district, for example, we are opening, uh, for example, a new shelter, but that's helping us close hotels. And I think we're closing two hotels uh, in response to opening that one shelter, which is, if you, as you can see where we're going, we're cutting the number of beds in half, and so we're adding a shelter and closing two hotels in that particular neighborhood. Where which, which hotels? Uh, I know that we identified them for, for staff, and I'll get you the exact information, maybe even during this hearing, I'll, I'll have it for you. But there are two hotels we're closing and opening the shelter that we recently cited, and I appreciated your, your perspective on that. You're asking a, another question, though, which is, as n other people are opening hotels that aren't, we're not in them, we're not gonna get in them because we have a plan to, to get out of them, and we, 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 as you can see, we're getting out of some in your district right now. Uh, should we look at those structures as, a, as, a, as buildings to reclaim for permanent housing or shelter? I, I would be more than willing to work with you or any other council member uh, who, can, uh, who has a, uh, a hotel that there's a concern from constituents that it's gonna become a hotel and the community would rather have it be a shelter run by a, not for, a reputable not-for-profit or turned into supportive housing or something else, be very much interested in having that conversation on a site-specific basis. We'd be happy to evaluate any site that you think that's opening as a commercial hotel. We're not using it for potential use as, uh, as housing for our clients or a shelter for our clients. So I, I guess my follow-up question would be moot then. Uh, would any of the $649 million in your 10-year strategy f be used for repurposing commercial hotels into apartments or shelters? Uh, no, but uh, I think one of the slides, I think you put it up there, shows that we, we're, we have a strategy of converting cluster sites back to uh, permanent housing whenever we can, and we've just converted an, a number to permanent housing. So if there was a particular commercial hotel site that we could repurpose, uh, we would certainly analyze that in the same way that we did the, the cluster conversions, which is can we do that as part of the overall city approach to increasing the supply of permanent housing. But again, for, we're happy to look at that comfort in if that's a site that, that would make sense to see whether or not it could be made into supportive housing, it could be made into permanent housing, or a freestanding shelter, which might be better for the community and the, and the clients than the existing commercial hotels, which we're gonna be getting out of. But that's, a, that's gonna be a site-specific conversation with you and, and, and us, I think, to okay. see if that makes sense. I, I look forward to continuing the conversation with you, Commissioner. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Councilmember Lander, followed by Reynoso. Thank you uh, to the chairs. Thank you guys all for being here um, and for all the work that you have laid out. I'll start by saying on one of the issues that's not about um, uh, Department of Social Services but that is in the budget, the new uh, Civic Engagement Commission, which is something I worked hard for in the charter revision last year mm -hmm. and feel very enthusiastic about. I went for their first meeting earlier this week. Okay. Dr. Sarah Saeed is their new leader. It is great, seven positions to run citywide participatory budgeting and do poll site language access and stand up an entire new civic engagement effort is not sufficient. So I'm not gonna ask you about it, but I just wanted on the record that while, you know, you have to start with one and you'll have to go through seven, uh, the seven positions that are in the budget are not sufficient to achieve the goals and the charter mandate that that position has. So I want that on the record and I will be continuing to push uh, on those issues. Um, uh, I want to ask a couple of questions about shelters, and if I have time, um, maybe I'll come back on a second round to ask about pathways to jobs. Um, uh, I, we are working together to get these two shelters on Fourth Avenue uh, uh, cited in a way that is successful, and I appreciate the engagement of your team. Uh, one challenge that we're having is working out some of the issues around the nearby school, 
which I think has the possibility of having as many as a quarter or a third of its students next year be kids coming from the shelter. And it's challenging to plan for because the shelters are not going to be open in time for us to know how many kids are coming. Right. Right. But the school needs to have the ability on day one to set up the right number of classes, to have the supports in place, and the way school budgeting works is making that really challenging. So mm -hmm. your team have been at some meetings on this issue, but I just I want a, you know, uh, a, a real public commitment that we can work together in ways that give the school the resources it needs to be able to serve all its students and not put them in a bind where they either have to overhire and risk having to pay DOE back, depending on whether the, you know, what number of students show up or not, and that's just proving but to be a challenge so far. You, you've been a, a terrific leader uh, on this it, on, on this issue in general, but in this particular area, which indirectly in your district, not so far from, from where I live either, and we'll work with you, um, and I also appreciate that should we fall short of working with you, you'll call me and we'll, we'll make sure that we don't fall short, but it's a commitment. I know uh, Jocelyn Carter and I are very committed to to, to working through these com complex issues that arise uh, for our children. Uh, and I appreciate your perspective, which is doing the best for our, for our clients. All right, thank you. And then my broader budget question is, some of the uh, shelter providers have raised this question that the duration of the leases uh, forecloses opportunities to think about buildings longer term, that they would be interested in potentially purchasing, getting mortgages that maybe they could then, you know, borrow to improve. They could think about long-term affordable housing if they had ownership, but that the sort of five-year lease with four-year renewal makes it, you know, difficult to get the kinds of financing you would get if you were going to try to buy rather than lease. Um, and I just wonder to what extent the uh, agency is looking at the possibility of either longer term leases or providing upfront capital to do something so that we could, because one downside is a lot of upsides to turning the tide relative to clusters and hotels for sure, but one downside is paying like a lot of rent money to private for-profit developers who at the end of the leases were going to have nothing to show for it. Whereas just like if you could buy your house instead of renting it, then over the long term you could use it for for public good rather than just for paying the rent. So I wonder if there's anything underway to look at that. We're definitely looking at that. We have a great example of that, the BRC Landing Road uh, 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 shelter uh, in the Bronx, which combines temporary and permanent housing together uh, and uh, not-for-profit ownership. Uh, in uh, turning the tide, this is something we prioritize, looking for ways to enhance and encourage not-for-profit ownership, and it's something that we are very committed to working through. Uh, in the not-for-profit community, there are great partners for this, and there are people that are, that are fantastic at both housing and shelter development, and I think uh, we're gonna, we're gonna have, be able to make some progress in that area. I appreciate you raised that issue. That's my other questions on the second round. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councilmember Grudenchik, followed by Rosenthal. Thank you, Chair Drum, and thank you, uh, Chair Levin. Uh, it's good to see you, Commissioner. Good to see you too, Council uh, It's Member. good to see Administrator Bonilla because she's come a long way from Eastern Queens, even farther than I came today, so I have to uh, say nice things to my constituent, <laughs> who is a good friend. Um, I'm delighted, of course, and I want to note the progress that we have made in emergency food, and I want to thank you particularly for helping to end that budget dance finally. And I know that it, uh, speaking to providers, I know it's made a tremendous difference in the lives of uh, tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of New Yorkers and also the unintended consequence when the government shut down that um, many of the providers were feeding federal employees who were otherwise right. gone hungry, so um, we never know where we're heading. Uh, I wanted to talk to you today about, um, I have seen a rise of people on the subways who might be categorized as homeless. I don't generally talk to them, but um, I've seen a tremendous and noticeable rise in the people riding the Queens Boulevard line, more so on the E train, but also on the F train. And I'd like to know, um, I know that um, Department of Homeless Services certainly does outreach, but I'd like to know what kind of coordination we have with the MTA, if you could talk about that a little. Sure, and I, I appreciate uh, your comments on EFAP. I, I want to just highlight that, th you know, these hearings have a tremendous benefit, and sometimes I know, uh, and the chair, I think, was very right on with this. Sometimes I know issues come up, the council would like us to take an action, uh, 
and I say, you know, we're going to try to work that through with you, and you might leave and say, oh, what did that really mean? I think EFAP is a good example of a partnership between uh, the the council and our agency well, I know in that, looking that, for ways to work things I know through. that you had that in your heart all along, so, and I'm glad that it has worked out. So uh, in terms of subway uh, outreach, I, again, I appreciate uh, uh, the comment that you made, which is perceptions uh, may not be re reality as to whether or not somebody uh, panhandling or uh, in the subway is uh, someone who's homeless. That's why we do a, a number of things to address exactly what you're raising, and there is a partnership with the MTA. So let me let me explain what we do and what the partnership is. So uh, the first thing we do is we have you know 24/7 outreach on the streets and in the subways. We find that in the subways it's most effective to be end of the line, and that gives us the ability to. Uh, intervene with people at the end of the line when the train is turning around and try to help them get off the line. Uh, we also uh, intervene at particular hotspot stations where there are people that are congregating who we've identified as clients. And we are create, we have a by name list, that's our approach to, to people on the streets. This is now codified uh, in a, another good, I thought, collaboration with legislation that was Councilmember Espinal's, in which uh, even beyond our time, there's a requirement for the city to create a by name list uh, of the people on the streets, and we use that as a tool to bring people off the streets. For the subways in particular, we have a joint contract with the MTA to fund BRC, uh, experienced outreach workers. They run that shelter that I described in response to Councilmember Lander's question. Uh, they run supportive housing. Uh, they have a very strong track record in this area. And they're very focused in bringing people uh, in. And in some of our street funding this year, we're providing some enhancements uh, to the street subway outreach that uh, BRC is able to do. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Chairs. Thank you very much. Uh, Councilmember Rosenthal, followed by Powers. Um, thanks so much, Chairs. And thank you, Commissioner, for all the good work that you're doing um, on what is really an intractable issue, so appreciate it. Um, I wanna ask about the contracts uh, in terms of the contracts with homeless shelters and, and even with supportive housing shelters and whether or not you believe in their ability to take care of the residents that they have in the building, in other words, are the contracts for social services rich enough to be able to adequately address the issues at hand? Um, I had a really interesting back and forth with the youth commissioner, I think last week, where he said that, um, in fact, they did a study and they found that the contracts were too thin and they wanted to add more a more robust social service component. And so what they did was um, do that, but because the money was limited, they're now serving fewer people. And it's, you know, I said it at the time, you know, it's hard for me to wrap my head around the, um, that notion that we accept the fact that were, our former contracts were underserving people, therefore we made them richer. But because we don't have any more money, we're serving fewer people. Um, I'm wondering what your take is on that. Um, the work that we've done in my district, we've worked really hard to make those contracts richer, you know, to have more caseworkers, to do things like, you know, have the security guards be part of the social service yep. team to try to bring some integration to the whole package. And um, I mean, are you having the same budget constraints that you're being told, eh, we can't really do the model budget, so make do with what you have? So uh, let me uh, first of all acknowledge, as you just did, that we've had actually a very good partnership in, in your district and trying to address concerns that were both client and community concerns. 
and we've had success in doing that. And I think that that's a, a tribute to leadership at the local level, which I which I very much appreciate. Um, let me focus on the two two of the kinds of contracts, just you know, by way of example, that you talked about. One is supportive housing, and the other is uh, uh, shelter. So when when I was asked to and did do the 90-day review back in 2016. Uh, one of the, the messages that was readily apparent was that there had been years of disinvestment in the shelter providers, uh, and that that was uh, affecting their ability to deliver services, uh, affecting their staff, affecting what clients, the client experience. And so as a result of that, we've made a nearly quarter of a billion dollar investment in the not-for-profit shelter provider sector. Those dollars, we're, we're reaching the conclusion of the model budget process now. And the intent of those dollars are to uh, increase the ability of the providers to provide the kind of services that they want to provide. I'm asking a little bit of a different question. Um, I understand that New York City is a big city and I understand our budget is big, mm -hmm. and I understand that 250 million sounds like a big amount of money. I'm asking something a little different. Okay. What I'm asking is, if you do a study, and the study says you need 500 million, and what you give is 250 million, is that, what, what is that? So, so again, I, I appreciate the spirit of the question, but the, the spirit in which I'm answering it is, we constructed this investment uh, with the model budgets because we thought it would be enough to raise the bar of services, help both the clients and the, the providers, and it's just taking root now. So we'll see. We think it's the right number, but we'll see as it's implemented, we think improvements for, for the agencies. You know, I'm going to defer. I know this. We a lot of people have questions, okay. and I'm not going to keep going. but. 2016, you did the model budget, and no, it's no. being implemented right now. I mean, that gets to the whole issue of how long it takes to uh, do contract uh, modifications. Actually, that's not that's not quite what I said. We did the 90 review in 2016. We began focus groups with providers in 2017 to determine what the needs would be once we made a uh, had a policy decision that we would invest significant money, and then we began negotiations in 2018. Now, I used to run a not-for-profit, and I remember uh, not liking a process in which the agency would tell me, take it or leave it. And so we didn't follow a take it or leave it process with the not-for-profit shelter providers. We followed an engagement process, focus groups, iterations, uh, and we'll have them done by, uh, by this time frame, which is about a year or so once we came to the conclusion of the focus groups. We could have just started with take it or leave it. We would have had all the budgets uh, done and everything in Did place. Did the number change between? For the certain providers, the numbers changed because it's, uh, it, it's within the model. How do you configure the staffing that a, one provider might need a different level than another one? Now, as to supportive housing, which I think is a relevant issue to get on the table, a lot of providers are having challenges with supportive housing, but they're not the NYC 1515 units because the funding for the new NYC 1515 units are were meant to break the problem that supportive housing providers had had for years, which is that rents were eating into the service dollars. And so we separated the rents from the service dollars and have funded those, uh, those programs at levels that are commensurate with being able to provide appropriate services. But many supportive housing providers still have old New York, New York 1, 2, and 3 units where they are experiencing exactly what you're asking me about, which is the rents cutting into the services. So in the, our, our own programs, our city-only programs, we've addressed what I thought was a real problem that providers identified to improve services. And maybe it's a good roadmap for going forward. I think you're doing the best you can. Um, I think there are a lot of constraints. I think a lot of them are monetary. It's why the council called for social workers in hotels. Um, it's why we're calling for increases in indirect rates where the social service providers are only getting 10% of their overhead costs paid for. I, I think there are funding issues, and this is a funding budget hearing. Understood. And um, I appreciate the work you're trying to do within the constraints that you have. I appreciate, I appreciate it. it. I appreciate the partnership with you.
We're going to move on now to Councilmember Powers, followed by Gibson. Thank you. Thanks for we, testimony. Oh, I'm sorry. We've been joined by Gibbs, Council, Council Members Gibson, Salamanca, and Traeger. Great. Thank you. Thanks for the testimony. Um, one of the things I noticed that you guys had not testified uh, on was around um, the career pathways and the and the jobs programs. I see we have some folks who are here and interested in that as well. Um, can you give us an update on where you are in terms of the career pathways program and implementing the concept plan that was put out, I guess it was a few years ago now, 2015 or sometime around that? So, uh, right. I mean, there was a citywide uh, uh, career pathways plan and then within the agency, as part of eliminating WEP, uh, we uh, went through a process to rebid all of our employment services contracts. And, uh, you know, all together, we are uh, spending um, $279 million on a whole range of employment programs, including $65 million in contracts with, uh, with vendors. And the program is now actually in the second year. Uh, year one was the startup last year, and now we're in the second year, we're beginning to see increases in job placements. Uh, we have now got about 6,600 clients connected to uh, education and training, which was something that wasn't an activity that, that as I testified earlier, was uh, supported previously. So we're beginning to see uh, impact from uh, not having a one-size-fits-all employment system uh, with giving clients the opportunity for alter alternative engagement. So uh, we don't require a client to only go to our programs. If a client has another program that they can participate in, we support that. Uh, and as I said, we're in year two. We're beginning to see uh, uh, progress, and we're going to keep evaluating uh, whether additional uh, 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 changes need to be made. But it's been a it's a pretty significant reform of a system that existed over a couple of decades. I appreciate it. And, and can you tell us the challenges in, in year one and year two in terms of putting people into a path for a career, um, not just a sort of you know, one shot at a job, but actually creating a sustainable long-term job? And, and second, since I'm probably going to run out of time, um, I know there have been some talk about bridge programs, doing you know, sort of doing some remediation around English and math and other, I think, skill sets at the same time as you're doing employment. Are we funding that? And can you tell us where we are in terms of those bridge programs? Okay, so let me, let me try to give you a, a quick answer. I think the biggest challenge in year one of the program was converting from a program that operated on sanctions and, uh, 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 and potentially a client could be without benefits for a durational period of time without uh, without any supports at all if they didn't accept certain kinds of employment assignments and eliminating that approach and creating a new strength-based approach uh, is a major system change and I think that was and is a, a challenge. I think in terms of uh, uh, the kinds of skills that you're asking me about, there, there are those pieces of our overall plan uh, and as I said, we're only in year two of it and we're still still enhancing efforts, and I'd certainly welcome any input that, that you or anyone else has about ways we could improve it. Are, are, but just in my just a follow up to that, are, are we funding the bridge programs right now? I think, I think there's a program, is a career bridge? Is that the name of it? Is that, are we funding those programs that do the bridge of both the remediation and, and skill building, and at the same time you're looking for employment? Right. There are, yes, for example, I've been myself to observe the classes uh, that are done in our Youth Pathways program where we have uh, great providers. I was at a class the Goodwill was running in which uh, there were a number of bridge supports being provided. I think we're certainly very interested in hearing from our providers about ways in which we uh, can enhance those kinds of supports. Okay. Thank you, the chairs. Thank you. We will now have questions from Councilmember Gibson followed by Salamanca. Thank you, Chair Drum and Chair Levin, and good afternoon, Commissioner, to you and your team. Uh, really thank you for all of the work, the partnership, particularly on behalf of my district in the Bronx. Um, I've seen a lot of progress, and obviously we have a long way to go. Um, first, I want to acknowledge the great work we're doing around Right to Counsel, where we are reducing the number of evictions across the city, and particularly in the Bronx, keeping more families in their home is a great investment. Um, I know that on the back end, we have been working with the legal service 
providers in terms of capacity and hiring staff, particularly supervisors, court capacity. So I know there are ongoing conversations that the city is having with the state office of court administration, uh, particularly Bronx and Brooklyn, uh, where there is just a huge capacity issue of space inside the court. Mm -hmm. Um, so I wanted to ask a few questions. My first sure. question relates to the cluster uh, and the acquisition of the 17 buildings. Uh, and I wanted to understand where we are in terms of timeline of acquisition, the not-for-profits that were identified, and what are we doing in terms of assessing the amount of capital work and renovations that will need to be done, um, obviously, now that it's under new ownership, and when should the council expect to get some feedback on that, and when could we see any reflection in the budget? Okay, again, thank you for your partnership on all the things you thanked us for our uh, partnership with. You've been a, uh, whether they're local issues, you've been a great uh, leader to work with, uh, and in terms of the citywide impact of uh, access to council, uh, a metric of a 37% drop in evictions, uh, uh, speaks for itself, a world in which uh, when I began as a legal aid lawyer a while ago, um, you know, one tenant out of 100 had a lawyer and now 30% uh, of the tenants have lawyers and we're only through two years of, of the implementation uh, or, uh, and I think we have uh, a lot more to, uh, to, uh, to do, but we're sh showing great signs of progress and I appreciate the partnership with the council on that. In terms of the, the uh, transaction that you're, you're referring to, let me just sort of review some of the key points of it in answering your question. Uh, there, are, uh, there are 17 cluster sites, it's a total of 21 buildings in Brooklyn and the Bronx. Uh, we uh, paid an average of $237,000 um, uh, typical uh, unit in, in Brooklyn cost $280,000, in uh, the Bronx cost about $225,000. And uh, of course, when units are purchased on the private market, part of the business plan is getting them out of rent, rent uh, regulation. And uh, here we had a real concern about the sale of these buildings uh, uh, to other parties where the building would have essentially been uh, half or more vacant because the criteria for uh, designating these buildings for the cluster conversion was that uh, in order to proceed with eminent domain, we needed at least half the units to be occupied as cluster units. So uh, if we had simply withdrawn from the buildings, you would have had a ha ha half or more empty buildings uh, that uh, would have been a real, real concern about the displacement pressures on the other tenants. So we found we thought it was imperative to obtain uh, uh, to finance the the purchase of these buildings by reputable not for profits uh, with roots in the community. Groups like Banana Kelly, for example, that you know, the actual purchasers are uh, Neighborhood uh, Restore and Joe, and then there are the, there are. A, a, team of not-for-profits which own each of the buildings. That transaction occurred at the beginning of April, so they are now in not-for-profit ownership. Okay. Uh, and 1,100 children and adults who otherwise would have been in shelter are now in permanent housing that will be affordable to them. They will have rent-stabilized leases. And the other more than 200 tenants uh, in the building, it's 220 plus tenants in the uh, 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 hu households, yeah. will also not have that displacement pressure. They will have affordable leases as well. So altogether, 2,000 tenants, both, both uh, 2,000 New Yorkers, both the permanent tenants and 1,100 formerly homeless children and adults now have affordable permanent housing with rent-stabilized leases. The units were upgraded uh, as part of the initial transaction, and now HPD and the not-for-profits are scoping out further upgrade of the entire building. Uh, that should be completed over the course of the year and then funded through the HPD budget. These units are part of housing, the Housing New York effort, and they're being treated just like any preservation unit uh, would be treated as a result of that. So your, uh, I'll just say, your leadership in the importance of not just getting out of the clusters, but wherever we can, converting them into permanent housing, I greatly appreciate it. It's really reflective in this transaction as I testified at the, uh, at the um, March uh, preliminary budget hearing, there are more to come. 
we, we believe that this is an important uh, uh, part of having not-for-profit ownership for these buildings, an important part of getting people out of cluster units and, and into permanent okay. housing. Okay, and I know my time is up, but I just have one final question sure. since uh, it relates to Bronx. Mm -hmm. The PATH Intake Center, um, we had DOE here earlier this week, and in our budget response, we are calling for more DOE staff to be at PATH. But I wanted to understand a majority of the families that come to our offices have been denied the initial time, and the underlying reason why families are denied shelter as they enter PATH, um, do you believe that there's sufficient staff at PATH and in determining some of the individual cases, but obviously looking at trends, what are the reasons why families are being denied and then they have to go back and forth into PATH in order for them to finally be approved for uh, shelter housing? Well, I would say, look, the, the shelter eligibility rate is reflective of our application of a state uh, rule. Uh, it was recently revised in 2016 uh, that uh, approaches shelter in the same way that any public benefit is approached, which is, does someone have another resource? And so what we find is someone might apply for shelter and they prefer to be in shelter, but they actually have a permanent housing resource where they could remain. Uh, we also find an instance in which someone came and applied and they could remain in the resource for maybe another month and then they're going to come back a month later. That's going to show up as they ha just in the scenario you described, they have to reapply. But in the first instance, I think you would want us to make a judgment that they could stay someplace and if they are able to stay someplace, that's better for the children to be able to stay in the community. We have a very extensive investment in social work. Uh, staff and uh, uh, supports to help mediate family disputes, connect people back to the community, see what sort of rental assistance we can provide to people through our home base programs. We've expanded the availability of home base. Uh, it's in your district, uh, and I would uh, certainly welcome uh, an opportunity for Jocelyn Carter and I to take you on a tour, and you can see what we're actually doing with families. I think you, if you, when you speak to the managers there, you'll see a deep commitment to providing shelter as a last resort, connecting people to communities whenever we can, and treating families in a fair way. Okay, thank you, thank you, Chairs. Thank you very much. Our next questions are from um, Councilmember Salamanca, followed by Traeger. Thank you, uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, good, uh, good morning, uh, Commissioner. Um, first, I wanted to acknowledge uh, they, they were up upstairs and they, they were about to leave. Um, with us today, we have the, uh, the uh, Children's A Society, high school students from the Children's A Society who are visiting us today. They're from my district and they're advocating for the Fair Futures campaign program. So I just wanted to acknowledge their presence here today. Thank you guys for coming out here today. Children's um, Aid's a great organization. Yes, 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 they are. So, Commissioner, for, um, last time uh, when we, I was able to ask some questions here at a hearing, I had concerns about uh, the HRA office in the Bronx uh, and that, you know, the local community board was reaching out uh, requesting that someone from HRA attend the district service cabinet meetings. And I wanted to... I wanted to uh, thank you and thank, uh, and thank the administrator, Grace Bonilla, because they are attending these meetings on a monthly basis, and there is collaboration thank you. in terms of the traffic flow that's, that's occurring there. So I just wanted to give you kudos for that and say thank you. I appreciate that. You, you have also been a great partner, and when you call and ask for something, we, we think we want to help because you have a really good sense of what's needed in the community. Yeah, I, I really enjoy the relationship that we have now. Uh, between my office and your agency. Now, Commissioner, um, I have a, a, a couple of questions about encampment cleanups. What is DHS's procedure for encampment cleanup? And the reason I'm asking is I am getting, I am getting calls from the local community boards and local residents, but more local community boards, that they are reaching out to DHS to clean up these encampments, and DHS is in return, telling them to reach out to the local elected officials for assistance. Uh, I'm under oath and I say this with great force and belief 
there's a real disconnect there. We, we are very much focused on uh, not permitting encampments to grow, regenerate, and working with our community partners to eliminate them. I, I, after this hearing, I would love to have a conversation about what are the locations and who's saying that, because it isn't what our policy is. I, I was a community board member, so I respect community boards. There must be some disconnect here, because we are out in the street immediately when we get that kind of a complaint. Okay, so I look forward to having this okay, conversation absolutely. Uh, with, you, uh, with your agency. Um, my last couple of questions, not-for-profit contracts. Uh, I know in the past uh, there was a delay in the contract. There was a backlog. How, what's the status of the uh, of non-profit non -profit contracts? Okay, uh, so for, let's just break them by agencies. So for FY, Thank you. For FY19, 99% of, of the FY19 contracts are registered. A handful are pending registration, have specific challenges relating to uh, rejections. We're pursuing deeming them under our authority to deem a contract registered even if it's rejected. So we're 99% we're registration in the handful of contracts had particular problems. Um, for FY20, nearly 90% of the HRA contracts, for FY20, which is a, a month away, 90% of the HRA contracts are registered uh, or at the controller for on-time registration, and 84% of the DHS contracts for FY20 are either at the controller uh, or already registered. Um, there, I think sometimes there are questions that are raised about, and I had this myself when I was a not-for-profit head, the difference between a contract register and an amendment. So I just gave you the, the, the picture of contract registration. There are amendments that come up during the course of a contract year uh, that relate to new needs or new issues that arise. We're on track uh, to uh, have uh, contracts that had amendments that need to be addressed during this fiscal year addressed. 86% of them uh, are uh, at the controller or register already uh, for HRA, for example. Uh, and then there's a, I don't know if this is what you're asking, but maybe I'm giving you more information than you want. There's also a model budget process. Yeah, no, I, I was just curious. I know in the past, the um, contracts, there, there was a backlog going Absolutely. back a couple of fiscal years. Absolutely. You've caught up. So therefore, Correct. there's, and so fiscal year 18 and 17, there's no contracts yeah. that are still pending. These are prior years. I think for DHS, for, for the prior years, there are uh, two or three where there are issues with conditions and registration issues, where I think, as, as you know, I've taken a policy position to not register contracts unless we could address conditions. But you're right, when we, when we testified, I think a year ago, I think I said when I started at DHS, we had a backlog over a course of years of about 1,000 contracts. And we've now reduced this down to a handful of particularized problems. If you're the not-for-profit with the particularized problem, uh, that's certainly a, a, prob a challenge, and I don't want to uh, minimize that at all, and that's where our staff's working very hard to address those problems. But you can see these percentages of contracts registered, uh, even for the year that's starting in a month, is a very different uh, approach than previously had been the case. Yeah. All right, and, and, and finally, Commissioner, I have two bills that are ha have had hearings. One of them is a reporting bill uh, re requiring DHS to report um, quarterly, uh, a list of shelters um, in each community board and council district, uh, basically to point out how certain districts are oversaturated with homeless shelters and other districts are not doing their fair share. Um, is there status as to where your agency is at on that bill? I, th I think uh, on that particular bill, uh, we had expressed an interest in trying to work with you on it. We have some concerns about the nature of some of the reporting, which would call for information we might not have, and also how to handle supportive housing. Uh, and I think within the existing shelter system, 
it does raise some issues about we're in the process of transforming it, what would be the right time to report on it. I, th I think we, we should have some conversations and see what's, uh, uh, what's feasible there. And then finally, Commissioner, I think the path to eliminating homelessness is putting families in permanent housing. I have a 15% homeless set-aside bill. Uh, can I get you on the record supporting my bill? You, you can get me on the record as, as saying the following. Um, with every tool that we have as the Department of Social Services, we've been able to connect 115,000 people to permanent housing uh, since uh, 2014. We're gonna continue to do that as the Social Services Agency. And I know this issue came up at the HPD oversight hearing, and I'm gonna defer to, uh, to HPD about what, what, they, uh, what they're able to do in the Housing New York plan. I know us as a social services agency will continue to work with you and other council members to move as many people as we can out of shelter and into permanent housing. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councilmember Salamanca. Councilmember Mark Traeger. Thank you to the chairs. Uh, welcome, Commissioner. It's also great to see uh, former council member and dear friend Annabelle Palma who with us here today. <laughs> great, great, great to see you back. Um, Commissioner, I just want to get right uh, I have two, two things here to discuss here today. Um, there's a number of things, but I just have to focus on my time. Bridge programming. Um, my district, as many other districts, experienced the worst storm in our history with Hurricane Sandy. Um, we worked with the administration to set up, uh, you know, re uh, recovery efforts to make sure that we recover from the worst storm. And um, we also, the city administration set up a, a Workforce One Center in Coney Island as well. If I relied on just the existing infrastructure which was set up, many of my residents would not be able to be a part of the recovery efforts in terms of employment. And I made a pledge to my constituents that they would not just witness the recovery, that they would be active participants in it as well. And so what I had to do uh, in response to uh, the fact that many folks did not have the credentials and, and the qualifications for employment uh, therein, I had to step up and provide resources uh, to get folks with, uh, who are lacking, let's say, high school diploma, with programs, high school diploma. I'm actually f funding, uh, a, a dip with OBT, for example, a program, uh, free classes in Coney Island, free meals, child care, case management, you name it, the works. Because we need to step up and, and fill the gaps uh, between our residents and point, point opportunities. I don't believe there is a cohesive, coherent, citywide so, right? bridge programming effort. But I do think there is potential with, a, with an HRA to really establish something sustainable on the ground. Now, I, your, my colleague mentioned it before, but I want to kind of dig deeper on this. Um, do many of the clients going through the Career Pathways uh, program that you referenced have reading skills or math skills below, say, a 10th grade level? And does that act as a significant challenge for those clients in competing for good jobs? Uh, let me answer that question. I do want to correct the record, and I'll follow up with Councilmember uh, uh, Powers. I said we were in the second year of the program. We're actually moving into the third year of the program, but I just want to correct the record. Okay. As to your question, um, hey, Jeff. when we set about reforming our HRA uh, employment services and eliminating WEP, uh, and we conducted uh, focus groups with clients, with advocates, and we, we concluded that um, substantial numbers of our clients who are required to participate in work programs under federal and state law uh, did not have a high school uh, degree, uh, and in fact, uh, might have only gotten as far as, as ninth grade. It's the reason why we are emphasizing in our employment programs education and training. And uh, to help people get a credential, because we know that earning power is going to be increased with that credential. So part of our youth pathways and career pathways is focused on education and training. We've now got about 6,600 of our clients participating in education and training programs. Uh, remember, not all of our clients are required to participate in employment and training uh, programs uh, under federal and state law, and we're going to continue to focus on how to increase that number so that I, th I hear what you're asking, and I, I want to emphasize that part of our revamping of the system was to do what you're asking us to do. If you're challenging us to do more, always open to that conversation. Well, I appreciate that answer. I'm just asking, do you believe the city of New York needs a comprehensive bridge programming approach? 
as commissioner, from your lens, do you believe that we need bridge programming in New York City? Yeah, and again, I, I want to say as, as a commissioner that presided, uh, that, that has been part of the leadership of changing our agency's approach to employment, I think bridge programming is very valuable. And that's what we've tried to do uh, for our clients because the old approach for our clients of simply saying rapid attachment to the workforce only to return to our caseload did not work. That approach did not work. Commissioner, I, I would just emphasize it's more than valuable. It's, we, we're in urgent need. We're in urgent need. Because right now, I don't know what the city of New York does for folks who have been marginalized more ways than one, seeking employment, who are lacking in certain areas. Right now, we're just punting them, I think, to the wolves. There's no cohesive strategy from my point of view. If I didn't step up in my district, no one would have. No, I hear what you're saying. I'm saying within our agency, we have an obligation under federal and state law to require people to participate in employment programs. And in that requirement, we've said to ourselves, we must give people the ex uh, kind of opportunities you're emphasizing, and so I'm agreeing with you. In saying they're valuable, they're a core part of what we're trying to do for our clients. Do you have anything scaled out in terms of cost estimates? Because in our budget response in the city council, we did put in funding for bridge programming. Do you have anything scaled out from your end that we can work with you on in, in our budget negotiations? I, I mean, I, I did see the council response for a much larger population than ours. Um, I have to take a look within our overall budget that we're spending uh, you know, I think I, you, you might, might have been here when I said we, our overall employment services are $279 million, of which $65 million are particular vendor contracts, which have uh, a, a part of the, uh, this component is, you know, we work with people that have disabilities, for example, to connect them to jobs that they're able to do. We work with young people who have, don't have the reading skills and math skills that you're describing to get them those skills but I'd be happy to, to sort of sit down with you and look I, at where, where you think we could improve. I'll just close here by saying, Commissioner, Higher NYC is not bridge programming. Workforce One is not bridge programming. I'm not sure what some of the trainings you're referring to, but I'm pretty sure they're not bridge programming. There was nowhere for us to turn to in Coney Island if we didn't step up working with OBT and providers to bridge the gap. Right. No one. And, so and it, I, we're willing to work with you because I believe in your ability to get things done, to work with you to set something up on a citywide scale because this is an urgent need. The mayor's jobs plan, quite frankly, was dismal. We have a lot of work to do to make sure that the residents who are in need of these jobs are equipped with the skills to obtain those jobs and to keep them. Last thing I'll say, Commissioner, is the local law 182 of 2018 took effect this year. It requires Department of Citywide Administrative Services to make available a supply of diapers and baby wipes sufficient to meet the needs of residents and recipients of city-run sites, including domestic violence shelters operated by HRA. How will facilities that qualify be accommodated? How is HRA advertising this new local law to make sure parents and guardians are, are, are aware? Um, we've provided notices to all of the uh, facilities that are affected to make sure the clients themselves know that they can avail themselves of this benefit, and that takes the form of both notice uh, 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 to be posted and notice to be provided to so you, individual clients. Are you funding the purchase of, of diapers and baby wipes? And if so, how it, much will it will cost with additional resources? Th these things are included in our rates, but what we wanted to respond to, and, I, and you asked me this question at the um, preliminary budget hearing to make sure our clients knew they could ask, uh, because it's great to fund it in your rate, it's great to have a law saying it has to be available. We wanted to make sure that our clients knew that they could ask for, for, for the help. And that's what we, we've done uh, between, I think, the, the oversight hearing where you pointed this out to me. We uh, made sure that there's notification to clients so that they know that they can get this help. We're, we're still hearing gaps, but I'm going to turn. I think the chair is being very generous with their time. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Orlander. Uh, thank you, Chair Levin, and uh, you were out when I got my first question, so I'll just going to add my uh, joy on the record at your family expansion. So. Thank you. <laughs> um, so I, I just want to pick up on, uh, keep going on Councilmember Powers and Councilmember Traeger's question. Uh, you know, we don't doubt the, the I mean, as someone who, you know, was with you when we started fighting WEP a million years ago, the transformation of the agency in its 
way of approaching um, people is, is tremendous, and it's a big, significant, transformative overhaul. So um, the fact that we're pushing specifically to expand resources in bridge programming mm -hmm. is not like an expression of doubt in the broad work you're doing. It's a belief we need more resources for bridge programming. So I just want to make sure I understand where we are. It sounds like you're saying for that very specific kind of um, education with contextual career training, we have a youth program but maybe not an adult program. So can you just clarify for me, in what you're calling Bridge, how many slots for young people at what cost? And am I right that we don't have that right now for adults? Which is not to say there aren't other places that you're combining education and, and training, but in this sort of specific contextualized, we want to help you with some specific math and science you know, education in the context of career-specific education. We have that, yeah. I understood uh, your question. And, uh, you know, just a little bit of clarify, I appreciate the opportunity to, to say more on this topic, but just to clarify a little bit, our, our focus, of course, is on the clients that come to us who are eligible for the services we can provide. So I'm sympathetic to Councilmember Traeger's description of something happening in his community. Uh, our limitation on what we could do as an agency is on, are there clients in that community who are eligible for HRA services and have a federal and state work requirement. And for those clients, uh, which is a smaller, uh, you know, obviously a subset of the entire city, we're providing those services. So within our career pathways uh, programs for uh, adults, it's the same focus, whether you're in the youth pathways program, which goes up to age tw tw uh, 21, we still have older people, because when I talked about a survey of our clients that were a ninth grade reading and math level, that's our whole caseload. That's not an age group uh, limitation. So when we made the change to emphasize education and training, uh, I didn't mean to imply in my answer to Councilmember Traeger that it's only for the, the young people. It's part, it's embedded, and I, and I can see, you know, a, uh, not a frustration, but a concern that I'm responding to you that it's embedded within a larger program that we're doing. That's how we're addressing the kind of skills. So I, I hear that, but it sounds like in the youth oh, population. Youth pathways is 24, I blew it. Well, sorry? Youth pathways is up to 24, I apologize. Okay. But it sounds like in the youth pl uh, uh, population, you have a specific program that you are referring I, to. No, it, it, we, we, re, we got, we, phased out WEP and the so-called back to work program and replaced those programs with youth pathways and career pathways. Uh, and the intent in both the programs and the components in both the programs is to meet people where they are and if they need the, exactly the skills that you're asking about in the bridge context, we must provide them because otherwise we won't be able to get people connected to work. All right, but did I misunderstand? This is just, I, and I understand that the, your broad approach yeah. is to do that, to help people get some mix of education and training and yep. job placement to succeed in work. So yep. that's true for the whole thing. But it sounded to me like, and it's my understanding from the providers, that there is, you know, this sort of, you know, the bridge isn't just a nice term, it's like a fairly specific term of art about a effort to provide both some specific education sort of in work specific context. And I thought I heard you say in, in response to Councilmember Powers that on the youth side, you have some contracts that you consider to be that. Uh, Did I misunderstand? I, I, I either was unclear or I would never say you misunderstood. I would always say I must have not explained in a good way. How about that? Uh, in both uh, the programs up to age 24 and for over age 24, we have components that we see as filling the role of bridge. I understand as you're asking me very technically, do I have a program called bridge? We have components of these existing programs up to 24 and for people over age 24, which are aimed at redressing exactly the same challenges that, that you're saying the bridge programs would help. So maybe let me just ask this as a follow-up question sure. then, because if you don't have it today, if it would be possible for you after the hearing to um, to identify those programs sure. for us, and I, it's not the name that's important I to understand. me, to identify the programs that are fulfilling this goal of that combination of sort of more classroom-like skills with more contextualized career skills on the youth and adult side, which are the programs or contracts that you believe are doing right. that, um, then that would help us figure out how to understand that, you know, what the advocates are saying, what you guys are saying, and what we need to that, be pushing for. That's helpful. I mean, just to go back to the value and the goal and the vision that we had to begin with, 
was that our clients need these kinds of supports, whether they're under age 24 or over age 24, and the prior effort to simply squeeze them off our caseload only to have them return was not serving anybody. And so in revamping the system, we recognized that we needed to focus on exactly the kind of skills that people are saying you need a bridge program for. And so we'll come back to you with what we're doing and you know, I don't want to get into semantic back and forth. I appreciate you, you cut through the thicket and got there um, and we'll provide you with the information that you need. Again, our vision and strategic approach was to provide that kind of, uh, and, kind of approach. And again, I, I don't, at, a, at, a, at a level of your vision, I, I know it's true. It's also true some people will just want to get a job, you know, and exactly. so it's not that everyone should go in a bridge exactly. program. Some people have the exactly. skills they have, are ready to get the job they're ready for, and want to go do it. And, and HRA should help them do that if that's what makes sense for them in the context of their lives. So that is a different exactly. approach, and that costs less money, costs more money to do something like a bridge program. You, so you, I think we're in the same, we have the same exactly. understanding. If you guys can follow up to get us that information, then we can have a conversation that's a little more brass tacks and we're just like comparing apples uh, to apples. Shh. And if what we want to do in the budget process is say, we need some more apples, then we'll be very clear shh. where ha we're pushing. Happy to do it. And I actually appreciate that you put your finger right on what another key piece of the vision is, which is one size fits all didn't work for us before. One size won't work for us with reforms going forward. Terrible to make policy by anecdote, but my first day as the HRA commissioner, Lisa Fitzpatrick and I, who's now program head within Grace's uh, area, ran into a woman my very first day who said, I've been working for years. I just lost my job. They want to send me to WEP. I need help getting a job. Please don't send me to a program. So we need, we need to have services for all kind of clients, and that's what we're trying to do. And we'll get, we, we, we welcome that conversation with you. Thank you. Councilmember Joe and I for questions. Thank you, Chair. Commissioner, so good to see you again. And um, it feels like Groundhog Day because it's going to be a repeat of the previous testimonies that we've heard from cluster sites in the borough of the Bronx, we're not moving fast enough, to the borough of the Bronx being inundated by supportive housing compared to the rest of the boroughs. We all want to do our fair share. The numbers are still the same, have not, seen, have not received an update on the statistics, and I'll repeat them again. The borough of the Bronx per capita has 99% more than Queens, 100%, I'm sorry, 100% more than Queens, 99% more than Staten Island, 13% um, more than Manhattan, and I believe it's 40% more than Brooklyn. No change on that front. We have a lawsuit working its way through the courts. We're at appeal stage now to make sure that the borough of the Bronx gets its fair share of the funding that's needed for these families to make sure that they have every opportunity and the resources that are needed for them to build stability. And ultimately, the question always comes down to, are we using taxpayer dollars wisely. The cost of providing temporary shelter compared to long-term permanent housing. What is the weight? Why aren't we subsidizing those rents so that these families can stay in their apartments from the very beginning? And we've spoken about this a number of times. If the idea is to stop the bleeding, let's keep these families in their homes now. And that would be the tree bill. Prevent any further rent increases. Work similar to SCREE, to DRE. All rent increases will be credited back to the property owner in a form of a, a tax credit on their real estate tax bill. The formula works. It has created stability for our seniors. It's created stability for the disabled communities that we have. And they have been able to gain a strong foundation financially for themselves and their families. What is the holdup? Why isn't this something that the administration wants to embrace? Always good to see you. Happy to look at the bill when it's introduced. Uh, and uh, I think as you, you... I'm sorry, it has been introduced currently. I introduced it in the Assembly. Currently, uh, Councilwoman Barron has it in the Council. 
and we've gone through this many of times. Okay. Uh, we have gone through this many times, and I would really direct you to the testimony, which indicates uh, more progress than you may be uh, looking at. Evictions are down 37% in the city as a result of the work that the council and we have done together. 115,000 people are in permanent housing as a result of our investments in rental assistance and rehousing. Uh, we are out of 21, about 2,100 of the 3,600 uh, cluster units that started during the Giuliani administration, and we're gonna keep driving out of them. Uh, I would urge you not to uh, view supportive housing as uh, anything other than permanent housing. Supportive housing uh, is uh, just like any affordable housing in the city, and the ability for people from the Bronx or any place else in the city to live in supportive housing, I think, is a very good thing. It is a good thing, provided that it's spread out equitably, or the borough's given the resources that it's needed. But clearly, the borough of the Bronx has more than any other borough by capita. Again, supportive housing is permanent housing, council member. Okay. Supportive housing, do you think it would be, it's fair that the borough of the Bronx have more than any other borough? I think my clients should be able to live in any borough of the city they're able to find an apartment in. I agree with you. So how do we make that difference? Where supportive housing in the borough of the Bronx is being targeted specifically because developers take advantage of the lower land acquisition costs and the building costs. If the income is the same for a structure an apartment building that offers the same service throughout the city, then the developers and those that are taking advantage of these programs are gonna take two factors into consideration. That is land acquisition and construction costs. Your in the income they receive, regardless of where that property is or that building is, whether it be in Brooklyn, Manhattan, Queens, or Staten Island, or the Borough Bronx, is the same which means the borough of the Bronx is inundated because of the lower property values and the slightly lower construction costs. This is not something that I haven't said before. So when you say that your clients, my, our New Yorkers, should have a choice where they live, I agree with you. But when the housing accommodations are constantly offered in the borough of the Bronx without the resources to help these families build stable lives, re-educate, job placement, and help them with the after-school programs and additional services that they need, it is unfair. And my tone, I don't want to be angry, but I get, I'm passionate about this and coming up with a solution. And it's the same runaround that I get constantly. In New York City, the programs that you offer are the same income regardless of where these properties are. Is this true or not? I don't know how to answer that. Regardless of what borough you live in, you're eligible for Medicaid. Regardless of what borough you live in, you're eligible Supportive for housing, shelters, is the same allocation of funding available to a property I, owner I citywide. Think, I think as we've said many times before, the change in the approach to shelter in New York mm -hmm. City to undo a haphazard system that developed up over many years is aimed at enabling people who come from the Bronx to be sheltered in the Bronx, people who come from Queens to be sheltered in Queens, and so on and so forth. We're making that progress and where we're citing new shelters and where we're closing shelters. We're out of more than 200 uh, locations. Many of those are in the Bronx and we've cited a smaller number of 43 new shelters. Many of those are in communities that never had shelters before. But, but as a borough commissioner, the statistics are one that were provided by this administration during this administration. The borough of the Bronx has more than any other borough. Is this a fact? I don't know what this is. You I don't, don't, a I don't fair think share plan. That I don't think it's fair to refer to the borough of the Bronx as being inundated when you refer to my clients. They're human beings. They have the ability to live in the Bronx if they're from the Bronx. They have the ability to choose to move to the Bronx if they're able to find housing. You call them clients. I call them families. I call them New Yorkers. They're more than clients. They're people. I don't so think, when you refer to them as client, that's a direct insult to me because I refer to them as people. I don't think that the people... They're, it's not a business. I don't think the people right. that we serve and that you're referring to 
would like to be described as people who are inundating your borough with needs. I think they no, would no, like to be support I may finish, okay. Council Member. Go ahead. I think they would like to have the opportunity to live in affordable housing, and if they need supportive housing, they would like the opportunity to live in supportive housing. I don't think it's really helping advancing this every hearing to have this same line of questioning. Every hearing, we have this conversation, and I've said this and I'm gonna say it again. For years, going back for years, the city cited shelters wherever they could, and most of them were cited in the Bronx or in Brooklyn. We have changed that approach. We are closing shelters all over the city. You might not want to believe it, but we've gotten out of 200 shelter sites across the city. We've shrunk the footprint of the shelter system by 30% in about two years. No other administration has tried to do that or let alone succeeded it. We've cited 43 shelters. They're cited in places that never had shelters before. We just had a dialogue with Councilmember Lander about two shelters that were cited in Park Slope. Those are facts. Thank you, Commissioner. Okay, we're going to uh, wrap it up here now. Um, we have. Um, okay, uh, thank you, Chair Drum. Commissioner, I, I do have um, uh, a few other questions that I did want to uh, speak to, um, but uh, knowing that they're in the interest of time here, we, we do have to uh, continue this executive budget hearing. So um, I will follow up. Um, of course. Uh, for the, but one follow-up question that I did have uh, on my previous inquiries, just about um, the eligibility specialist and talking about uh, at um, uh, with HRA, have we seen uh, an increase in waiting times, or how are we monitoring waiting times in light of the Jasmine Headley incident? Um, and, and as we're talking about staffing levels sure. at HRA centers, actually, the eligibility specialist title that that is in the council response would be placed in SNAP food stamp centers, mm -hmm. and there the wait time is about 20 minutes because 90. 87% uh, of the applications are done online. 97% uh, uh, of the, 93% of the interviews are done by phone, mm -hmm. and there's a, a redu reduction in foot traffic by more than 40% in those locations. And in terms of the wait time in the job centers where there are not eligibility specialists, that's a, that's um, local 371 or in the job centers. Mm -hmm. uh, there the changes that we're making uh, by, as I said, going online with the recertifications, uh, moving uh, to eliminate office visits, all of those will, we, we believe will drive down the wait times in those offices to where we are with SNAP and food stamps. We're about twice as long in those offices as at uh, the food stamp centers. Okay. Um, all right, thank you, Commissioner. I just want to uh, say, so the, the issues that I want to follow up on, just so that sure. it's mentioned for the record here, are the issues brought up in our preliminary budget response, uh, the SOTA program, uh, housing specialists, and um, uh, uh, some additional questions around uh, EFAP. So uh, for, for members of the public, we will be uh, following up on all of those issues um, with the administration moving forward. But with that, I want to thank you very much, all of you, for your uh, time and your testimony, uh, and I want to thank uh, Chair Drum um, for all the work that he's been doing as Chair of Finance. Thank you very much. We're going to take a three-minute break and come back. Thank you very much for the opportunity to testify. Thank you.
Could we ask everyone to try to find their seats so we can move forward? Okay, we will now resume the City Council's hearing on the Mayor's Executive Budget for Fiscal 2020. The Finance Committee is joined by uh, the Committee on the Justice System, chaired by Councilmember Rory Lansman. We just heard from the Department of Social Services, and now we will hear from Jordan Dressler, the, ch the, civil, service, the civil Justice Coordinator at the Office of Civil Justice. In the interest of time, I will forego an opening statement, but before we hear testimony, I'll open the mic to my colleague, Councilmember Lansman. Thank you, Councilmember Drum. Good afternoon. I am Councilmember Rory Lansman, Chair of the Committee on the Justice System. Welcome to our joint hearing with the Finance Committee and the General Welfare Committee on the Fiscal 2020 Executive Budget. And I want to thank Chairs uh, Danny Drum and Steve Levin. I see, uh, I know floating around from the Committee on the Justice System is Councilmember Alan Maisel. Today we'll hear from the Office of Civil Justice, which oversees a budget of over $150 million in city funding for civil legal services for New Yorkers. These legal services primarily support tenant anti-inviction and anti-harassment representation through the Universal Access to Counsel Program, Immigration Defense through the New York Immigrant Family Unity Project, and Employment Legal Services for low-wage workers which this committee specifically fought for last year. Our city is fortunate to have a robust civil legal services community for New Yorkers to turn to when they need help and the creation of OCJ has provided much needed centralization. However, the housing of OCJ within HRA and the lack of transparency in the FY20 executive plan with regard to budget actions for OCJ has made it much more difficult for the council to fulfill its budgetary oversight obligations. Programmatically, we want to ensure that the Low Wage Worker Initiative, the first dedicated legal services funding for victims of wage theft, misclassification, various kinds of employment discrimination and other workplace abuses continues as it was always expected to. I want to make sure to thank our Justice System Committee staff, especially our finance analysts, Peter Butler and Monica Peppel, <clears throat> along with the Finance Division Unit Head, Isha Wright, our Counsel, Max Kempfer, and our Policy Analyst, Keyshawn Denny, not to mention my Chief of Staff, um, Rachel Kagan. Thank you, uh, and please begin when you are ready. <clears throat> thank you and good afternoon, uh, Chair Lansman, Chair Drum, other members of the committees here. Uh, thank you for inviting me today to appear before the Committee on the Justice System uh, and the Committee on Finance to discuss the work. I'm sorry, we have work. to swear you in first. Oh, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. My apologies. Do you affirm that your testimony will be truthful to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief? I do. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Again, thank you for inviting me today. My name is Jordan Dressler. I am the Civil Justice Coordinator, uh, head up the Office of Civil Justice in that capacity. I'm joined by Aaron Villari, who's Executive Deputy Commissioner for DSS's Office of Finance, and OCJ's Executive Director, Jacqueline Moore. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to submit a lengthy written testimony for the record, and I just want to touch on some of the high points and achievements uh, of our office and our legal services provider partners over the last year, and uh, to give the Council a sense of where we're headed for the future of access to justice programs at OCJ. Uh, the, in fiscal year 20, the total legal services budget at OCJ includes funding totaling $159.4 million, which breaks down as follows. $128.3 million for legal services programs for tenants, which includes $82.1 million for eviction defense legal services for tenants in housing court, including further implementation of universal access, and $46.2 million for legal services to protect tenants and combat harassment which includes an additional $11 million baseline investment in expanded legal services to keep New Yorkers in their homes, which OCJ is allocating. 
Altogether, that brings the administration's total investment in legal services for tenants to 166 million when universal access will be fully implemented in fiscal year 2022. As well as 31.1 million for legal assistance programs for immigrant New Yorkers, including 20.1 million in administration funding for the Immigrant Opportunities Initiative, as well as 2.3 million in immigration and other programs funded uh, through community service block grants and city tax levy funding, along with 8.7 million for legal and navigation services and outreach through the Action NYC program operated in partnership with Moya and the City University of New York. As for legal services for tenants, we continue to grow through the implementation of universal access, where we remain on track for full implementation in 2022. By the end of last fiscal year, OCJ's program served over a quarter million New Yorkers, and last year alone, we served almost 26,000 households facing eviction in housing court and NYCHA administration, uh, NYCHA administrative termination of tenancy hearings. Last year, we issued our first progress report on universal access implementation where we highlighted that of those cases resolved by attorneys in New York City Housing Court uh, facing eviction, 84% of their clients were able to avoid eviction and remain in their homes. And we recently reported that evictions are down 37% in the city of New York since 2013. That's an estimated 100,000 New Yorkers who have been able to remain in their homes during that time. As for the representation rate in court, the, represent the rate of uh, tenants enjoying the assistance of counsel in uh, housing court eviction proceedings, that once stood at 1% back in one 2013. At the end of the last fiscal year, that rate was 30% citywide and was at 56% in the neighborhoods that have been targeted for universal access implementation. In the coming year, we will continue to expand universal access legal services including the launch this summer of the first phase of providing on-site access to legal services for seniors at NYCHA facing administration termina administrative termination of tenancy proceedings, which will be at NYCHA's new hearing location in Brooklyn. We have made substantial investment across the spectrum of immigration legal services, particularly in the areas of removal defense and complex case representation, cases like asylum and special immigrant juvenile status applications for migrant youth here in New York. City-funded programs provided services in approximately 25,000 cases last year. And with the impact of our funding for removal defense being realized in the field this year, we expect that number to be even higher. I do want to acknowledge the City Council's partnership in all of these efforts, and particularly the leadership of Chair Lansman in this effort, as well as efforts to lead uh, to uh, develop legal services programming for low-wage workers, survivors of domestic violence, veterans in New York City facing a variety of civil legal services needs. Uh, together, we are making New York City a national leader in supporting and championing, championing civil legal assistance. We have made significant progress over the past few years in improving access to legal services for New Yorkers in need, and we're committed to keep improving every year. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today, and I look forward to your questions. Jermaine. <laughs> Thank you. Um, let's talk about the low-wage Worker Support Initiative. Um, last year in FY19, the admin and the council agreed to fund the Low Wage Worker Initiative aimed at providing low wage workers with employment and workplace rights, legal services, including assistance with wage theft, misclassification, discrimination, sexual harassment, and more. Um, the admin had allocated 2 million of the 2.5 million total which was designated to expand the capacity of civil legal services providers already operating in this space by allowing them to hire new staff. In the council's FY20 budget response, we called for the administration to baseline its $2 million in funding for the initiative when we saw that it was not baseline in the preliminary budget. And while negotiations are still going on between the admin and the council, this funding has not been restored for fiscal 2020 as of today. So especially considering the fact that this funding was used to hire staff, there was an expectation that this funding would be continued beyond one year. Can you explain why this funding is not in the executive budget? At, at this point, uh, this funding is one of many issues being uh, discussed and negotiated between the administration and the council as we head toward the adopted budget. Um, it's one of many priorities being uh, discussed uh, among both sides, and those discussions will continue. Okay. And I assume you understand, since this hiring was 
almost entirely for staff if the funding is not restored or continued. A bunch of people are going to get let go. It's not just a matter of turning the dial down from, oh, we serve 500 clients a year, now we're going to serve 450. We're aware of the dynamics when there are new hires off the street uh, based on particular pots of funding. Um, our understanding is that the funding, which uh, we were happy to administer, uh, and we do think that uh, legal support for low-wage workers uh, facing a variety of workplace needs, uh, workplace violations, is important. Uh, that that funding went towards a variety of needs, meeting a full spectrum of uh, uh, needs experienced by low-wage workers here in New York, everything from uh, advice to uh, assistance in investigation of cases to um, uh, full-fledged uh, representation in um, uh, either individual cases or group cases. Uh, and that the uh, support for that uh, was drawn in some cases in-house, um, staff that had already been on staff with some of our providers, and uh, in some cases uh, perhaps based on new hires. So that's something we continue to look at and work with our providers on. Okay. Let me ask you about the universal access to, um, to counsel. And I think we have a slide that we want to, to, to share. Um, it's universal access to counsel is supported by $75.9 million in fiscal 2020. OCJ has acknowledged to the council that the universal access to counsel will be expanded in 2020. On this slide, you can see in light blue which zip codes currently have universal access implementation in FY19. What are the new zip codes that universal access to council will expand to in fiscal 2020? We have not made a decision on expansion yet. Uh, I can assure the council and uh, the providers that we work with that we do not intend to start new services on July 1st, 2020. Mm -hmm. It would not be realistic to think about an expansion on that, on that schedule. Uh, given the limitations and some of the challenges on outright staffing capacity that some of our tenant legal services providers have experienced. So, uh, just so I understand, is it your, is your, your intention to expand in 2020 in, or not? In fiscal year 2020. In fiscal year yes, 2020. Yes, but, but not when, at the beginning of fiscal year uh, 2020. And when you say you, a decision hasn't been made, you mean a decision hasn't been made in, as to which zip codes it's going to expand to? We Correct, and we want to be in we remain in dialogue with our providers to have a good understanding of what their capacity will actually look like. Uh, the challenges that uh, yeah. some of them have experienced with hiring supervisors. Uh, remember, this was a, remember this was a field that was not funded at nearly this level for many, many years. And this field has seen an unprecedented explosion in funding and support and resources uh, those uh, new and unseasoned staff attorneys need supervisors in order to train them, support them, and do the work that they need to do, and those supervisors need to come uh, with uh, experience. Um, that is uh, on track, um, though it's taking some time, and so we want to be mindful of uh, capacity issues that all of our providers are experiencing uh, before we uh, lay out expectations in terms of new expansions. So how many zip codes are being served now? 20 zip codes are targeted for universal access legal services. Legal services are available to some extent across the city. So, uh, well, what do you mean? So, so currently, 20 zip codes are targeted? Correct. What do you mean by targeted versus it's available throughout the city? Legal services have always been available across the city um, to some extent, uh, of course, limited by uh, capacity, and they remain limited by capacity that experience, that capacity has grown. Through universal access, we are ensuring that zip code by zip code, zone by zone, uh, the residents in those zip codes, if they face an eviction case in housing court, at this point, low-income tenants facing eviction in housing court, will uh, be assured that there is access to legal services. So it won't be conditioned on capacity because the capacity is there. What's more is that we've identified those zip codes and worked with the housing courts to isolate those cases in housing court, have them routed to particular courtrooms in the housing court so that we can essentially create courts within the court to allow legal providers to work on a rotation basis 
every day that the court is in session to meet tenants on their first appearance, make legal services available on that first appearance, stand up on cases, just as we see in criminal court and just as we see in family court, where right to counsel has long been the way things go. Um, that's what we've been building over the last two years in housing court, and we think it's been successful. In those neighborhoods that we've targeted for universal access, the representation rate uh, has, uh, as last check was 56%, meaning more than half of those tenants have had access to counsel. Do you have a number for how many households have been served? 26,000 households received legal services in fiscal 18, those households being households facing eviction in housing court. Mm -hmm. and, and how many of those were in the target area? Just approximately, 90%, 50%, the it's, target zip codes. Uh, I'll tell you. At the time, this is fiscal 18, we had 15 zip codes. And of those households, Approximately 8,300 8, were in that. 8,300 to 2,600. Oh. So it's not, the, the, the targeted zip codes don't seem to be getting, uh, and it's not a critique, it's just an observation. So, so it's about a third, less than a third, of all those receiving the services are in, in the targeted zip codes. Well, I, thank you, Chair. I appreciate that it's not a critique, because we don't see it as a critique either. Uh, the tenants in those household, uh, the tenants in those zip codes have had access to legal services made available to them in the community, through outreach, and in the court. And we're confident that uh, we are getting to those tenants. In addition to those tenants, making legal services more widely available, again, throughout the courthouse, in the community, and increasing funding and support for our legal services providers have allowed other neighborhoods to enjoy increased access to legal services. When we talk about universal access, we want to be sure of the, the promises that we're making. So when we say that a neighborhood is targeted for universal access, it means that no tenant in that household who is low income should be turned away from any legal services provider, no matter what their case, their eviction case is, no matter the merits of the case, uh, and that's the no tenant in that zip code. In that zip code, okay. in that zip code. As we are in the process of this multi-year implementation, we simply cannot say the same for the rest of the city. But we want there to be no mistake, legal services are available in other parts of the city for so all sorts of tenants, where which is conditioned on capacity. Right, where are we in that multi-year phase in, right? I, I know that my, 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 my understanding is phase, phase five, phase five supposed to be in fiscal year 2021? 22. 2022? Yes. So okay. we're, we're entering year three. Okay. Um, so by phase five, how many households are we estimating that we would be serving? Our estimate is approximately 125,000 households annually. 125,000 households. And um, I understand that you have not identified the zip codes where you will be expanding to in FY 2020. Have you um, uh, figured out how many zip codes it will be? We have some thoughts on that, but it would be premature to be talking about them because we really need to drill down with our provider partners to have a good on the ground understanding of what capacity truly looks like. Uh, you know, we have funded uh, uh, capacity at legal providers that at times they've struggled to fill because of uh, the absence of uh, enough candidates to, to take that work. Um, we think that, that those matters are in hand and being handled, um, but we do want to know more from our providers where they see capacity uh, at the beginning of the year, where they see capacity at the end of the year, where they see capacity in the years going forward, so that we can have a reasonable uh, rollout uh, schedule and make sure that when we say uh, we're implementing Sorry, services in uh, area X or among population X, that we can uh, meet all of those obligations. Can you talk about the pilot with um, NYCHA? So that is on track to begin uh, this summer. 
Uh, we have been providing legal services to NYCHA tenants facing uh, termination and tenancy proceedings. We have not yet stood up an on-site uh, access pilot the way we have in housing court. Um, we will be doing that this summer. NYCHA is moving to a new location where proceedings are heard and we've identified a target population to start. I don't want to call it a pilot because we are on track to provide these legal services to all uh, NYCHA tenants uh, facing administration, uh, administrative termination. Where will you be starting? Have you identified that where, yet? Where, where? At, at NYCHA's new location in Brooklyn, and we're actually in the process of doing space scoping out and discussions with providers, so that's happening. But um, will you be rep representing tenants from particular NYCHA developments? Like, how are you going to? We're going to be focusing on seniors first, senior okay. heads of households 62 and older. Uh, this is obviously a vulnerable population. Uh, we think that there's a path forward in identifying them, making it available to them uh, on site, and learning a lot from that uh, selective model uh, and learning how to develop a model that will scale to cover all NYCHA tenants by 2022. Okay. Let me ask you about the issue of uh, legal representation in foreclosure proceedings. Um, Legal representation for closer in foreclosure court cases is declining in four out of the five boroughs. And your report states that the percentage of homeowners citywide who have legal representation in foreclosure court dropped from 53% to 48% from 2016 to 2017. And this is despite the fact that OCJ reports foreclosure cases filed has dropped nearly 42% from 2013 to 2017. Do you have a, an explanation for why there's such a steep drop in representation um, occurring in just one year? We don't. Um, we uh, had been tracking uh, that information. We thought it was important to continue to share that information. Uh, we were very pleased to see that uh, funding that had been a long part of the portfolio of our legal services providers, uh, we consider them our partners and we know that many of them are working uh, through the auspices of state funding, uh, particularly funding that had come through settlements through the Attorney General's office that had expired for this at the end of this past fiscal year. We were very happy to see that that funding was restored in the state budget and so that uh, remains constant. We're also aware that our uh, providers are making good use of uh, state judiciary funding part of the $100 million commitment made by the uh, state uh, judiciary through their uh, judicial, uh, judiciary civil legal services funding. So we're happy to see that that funding remains in place and we'll continue to monitor the situation, coordinate with our mm -hmm. providers. Well, it's a particular concern for us, uh, those of us in Queens, where foreclosures remarkably continue to rise even as they decline um, in the rest of the city. Uh, let me ask you about immigration legal services. Um, in your written testimony for the preliminary budget hearing, you noted ongoing negotiations with legal services providers for the Immigrant Opportunity Initiative, IOI, for a three-year renewal. Can you give us a, um, an update sure. on how those negotiations are going? Uh, they are complete, uh, and I think they were very successful. Um, we had uh, developed those contracts uh, prior to Trump, prior to the onslaught of uh, removal cases uh, reaching immigrant New Yorkers, prior to the uh, really ever-changing immigration legal landscape. Um, and when I say ever-changing, I mean daily and weekly. And we've been working extremely closely with our provider partners to uh, uh, essentially understand what does this landscape mean for your practice in terms of duration, in terms of how you are approaching serving the client, uh, and we made changes. And so we made changes to ensure that there were no contractual limits or anything that would be uh, seen to inhibit or stand in the way of our legal providers uh, essentially throwing every trick in the book at any legal problem that they encounter on behalf of their clients. Are, are you, is there a concern about um, caseloads given the increased uh, number of people who are facing removal proceedings and other immigration matters? I think we're always mindful that uh, the demand um, for all civil legal services um, outstrips supply at levels uh, separate and apart from what funding could possibly address. Um, there is no uh, 
you know, universal, other than in housing court, there is no universal access. So, uh, you know, and as you can see, developing universal access is a process that takes time, uh, literally years, and a lot of careful planning. Last two topics, community services, block grant funded legal services. Um, <clears throat> this program is supported by $2.1 million in federal money, uh, provides legal assistance to help adults and youth attain citizenship. In light of the, what's going on with the Trump administration, this funding was threatened. Can you give us an update on the status of this funding and are these programs receiving enough funding? The funding has long been in place and providers have uh, been using it. Uh, at this point, it is a, a modest part of our immigration and, and other uh, legal services portfolio, but it's important. Um, when we have seen that the uh, president has threatened this in the so-called skinny budgets that come out and they're threatened to zero out, just as the president has threatened to zero out the Legal Services Corporation, which uh, is uh, the largest funder of civil legal services in the country. Uh, we take those threats seriously and we monitor them. Fortunately, with every actual budget, those threats have not come to pass. So it's something we're monitoring closely. Uh, we uh, have, you know, of course, escalated these issues for, you know, uh, our federal ledge team um, to be aware. And, uh, you know, we remain on guard for any threats to other sources of legal funding. <clears throat> and last topic has to do with the, um, the annual report, which OCJ released in March, its third annual report. Um, the report omitted a, quote, strategic plan section that had outlined projections and targets for different legal services offered for the next three years. Why wasn't this included in the report? And um, can you update it? So we issued our first report uh, in 2017 to cover the 2016 year. Um, and uh, as the uh, enacting legislation to create the Office of Civil Justice, which was an amendment to the city charter, uh, uh, mandated, uh, we included a, a strategic five-year plan in our second report, one year after the first one. Uh, the next uh, strategic plan is due uh, at this point four years later, so that's why there was no update to the strategic plan uh, in the uh, most recent report. Um, and so uh, we'll continue to be reporting on that basis. Don't you think the report is, is lacking for not updating us on the strategic plan? I think it's a fairly substantial report and coupled with other reports that we issue, such as the progress report on universal access. Um, I'm hopeful that we're giving a good picture of our uh, progress and our goals through the variety of reporting that we put out. All right. Well, those are the questions that I have. Mr. Chairman, excuse me, I have to go chair a hearing next door. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, let me announce that we have been um, joined by Council Members Maisel, Holden, Cohen, Levine, and Torres. And I have some questions, and then we're going to go to Council Member Levine. So in terms of budget organization, OCJ has a total proposed budget of $153.2 million for fiscal 2020, more than 98% of which is contained within one of OCJ's two units of appropriation. This does not allow the council or the public to track how much OCJ is allocating to its various programs. Recently, the administration and the council announced an agreement to include a unit of appropriation for personal services, but it was not reflected in the executive budget. Will this additional unit of appropriation be reflected in the adopted budget this year? Good afternoon. Um, we Just state your name for the oh, record. Aaron Valeri. Um, we appreciate the ongoing conversation with the Council's request for the creation of UNAs and budget transparency. As I'm sure you're aware, um, in FY17, um, as an outcome of those conversations, we created U of A 107, to which you refer, uh, which gives a picture of the legal services contracts funding. Um, as you are also aware, I'm sure, the budget director recently announced that there would be over uh, the creation of over 30 new U of A's in the upcoming budget. Um, and discussions are ongoing between OMB, the agencies, and the councils. And we look forward to those continued discussions on transparency. So you can't answer that right now? No, we defer to OMB on the list because those conversations are ongoing. Okay. We'll be checking with them a little later. 
Um, since fiscal 2013, the budget for civil legal services in New York City has increased substantially from 60.4 million to 244.6 million in fiscal 19. Much of this increase has come from city tax levy dollars with the city's contribution jumping from 142.6 million in fiscal 18 to 171 million in fiscal 19. So given the continued expansion of universal access to counsel, does the Office of Civil Justice believe its current level of funding is sufficient to meet its mission? And if not, what type of increases would the office require? We think we're appropriately resourced for uh, what we need to do. We do look forward to continued conversations with our providers about the needs they experience, the cost structures that they're using, uh, ways that we might find uh, efficiencies uh, to some extent uh, in all of the areas in which we're working. We're in uh, uncharted waters, given the scale of the services that we're delivering. Um, just by way of example, uh, the tenant legal services that we spent a lot of time talking about today in fiscal year 2013 were funded by the administration to the tune of six million and change. So we are stratospherically larger now. Uh, the obligations that we face in the courts and the communities uh, to deliver these services are larger now. And they're going to require uh, different ways of thinking about how to deliver these services efficiently and effectively. Uh, those conversations continue. It truly is an ongoing dialogue with uh, our contracting partners, um, and uh, as uh, needs develop, we'll certainly not be shy about raising them. Okay, thank you. Um, in terms of new needs, did your office request any new needs in the executive plan? We received, we were already budgeted to receive increases to support both, uh, to support the increases in the universal access program, so we, we did not. Okay, Thank and that was it? That was it. Uh, your office uh, currently has an active headcount of 41 and several vacancies. Is this budgeted headcount enough to support your workload? Yes, I, th I think our budgeted headcount is uh, 46. Um, but uh, yes, uh, we're adept at working efficiently and making sure that we can meet all of our administrative needs, whether that's policy making or uh, contract management, um, fiscal controls. We're lucky that we are part of a larger agency, one of the largest in the city, which was uh, not an accident. It was by design that the Office of Civil Justice was placed uh, within HRA uh, so that uh, we wouldn't be here four years later after uh, establishment still figuring out ways to staff up for personnel and legal and payroll and all of the administrative things that come along with being part of a larger agency. Can you give us a uh, breakdown of um, the headcount by position and title? I can, if you give me a minute. Sure. There we go. Um, sorry, I, miss, I, I may have missed, but it's 51, right? Yeah, I'm sorry, I misspoke before. It, we're at 46, but with uh, headcount, uh, part of the Universal Access Initiative coming in fiscal 20, it puts us at 51. Um, uh, Brings you to 51? 51, 51, in 20, in 20, as we head into mm -hmm. 20, that's what we're looking at. Um, so with the five vacancies and then the five new vacancies, that gives us uh, 10 vacancies. So for the 41 we actually have, it's 11 for contract management, um, 22 slotted for uh, our court-based services. We have rep representatives in uh, four of the five housing courts um, where much of the universal access work is, is, is occurring. And then 13 for central administration, program development, support, Q&A, as well as a data team to produce the nice reports that we your 46, give to right. the council. Yeah. Okay. Um, the mayor set a peg target of 50 million for HRA and DHS. Will the peg that the agencies in, that, will, that, that you'll implement affect the Office of Civil Justice and any of the programs it provides? Uh, we do not anticipate those pegs to affect this office. Okay. Can you share with the council a breakdown of the different um, f um, phases for access to council? We're uh, completing phase two, uh, which involved the addition of additional zip codes uh, to be covered through universal access, as well as uh, an increase in just general support and availability for tenant legal services uh, throughout the city. 
Um, we are at an inflection point uh, with respect to phase three and beyond. And uh, while funding is in place and contracts are in place and registered that provide a tremendous amount of increased funding, availability of uh, legal services uh, capacity, um, the discussions about how to approach uh, the, the smart and efficient application of that capacity uh, are ongoing. Um, we intend to pursue our strategy of uh, increasing by zip code. We've found it to be extremely successful, not just in terms of making legal services available to some of the most vulnerable New Yorkers facing eviction and displacement, but also incrementally changing the culture of the housing court and all of the stakeholders. Uh, the housing court uh, in New York City had long operated uh, in a way where, uh, by necessity, not every case and very few cases received legal services. And so legal providers wisely, over time, developed a system of triage. Where can I apply my legal services, my legal acumen, to have the most impact uh, in this case, and that means a client who is uh, cooperative, that means a case with uh, litigable issues of law where a lawyer can really make a difference, and uh, over time, a culture developed where, by everybody's measure, there were many cases, whether it's a judge, or a lawyer, or a landlord's lawyer, or even litigants themselves who say, I don't need a lawyer, I need the rent. And that's just simply not true, particularly in a universal access uh, context, where every case is a legal case. Every case with a lawyer on the other side ought to have a lawyer on the side of the tenant, and that's what we're working towards. Um, changing that culture has been challenging. Um, some have welcomed it. Very few have resisted it. Uh, but one thing that has been extremely powerful in doing that is creating what we're calling the universal access parts, the universal access courtrooms, where uh, the courtrooms are literally inundated with lawyers because they're there every day working on the cases in those parts because those cases are selected by zip code. And it has truly changed the culture in those courtrooms and in turn the culture is changing in the housing court. So, okay, so what we're basically looking for is an updated um, plan which includes the additional phases. Can you provide us with that? At this point, it would be too soon to say. We have funding levels which uh, we can share. Um, uh, I'll have to come back to you with but that. But we have a, a, a Yeah, I think you have that. I think you have what the funding levels are. In terms of what the strategic application of that is, again, that is uh, to be determined after uh, more discussions with the providers, understanding what their capacity actually looks like. And when do you think you would know that? I think in the coming months we'll be uh, developing it, certainly what phase three looks like and seeing what that goes and we're having And then at that point you'd share with that with us? Of course. Okay, um, I'm gonna turn it over just to Council Member Levine. I believe he has questions. And then uh, we'll, we'll wrap it up after that. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Jordan, and it's great to see you on the team. Thank you, Council Member. I, I'm just so excited about the impact that this program's already having. Uh, and I wanna compliment you on, on your personal leadership and your role in this success. Thank you. Uh, the eviction rates, as you well know, citywide are down 37% since we began this program. It's just a stunning level of impact. And uh, it's being replicated now around the country. New York was first, uh, but we're not gonna be the last. Others are following our lead. Um, the original law defined the income cutoff as 200% of poverty. The federal government is notoriously slow in raising the poverty rate. And uh, it's been stuck now uh, at 12,000 and change for a single person for years. Um, the law calls uh, for a 200% uh, poverty cutoff, so uh, 24,000 and change for a single adult. Um, we're raising the minimum wage, thank God, in this state. And that means that a single adult making minimum wage in a full-time job would no longer qualify for this program. And so we have been working on legislation, as I think you know, uh, on the council side, uh, to raise the income cutoff to 400% of poverty because we think that really would capture all those who truly are in need of this assistance. Um, can you talk to us about the percent of, of people in the uh, applicable zip codes 
who are being uh, covered uh, under the income cutoff and whether you might be seeing a trend that as we have changes in the economy and changes in the minimum wage uh, towards more people um, uh, coming in above the cutoff rate for full representation. Um, I, I don't have chapter and verse in terms of statistics to share with the council today. Um, what I can say is uh, we had a working estimate uh, that helped us design this program that roughly 60% of uh, tenants facing eviction in housing court citywide uh, would fall within 0% uh, to 200%. Um, we haven't seen anything to dissuade us. Uh, is, from is that a current figure? That was a figure uh, from, I want to say, 2016. So we have not taken a fresh look at that question. Uh, I mean, if nothing else, the rise of the minimum wage, which again, we celebrate without reservation. Um, but there, there's an unintended effect of pushing people just above the poverty rate. I think almost anyone would agree that uh, someone making 30,000 a year is not wealthy, certainly not in the New York City real estate market. And uh, from a mission perspective, we'd want them to be represented. Yeah. I mean, I, I think um, one thing to realize is um, in terms of the determination of income, uh, first of all, let me say anybody receiving public assistance, whether it's uh, cash assistance uh, or SNAP, is uh, under our contracts uh, per se eligible uh, for these services. Um, and I, I think that does cover it to a zero to 200 percent, but to the extent that there's some slight overlap there, we're erring on the side of inclusion and not exclusion. Um, uh, it's something we continue to look at. We're happy to continue the dialogue with the council. And just very, very quickly, one more point. I know I'm over time, but very quick. Um, landlords are changing their tactics as this program has taken hold, and they are increasingly trying to reach tenants before the tenants have connected to their attorney, before they know they have an attorney in many cases, sometimes up to and including the very morning of a tenant's first court date where landlord attorneys will work the line outside of housing court, which is unfortunately often very long. And they'll grab a tenant and say, I'm gonna offer you a stipulation agreement right now. It might include leaving the apartment. I can't guarantee that that agreement will be available to you later in the day. And by the time the tenant actually connects to the attorney who's on their side, it's too late. And so I really think we have to do everything possible to inform the public that they have this new right before they are in court for their an eviction date. And that, that's going to require uh, everything from public service announcements, uh, I would even love to see advertising on subways, but also direct outreach uh, two tenants in their homes, in the community settings, uh, by groups who are on the ground with the trust of tenants, nonprofits who are already in the communities working with tenants. Can you talk about uh, your plan to reach tenants before they show up for their court date? Yep. Um, we, uh, first of all, recognize that uh, there are uh, measures that we take and then there are countermeasures by, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, the landlord's bar. Not every member of them, uh, but uh, we did hear stories of uh, some of the conduct that you described. Uh, we actually specifically looked into that and um, it turned out that it was, there, there was perhaps less to it uh, in that particular instance than we thought, but uh, you know, we, we do look into these things when we do hear about them. Um, as a general matter, we think that one thing is going to make a critical difference uh, as we go forward, and that's the inclusion of information on the uh, actual notice of petition that goes to every uh, tenant who is facing an eviction proceeding about how to access counsel. Um, the is this currently in the mail or? It's, it's in the offing, and when I say in the offing, I mean in uh, weeks and not months and certainly not So start months. starting in a few weeks, every person who gets in the mailbox a notice of an eviction, it's going to contain a sheet of paper or something that informs them they have the right to access an attorney and here's how to do it. Very soon, I don't want to put a fine date on it, but we'll certainly be happy to be in dialogue with the court as, as I'm sorry, with the, with, <laughs> with the council as uh, things are actually finalized. But we've been working closely with uh, the court, 
and with providers to update the notice of petition, which is an official court document, must be included on every, at first they're gonna roll it out for non-payment petitions, right. which is between 80 and 90% of cases. We'll have information about how to access uh, uh, universal access legal services. Uh, to back that up, we're standing up a hotline for uh, New Yorkers to call when they receive that, to pr receive information about how to access those services. That's exciting, the hotline. Uh, is, is, that a, is there a number yet that we can give out to people? Not until we are absolutely sure we have the capacity to answer all those calls. So one eight eight eight. Uh, uh, right to counsel. <coughs> I don't know if it's gonna be as, uh, uh, that, well, pithy is that, but there will, there will be a designated number that New Yorkers can call, and it does, they don't have to be in receipt of a, uh, uh, an eviction petition, uh, to receive information about how to access legal services. It is a complicated landscape right now. As you've heard, if you're in some zip codes, you are sure to have access. If you're in other zip codes, we certainly don't want to inhibit you from trying and speaking with an attorney if possible. Uh, and we're gonna be working with providers to see how best to, to, to spread that as best as possible. But right. having a live person on the line with language access and some knowledge about the system to be able to answer questions about where the nearest office might be, when do I need to be in court, uh, we think will be extremely helpful. That, that is great news. We will be very excited to help you uh, amplify this message once the hotline's set up. Um, and offline, I'd like to talk to you more about yeah. how that will work and who will be answering the phone and things like language uh, access, et cetera. And um, the, the, the news that we're imminently going to have information in the packets mailed out for eviction notices is also important. We're going to keep pushing until that happens. That's probably the one thing we could do uh, to get the biggest uh, impact. Uh, and so we're, we're, we're anxious for that to be up and running as soon as possible. And uh, again, I want to thank you uh, and acknowledge the success of the program. And I'm now going to pass it back to uh, Chair Drum, uh, unless you had any final comments. Yes, please. I just wanted to thank the council member uh, for the continued support uh, for this and our other programs. It's in our written comments. We do want to acknowledge your leadership. Um, it has been terrifically uh, helpful and uh, has buoyed our spirits at times when uh, there have been, uh, ch uh, I won't say challenges, but uh, you know, growing pains along the way, uh, which are just bound to happen with a project of this magnitude. But um, uh, Council Member Levine, you and the rest of the council have been terrifically supportive in this effort, and we really appreciate it. Uh, thank you so much for saying that. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, and we appreciate you coming in and giving testimony, and uh, we'll end it here with this panel, and we will reconvene thank you very in about much. five minutes. Thank you again. Thank you very much.
Okay, uh, we will now resume the City Council's hearing on the Mayor's um, Executive Budget for Fiscal 2020. The Finance Committee is joined by the Committee on General Welfare, chaired by Councilmember Steve Levin, and the Committee on Juvenile Justice, chaired by Councilmember Andy King. We have been joined by Minority Leader Steve Matteo, uh, Councilmember Inez Barron, and I, oh, Councilmember Bob Holden is here as well. All right, we just heard from the Office of Civil Justice, and we will now hear from the Commissioner of the Administration for Children's Services, David Hansel. In the interest of time, I will forego an opening statement, but before we hear testimony, I will open the mic to my co-chair, Councilmember Levin, and then Councilmember King. Thank you very much, Chair Drum. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Steve Levin, Chair of the Committee on General Welfare, and I'm glad to be joined by my committee colleagues, as well as Chairs Danny Drum and Andy King, and members of the Committees on Finance and Juvenile Justice. Um, welcome once again to the Fiscal 2020 Executive Budget Hearing for the Committee on General Welfare. This afternoon, we will hear testimony from the Administration for Children's Services, also known as ACS, in its proposed $2.66 billion budget for Fiscal 2020. Uh, with, when the executive budget was released, there were no new needs at ACS. This was disappointing given the high priority the Council placed on funding $89 million for child care educator pay parity in our preliminary budget response. Let me underscore for the administration that I do not believe it is fair or right for similarly qualified teachers to make 60% less than their peers who work at the Department of Education and that the fiscal 2020 budget is the correct budget to do the right thing for pay parity. However, we made progress after the release of the executive budget. The administration agreed to fund three foster care task force recommendations that were underfunded in fiscal 19. The total of $7.8 million will support $3.3 million for kinship navigators, $2.8 million, million to improve family visiting, uh, and $1.7 million for workforce employment. And I want to thank uh, Commissioner Hansel and uh, Deputy Commissioner Farber and your entire team uh, for uh, working with us for the, on the Foster Care Task Force um, and coming up with these recommendations and then working through to make sure that they're implemented. So thank you very much. Um, although we do not yet see the $10 million the Council requested for Fair Futures campaign for comprehensive foster care support, the $7.8 million is an important milestone, and I look forward to continuing, to w continuing the conversation about foster care today. The recent agreement also restored the administration's one-time funding of $4.5 million for child care contracts previously supported by the Council. These providers have long-standing ties to the community, and I am glad to see that their support is renewed. Finally. The administration agreed to add four units of appropriation to the budget. This will enhance transparency of the budget for the City Council and New Yorkers to better understand how ACS spends money on OCFS residential placements and adoption services. However, I am alarmed by the recent letter to the Mayor from over 70 CBOs calling on the administration to withdraw DOE's Birth to Five RFP and the Head Start Early Learn, sorry, the Head Start Early Head Start RFPs. I have worked with many of these providers for years, and I know that they would not suggest such a measure lightly. I want, uh, I want ACS to share further information today on the approximately $600 million, uh, $600 million transfer of early learn services to the DOE and how providers' concerns are being listened to and incorporated into the next phase of this process. Furthermore, vouchers, the other critical element of child care and early education, must be attended to. ACS will continue to administer over 66,000 vouchers, critical lifelines for low-income and or child welfare-involved parents. <coughs> Today I would like to hear what is ACS's vision for vouchers, what is ACS's targeted number for vouchers, and what is the level of funding necessary to reach those families that urgently need support, both those that are mandated vouchers and non-mandated vouchers. We successfully came together to defeat many child welfare cuts from the state and the administration was correct to recognize many of the savings the council called for in its preliminary budget response. But we need to, we need to see more funding in certain areas of ACS's budget to become the most proactive, progressive children's services agency in the country. And that continues, that includes how we treat our foster youth and our child care teachers. In partnership with you, Commissioner Hansel, and the administration, I look forward to, completing, to us completing that work. I'd like to thank committee staff for their work in preparing for this hearing and the preliminary budget 
hearing. Daniel Krupp, finance analyst, Ohini Sampora, unit head, counsel Alminta Kilowan, policy analyst, Tanya Cyrus and Crystal Pond, as well as my chief of staff, Jonathan Boucher, and legislative director, Elizabeth Adams. And I'm um, now glad to turn it over to my co-chair for today's hearing, uh, Chair Andy King. Thank you, Council Member Levin. Uh, thank you, Chair Levin and uh, Chair Drum for today's conversation and today's committee hearing on juvenile justice as well as general welfare. Um, and again, to our colleagues who are here, thank you for being part of today's conversation. And as you've heard from Chair Levin, we'll be discussing the proposed $2.6 billion fiscal budget for 2020. The city approximately spends $232 million of that budget annually on juvenile justice services managed by ACS Division of Youth and Family Justice or DYFJ. Services include a range of secure and non-secure detention and placement options, as well as alternatives to detention. In addition, DYFJ facilities renovations are a major part, majority of the ACS 10-year capital strategy, capital strategy at, two point, at 20, 207 million of total strategy of the 392 million. As the chair of the Juvenile Justice Committee, we will be focused on the progress of raising the age of criminal responsibility for our young people. We have about four months until October 1st, the deadline for the next final play set for raise the age. But unlike last October, this October, we need to make sure that everything is in place. And we want to know what it's going to look like when those deadlines actually, actually hit. Myself and, and other um, committee members have visited Horizon and Crossroads to up close to get an opportunity to see how those facilities are operating, meeting the staff and also the, uh, the medical staff, the healthcare staff that's on, on the, both of these sites, as well as meeting the dynamic young people who are there to improve their lives. So with that all being said, we just want to make sure that ACS is on track to deliver the best raise to age we can for our young people. In that vein, we hope to hear more about the staffing transition at a jointly operated Horizon facility. ACS shared at the, you, got, you all shared at the preliminary budget hearing that youth development specialists will fully staff Horizon by February. We want to ensure that that progress is still on track and lend any support and anything that we can do to make sure this happens. In addition, close to home is a key area of concern for all of us on this committee. The budget for close to home has increased by 26 million between fiscal year 2019 and 2020, bringing the program cost over 71 million. We wanna make sure that we have the right model for youth development in the close to home program and aren't paying for slots and spaces that we aren't using. Um, finally, there's a question of the juvenile justice contracts which total 102 million but remain hidden under the general contracting category. We'd like to hear an update from you all at ACS and if we can expect to see, see something being separate or they've been, or you are pulling that budget out of there to make it more transparent come fiscal year 21. For, for the safety of our children in the city of New York, it's essential that ACS and the council partner to grapple with these questions. I look forward to our spirited conversation as always. I say this is a partnership and figuring out how do we save the lives, improve the lives of young people, not pointing blame and actually acknowledging what are the challenges and coming up with truthful solutions that will deal with these issues. I want to thank the Juvenile Justice Committee for their staff and hoping for today's um, hearing, um, Daniel Krupp, finance analyst, Dohoni Sampura, head, um, unit head, Council Josh Kingley, and policy analyst William Honig. So now I'll turn it right back over to C Chairman Drum for swearing in the committee. Thank you again. Okay, and I'll ask Council to swear you, the panel in. Do you affirm that your testimony will be truthful to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief? I do. I do. Okay, uh, Commissioner, would you like to start? All right, thank you very much. Good afternoon, Chairs Drum, Levin, and King, and members of the Committees on Finance, General Welfare, and Juvenile Justice. I am David Hansel, Commissioner of the New York City Administration for Children's Services. With me today are my far left, Felipe Franco, who is Deputy Commissioner of our Division of Youth and Family Justice. To my left, Julie Farber, Deputy Commissioner of our Division of Family Permanency Services. And to my right, Elizabeth Wolkomer, who is Assistant Commissioner in our Finance Office. Since becoming ACS Commissioner just over two years ago, my focus has been on strengthening the work we do to protect children and support families. Using data, evidence-based and best practices and technology, we've made these systems stronger and made many strides in the right direction. To build on these accomplishments, I know that we must continue to invest in the work we are doing to help the most vulnerable children, youth, and families in New York City. Safety is our top priority at ACS, and we have strengthened all aspects of our child welfare work and enhanced our ability to keep children safe and support their families. 
We've reduced child protective caseloads, enhanced efficiency and effectiveness by providing new technological tools, strengthened our oversight and quality assurance processes, and enhanced training and professional development for our staff. This past year, nearly 20,000 families, including more than 44,000 children, received prevention services, while today there are approximately 8,300 children in foster care. Comparing the most recent calendar year, 2018, to last year, 2017, ACS has seen child abuse and neglect reports, court filings, court ordered supervision cases, and placements into foster care all decrease significantly. Our continuum of prevention services has earned us a reputation as a national leader. This past October, ACS began rolling out new enhanced prevention services to support families receiving court-ordered supervision or at immediate risk of court involvement, diverting hundreds of families from court intervention. Just last month, ACS began to roll out a program we're calling a Safe Way Forward, a new prevention demonstration project working with families experiencing domestic violence. This new program is the first of its kind in the country as it will provide both prevention and clinical services to all members of families experiencing domestic violence, including the survivors, children, and the person causing harm. This summer, we'll be issuing a new RFP for prevention services, which will build on our current system by focusing more heavily on evidence-based models and better allocating service models across the city in a way that expands access for families. We're continuing to partner with our providers to ensure that they have the resources they need to provide high quality services to the children and families they serve. We engaged in a collaborative and fruitful process to address the staffing, training, and programmatic needs of our prevention providers through the model budget processes last year. More recently, we've taken steps to strengthen our homemaking program, which provides over one million hours of training and support to parents in their homes. To ensure adequate resources for these programs, ACS is processing contract amendments that will allow us to pay homemaking providers based on an approved line item budget for all allowable expenses, which will ensure that our providers receive more predictable cash flow to meet their expenses. When our assessment of imminent risk of serious harm leads to a child's placement in foster care, ensuring the safety of that child is critical beginning day one. We have strenuous safety procedures in place to keep children safe in foster care and as they transition back to their families, and we are continuing to strengthen them. Because research shows that children in foster care have better outcomes if they're placed with relatives or other people they know, we've increased kinship placements from 31% of children in care at the end of fiscal year 2017 to 38.5% in December 2018, and we are continuing on that progress. To support these efforts, we too are excited that the mayor and the city council recently came to an agreement that will provide ACS with $7.8 million in fiscal year 20 to implement three recommendations from the foster care task force. 3.3 million to increase kinship placements, 2.8 million to improve family visiting for children in foster care, and 1.7 million to support foster care agencies in preparing youth for the workforce. Chair Levin, I want to express my appreciation to you and Speaker Johnson for your relentless advocacy on this issue and on behalf of youth in our foster care system generally. As we work to implement these recommendations, we will also look forward to continuing discussions with the City Council, with providers, and with advocates about the Fair Futures proposal, which would provide educational supports to middle school students in foster care and coaching for older youth in care and until they turn age 26. Providing high quality care to children coming into foster care includes ensuring that children and youth are safe and well cared for at the Children's Center and that their stay there is as short as possible. We recently conducted a thorough review of the needs of the children as well as the operations of the Children's Center. We conducted an intensive case review of every child with special needs and ensured that these children and youth were safe and healthy and that their needs are being met. 
We've hired a new Assistant Commissioner for Residential Care with extensive experience, and we are applying Deputy Commissioner Wynette Saunders' expertise in youth programming, safety, and security. And we've retained a consultant, Laura Velez, who brings extensive experience as the former De Deputy Commissioner for Child Welfare for the state. The Children's Center provides a wide range of educational, recreational, and social-emotional programs, and we've added many new programs in just the past two months, including the Lower East Side Girls Club and the National Arts Club. Youth at the Children's Center have applied for DYCD's Summer Youth Employment Program and for the upcoming New York City Council Foster Youth Shadow Day. Because we believe that a therapeutic environment must be safe for both young people and staff, we've enhanced security through an increase in the number of peace officers on site who are trained in de-escalation techniques, additional security cameras, as well as enhanced collaboration with the NYPD where appropriate to ensure safety in the external environment. And we remain focused on efforts to help older youth in particular move to other settings as quickly as possible. To do this, we've added case planners to the Children's Center to focus on finding kin or other foster care placements, and we're doing proactive home finding for youth in detention who are likely to be discharged to the Children's Center. We're increasing the foster care system's ability to meet the needs of youth with complex challenges by creating 144 new therapeutic family foster home slots, adding more residential care capacity, and collaborating with the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene on interventions for high needs youth. Since October of last year, ACS has been implementing the first phase of New York's historic Raise the Age legislation. All newly arrested 16-year-olds are now treated as juveniles, having their cases heard either in the family court or the youth part of criminal court. And if they are detained, it is either in Crossroads Juvenile Detention Center or one of our non-secure detention facilities. There are no longer any 16 or 17-year-olds on Rikers Island. And by October 2019, New York State will have fully raised the age with 17-year-olds also being treated as juveniles in the justice system. We've completed extensive renovations to our detention facilities and infused a therapeutic milieu while adding extensive programming, educational, and vocational options into our detention and our placement programs. Our next step is to begin transitioning youth development specialists into Horizon. As required by the law, ACS and the Department of Correction are collaboratively operating the Horizon Juvenile Detention Center. ACS has hired over 425 YDS to date, on track to meet our goal of hiring approximately 700 YDS. And we are set to assume full operational control of Horizon by January 2020. We began by bringing YDS to Horizon in April to observe operations, and then we will move to assume responsibility for security in planful stages so that the transition is seamless and orderly. We've also been working with our close to home system providers to ensure that they have the capacity and the service array to implement Raise the Age. ACS has been working closely with the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice on projections of close to home capacity needs to accommodate the 16 and 17 year olds who will be placed into close to home. ACS is committed to focusing on equity, helping strengthen communities, and preventing families from becoming involved in the child welfare system where possible. We do this through community and family engagement, public awareness campaigns, and subsidized early childhood education, as well as through the promotion of equity strategies across ACS's work. Our family enrichment centers, our community partnership programs, and our child safety campaigns will continue to provide a two-generational, community-based approach to address trauma and meet the individual needs of communities. New York City has made major investments in high-quality early care and education programs over the last decade. Early Learn is due to transfer to the New York City's Department of Education, specifically its Division of Early Childhood Education, this summer. ACS will continue to administer the city's child care voucher system, making child care available 
to the most vulnerable families in New York City. Now turning specifically to our budget, ACS's proposed FY 2020 executive budget plan provides for expenses of $2.66 billion, of which $878 million is city tax levy. As with all city agencies, ACS received a PEG target. Ours was $68 million over two years. We've met this target in the executive budget with reductions of $42 million this year in FY19 and $26 million in FY20. These reductions were almost entirely met through increasing revenue, including federal 4E funds, and decreasing costs associated with placing fewer young people in upstate OCFS facilities. The budget does include a $2 million city tax levy reduction in funding for administrative expenses such as supplies, consultants, training, and travel, and we're working with OMB to implement this reduction across all of our divisions. I can report that through our work with OMB, we were able to identify savings that will not reduce any essential services or the number of critical frontline staff. While ACS has been able to find efficiencies without impacting programs, services, or frontline staff, we do remain concerned that historical state budget cuts and looming federal reductions threaten to undermine our efforts and successes to date. While the state pulled back on its plan to eliminate all of its support for our PINs diversion programs, the state's FY20 budget maintained the $62 million cut to New York City's foster care funding, as well as the lowered reimbursement rate for child welfare services, which cost New York City about $20 million a year. Furthermore, the state eliminated all support for the Close to Home program last year and again this year, and required that counties remain under the 2% property tax cap to receive raise the age funding, which leaves New York City out. This month, the state has released preliminary new child care market rates, which increase the rates for child care. While the state budget included 26 million for counties outside New York City to implement the new rate, New York City is not receiving any additional state funding. At the federal level, we remain concerned that our Title IV-E waiver, which allows ACS to use federal 4E resources to support an innovative, flexible funding model for family foster care, that waiver expires this September. A preliminary evaluation of our waiver shows that it has been very successful, resulting in shorter lengths of stay for children in foster care, lower foster care reentry rates for babies, and improvements in placement stability. Despite the fact that we, like many jurisdictions, have successful waiver demonstration projects, there is currently no federal legislative authority to extend these waivers. So I thank you for the opportunity to discuss our fiscal year 2020 executive budget. I'm committed to ensuring that our work is not hindered by budget cuts and that ultimately we provide children and families with the services and support that they need. I thank the council for your leadership and your steadfast support. Look forward to our continued partnership and we are happy to answer your questions. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Um, let me start off by asking you some um, raise the age questions. Due to the needs of Raise the Age, ACS's capital commitment plan for juvenile justice facilities has grown to $205 million. The executive budget proposes to appropriate an additional $8.7 million in fiscal 2022 for the acquisition and uh, construction of the Division of Youth and Family Justice. Uh, can you explain what the funding is for? Yes, let me, let me uh, sort of explain in general, and then I'll ask, I think, uh, Assistant Commissioner Wilkham or, or uh, Deputy Commissioner Felipe to, uh, Franco to um, elaborate. So when we began our preparations for the Raise the Age back uh, in actually 2017, shortly after I became uh, Commissioner, um, one of the things we realized very quickly was that our two detention facilities, Crossroads and Horizon, uh, were going to need extensive renovation work. Both of them had been built in the 1990s. Uh, and uh, we needed quite a bit of work. And so we began focusing initially on meeting essential health and safety requirements, uh, which all of which were completed by the time we began implementation in October last year. Um, and now we have uh, moved on to expansion of programmatic requirements, recreation, and things like that. There's still a considerable amount of work that needs to be done on some of the 
um, uh, basic systems of those buildings, um, and uh, as well as some of the other uh, facilities that we have. So our capital budget, actually the majority of our entire capital budget is related to uh, work that we're doing with regard to Raise the Age and our entire continuum of facilities, uh, but principally the two secure detention facilities. With regard to the specific numbers, um, Assistant Commissioner Volkmer. Absolutely. Um, as you mentioned, the Crossroad and Horizon renovation plan is a total of $329 million, um, and to date about $133 million of that has been spent or committed. As the Commissioner mentioned, um, the early phase was to prepare for some key safety measures, including wall hardening, new space for admits, um, roof replacements, refurbishment of HVACs, so really um, critical safety concerns that were needed to begin implementation of Raise the Age. ACS is now working um, with DDC on a plan to continue addressing the remainder um, of the critical investments we need to make in mechanical systems and infrastructure in both facilities, and so we are working um, actively to pursue the second phase of this project. And that's work that needs to be completed before ACS can implement the um, raise the age on October 1st? The um, initial critical uh, safety needs in order to meet our oversight requirements have already been met, and that was why we pushed forward with um, that first phase of the project very early. Okay, thank you. Uh, the city currently does not meet the eligibility criteria to access nearly all of New York State's raise the age uh, funding, which requires counties to be under the 2% property tax cap or demonstrate financial hardship, which you mentioned. Uh, does ACS intend to request any state funding for Raise the Age implementation, including capital funding? Yes. In fact, uh, the city already has made a request. Uh, we made a request in, in uh, this year for first year funding uh, to, um, uh, actually, I think both state agencies, OCFS, I think, is, is processing and working with uh, the Division of the Budget. Um, it actually is a citywide request because it's not just ACS. There were expenses incurred by the Department of Design and Construction, uh, by the Law Department, um, by the Division of Probation. So the city submitted a unified request to uh, OCFS uh, some months ago. Um, we have not gotten a response to that request. Um, but our expectation is, because we know that uh, because of the requirement of the 2% property tax cap, which we don't uh, uh, utilize in New York City, um, we would only qualify for funding uh, if there were, if we were able to show severe hardship, and uh, we don't think it's very likely that the state will make that finding. Um, because there is actually, last year there was $100 million allocated for Raise the Age implementation. In the current state budget, that was doubled to $200 million. Um, we certainly uh, intend to submit another request for funding. We believe New York City should be uh, funded, you know, equally with other parts of the state. Uh, so we will, we will submit those proposals, but we are not uh, optimistic about the likelihood of success. Thank you. Uh, the council would like to see regular reporting on Raise the Age, including a breakout of the ongoing cost per facility and more information on the demographics and top charges against youth. Can you uh, commit to providing us with that information on a more regular basis? Yes, happy to provide that information. Yeah, thank you. Um, an issue that's kind of imp really important to me, um, the council is seeking drop-in visitation rights at the secure de detention facilities in the same ma manner that council members have uh, for the jails on Rikers Island. I think I was one of the first, or the first actually, mm -hmm. to go to Rikers and to see the conditions that uh, young people were being held in at Rikers. I remember specifically seeing a 16-year-old pressed up against the glass uh, on the door and just looking at how terrified he was and kind of brought a lot of that out to light. And I think that part of the reason that I saw that was because I did an unexpected visit to Rikers, which we are allowed under the uh, charter to do. Um, I do, do not believe that at this time we have that right to do it at, at um, uh, horizon or a crossroads. So um, would the agency work with us to um, make that a possibility? Uh, well, we certainly have had many council visits to both of those facilities. But planned. Um, yeah, we do. Well, I'll ask uh, Deputy Commissioner Franco to speak to this. We do, uh, you know, we operate under state rules, so we'd have to take a look at those. But uh, let me ask De Deputy Commissioner Franco to speak to this. Yeah, I mean, I know that actually uh, Council Member King and Holden came to Crossroads recently. Anyone at the city council is actually welcome to come to our facilities. Just but give us the some. issue for me is planned. 
because I look, I trust this administration and um, Commissioner, you know, I, I really respect you a lot. But um, what I found at Rikers Island was only due to the fact that I showed up unexpected. Yeah. And so it's those types of inspections that initiated the process to get these young people off of Rikers Island in the first place. Yeah. You know, as I know, I was a teacher when we knew the superintendent was coming to the school. Everything was, you know, in top shape. It was unexpected visits that um, really shook people up. I think something that is important to keep in mind about our secure detention facilities, first of all, they're not in Rikers Island, so they're very accessible. Um, the way that we do our work is actually based on partnerships. So at any one day, you have at least five different providers coming in and out of our facilities. You know, the Department of Education, the It wasn't enough providers. in Rikers. It wasn't enough in Rikers. Um, it was not. And, and in fact, there were many complaints even about the school at Rikers. Okay. So um, look, I, 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 what I, I think we can do also, if you're not going to agree to it, is to put it into the uh, charter revision. Yeah. Um, because it does, um, it does concern me deeply. Yeah. Again, yeah. I'm not clear about what the request is, but- uh, I'm sorry? I mean, I'm not clear what the request is, but if there's any desire by the, the city council- The request is to allow council members to come to Crossroads and or Horizon at any time of day or night, as is provided in the charter for council members to visit Rikers Island um, to specifically address concerns that we may have. Mm -hmm. And well, that, that's initially, yeah. because of my visit, I think there's a very big part of my visit mm -hmm. um, that got those young people, 16 and 17 years old, off of Rikers to begin with because of the horrible conditions that we found them in. Yeah. No, I, I understand your request and your concern, um, and let me commit that we'll explore it with you. We do operate under state law and regulations. We'll have to make sure that we do it in a way that respects the confidentiality requirements of the, of the state law and regulations, but I'm absolutely happy to explore that with Does, you. Uh, do state uh, elected officials have the right to go into uh, prisons? Prisons, I don't know, but juvenile facilities are uh, under a completely different part of the law than adult prisons. That's, that's the distinction. Well, I, and I, have, I know and that we're doing that, and, and I know why we're doing that. But, uh, you know, I, I, I really want to explore this further with you and um, Absolutely. make sure that council members do have that right. Um, families can play a cr critical role in getting justice-involved youth back on the right track. What are the current family visiting hours at the secure detention facilities? And does ACS think that they are flexible enough to meet working family schedules? From what I'm hearing, the um, hours are not sufficient. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, we actually have visiting five days a week, including weekends. We're more than open to look at them. Um, uh, uh, and what times? Um, it's actually all the way through 7.30 p.m. at weekdays. Starting and I can get time? you the sack. Um, nights, I mean the days so during the weekend. And what time do you start? Uh, I think after school hours, 3 p.m. 3 p.m. to what time at night did you 7 .30. To 7 30? 7.30. Yeah. But I, I could get you, for, I mean, if there's any feedback about further increase in participation by families, we welcome it. I mean, we don't just do visiting in secure detention, we actually have family therapy happening in our institutions, um, which is fairly effective. And we're actually looking at expanding the hours and access to families through video conferencing. Okay. So that, I, I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, anything that we could do to strengthen the family ties, we welcome the feedback. Okay, and when are um, the um, corrections officers um, supposed to exit? I think as we, as a council member mentioned in the beginning, our commitment in the last hearing was in February 2020. We're hoping that it happens by the end of the year. And are you, are you prepared for that at this point? Yes, we are. Okay. How many people are on in both facilities? Um, the SAC number, I believe, is 49 youth at Horizons and 50 at Crossroads today. Okay, thank you very much. Um, pay parity. As you know, the council called for $89 million in its preliminary budget response to provide pay parity for certified group lead teachers in our community-based early education providers. I was an early childhood teacher at the Grant Houses Daycare Center for mm -hmm. a number of years before I got elected, so this is another issue of importance to me. Uh, do you think equally qualified and credentialed workers inside and outside of city government should be paid the same? Mm -hmm. 
uh, well, I certainly understand the concern, and as you, as you know, we have been involved, at, while the program has been at, at ACS, in implementing the agreement that was reached uh, several years ago between uh, the Daycare Council and, and Local 1707 to raise the age of community-based providers, and we've been doing that on a progressive basis as well as addressing um, health care benefits and, and training and some of the other requirements of that agreement. Um, my understanding is that there are discussions underway between uh, the administration and Local 1707, and we look forward to the outcome of those. Can I ask you, Commissioner, have you been involved in those discussions with the mayor? I have not. Okay. Um, would you be willing to advocate for that with the mayor? Uh, I, if I were asked uh, to join those discussions, I'd be happy to do that. Uh, but the, because the program is transferring to the Department of Education this summer, um, we have not been asked to participate in those okay. conversations. And Commissioner, um, have there, has there been a high attrition rate in the community-based organizations for teachers leaving to go to DOE? Hi, I'm uh, uh, Interim Deputy Commissioner Barbara Carlson of the Division of Child and Family Wellbeing. Um, I don't have the numbers with me, but there has been attrition, and we can get those back to you. Okay. We believe it's significant. Okay. Just to go back to the hours of visitation, I understand that you have supervised visits from 3.30 to 4.30 p.m., and then they're done by um, alphabetical order, 4.40 to 6.40, um, A to M on certain days. And then other days, the last name uh, begins with N to Z, and they go from 6.45 to 8.45 p.m. Yes, I mean, the, it's not a, the alphabetical orders to decide which groups of parents come at different moments during that time period. I mean, the space is limited. One of the things that actually but we're looking forward to. You want to know something? That's not exactly how you painted it. That's not how you painted it. And, 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 and to have this here in front of me, after hearing what you just said and, and my, expressing my concern, I'm very concerned. Mm -hmm. That's not how you painted it. Don't do that again. Do you view uh, teacher attrition as a threat to the uh, strong birth to 12th grade education system? Uh, sorry. Um, I don't have an opinion on that. I don't have uh, well enough first in that, but I know that that's one of the issues that is being discussed uh, in terms of the uh, negotiations underway between the administration and, and Local 1707. Okay, thank you, Commissioner. Um, early learn RFPs. Does um, the DOE's new early uh, childhood program RFPs return to a pay for enrollment model even after ACS abandoned pay for enrollment after the problematic 2012 early learn RFP? Did you tell DOE to avoid the pay for enrollment model? Uh, we didn't, we didn't uh, uh, participate in the development of that RFP. That was a DOE RFP, and I'd have to defer to them on any questions about the RFP. Okay, thank you. And as you may know, a letter from over 70 CBOs was sent to the mayor requesting that the RFPs be rescinded. Uh, would ACS rescind the RFPs if over 70 CBOs told the agency to rethink its approach? <laughs> Uh, I can't answer that hypothetically, but as you know, these are not our RFPs, so again, I would have to defer to DOE on those questions. You know, it's strange that DOE didn't confer with you on this. Not that I don't trust what you're saying, Commissioner. It's just that um, one has to wonder why DOE wouldn't work with you in that transition period. Well, no, they have worked with us extensively on the transition, absolutely. I'm talking specifically about the, the drafting of the RFP itself. But no, we've worked very closely with DOE on the transition process, uh, you know, the staffing and so on. Okay. And that's been so very it's, carefully recalled. It's, you're saying that it's um, the RFP, that piece of it. That's correct. But you probably know better than the DOE um, what those agencies, those CBOs that sponsor the early learn programs are capable of doing, et cetera, so forth and so on. So I still find it poor that the DOE didn't reach out to you on the RFP. I, I don't want to, you know, reflect on that except to say that, you know, they are, and certainly we've been working with them for a couple of years now in planning for the transition, so I think uh, the staff in their early care division is actually quite familiar with the, um, uh, the capabilities and the structure of those programs. Oftentimes, and in the past, um, especially when you have smaller CBOs, the capacity to uh, write RFPs is limited, 
even though the program quality of the program is high. So that's why I, I, I'm, you know, stating this concern. Yeah. No, I appreciate the concern. I know it was a discussion with ACS before my time uh, in the last RP process. One of the reasons why additional funding was added uh, for those programs. So it's certainly a concern that we understand, and I'm sure our colleagues at DOE we understand it as okay. well. Thank you. The council was glad to see the administration accept some of our proposed savings in the placements budget. Um, this includes the State Office of Children and Family Services, which I think you mentioned in your um, testimony, uh, which in fiscal 2016 totaled $15.2 million to place just 51 children. Although the $5 million savings you baseline was a good start, more savings should be achieved. Given the large budget for, for placements, is the $7.6 million ACS is expected to spend in fiscal 2019 on alternative to detention too low? Um, I think, you know, we prepared our budget based upon uh, the best projections that we have, working again with our, our colleagues at the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice. Um, but there's certainly, there is some cert uncertainty, obviously. Uh, we are now adjusting to having 16-year-olds uh, as part of the juvenile system, and we are projecting to have 17-year-olds starting in a few months. Um, so we made the best projections we could, including budgetary projections, but we will continue to work uh, with OMB, MOCJ to refine those, and obviously we will uh, share that information with the council as we, as we do it. Okay. okay, thank you very much, Commissioner. I'm gonna turn it over to my co-chairs now. Um, I think it's Andy, Andy King, Council Member, Chair Andy King. Thank you, Chair Drum. Appreciate um, partnering with you today as well as Commissioner and your team uh, to answer our questions and making sure that we deliver the best services and the best system for our children in the New, in New York area. Um, but before I get into the juvenile justice questions, just to piggyback on what Commissioner, uh, Chair Drum was talking about, maybe one day, you never know. Um, <laughs> In regards to early childhood services that are in the city of New York and the conversation that you're having with the DOE or not having with the DOE, I would like to ask the question of, I know sometimes we have to stay in our lane or feel we have to stay in our lane, but if ACS has been monitoring the early childhood um, centers and the CBOs, what guidance are you giving the DOE so they don't phase, as you say, someone who might not have the capacity to fill out a, a beautiful RFP, that they lose out on service in communities that they've been part of for decades? What, are you, what information are you sharing with DOE so they don't just create something up that just loots? Because right now, as I'm understanding, a lot of this stuff is chaotic for people, and they're trying to learn this new transition that's happening. and. You know, it's like sometimes the right hand, no, not knowing what the left hand is doing, and information gets out there, which shouldn't have gotten out there until you put everything together so everyone knows wh where we actually are going. Yep. Um, well, certainly, as I say, we've been involved in the planning process with DOE for uh, about two years now. Um, and so we have shared with them extensive information about the providers uh, that we've been working with, uh, the scope of their enrollment, the kids and the families that they're working with. Uh, they know uh, the whole history of ACS's management of the program, including the last RFP process that ACS administered. Um, so uh, we've, sh we've shared quite a bit of information with them. Um, and um, we, uh, you know, we have also worked with, with them around the staffing that we have had in place to oversee those programs. Um, some of those staff will be transferring to DOE uh, as the programs transfer to make sure that they can uh, maintain that. And also, um, we have shared with them the work that we have done to educate parents about their options uh, in the child care system and the ways to exercise those options, how to apply for uh, different kinds of programs, which could be early learning programs or voucher programs. Um, but I will also say the DOE has quite a bit of experience already administering early childhood programs. As you know, the pre-K program has been in place mm -hmm. since 2014. The 3 k program has been in place for a couple of years now. Um, so uh, it's not as though DOE is new to um, working with parents and working with these providers. Um, but we have shared with them the full scope of our, uh, our, our involvement with the program um, and have really talked through in, in quite considerable detail uh, the, what, what's been required on our side to manage the programs so that they can prepare to manage them on their side once they transition. Okay, well, I thank you for asking. All I ask of you as well, when you're sitting in these rooms or if you just making sure that the system is fair and that people don't get transitioned out just because um, some other big 
community group has the capacity or the money or the favor uh, with city government that will move uh, a, a, a community that's based or program that's been delivering for a community mm -hmm. that looks like it's community and we transition it out just to give somebody else money, period. I've, I've seen it happen, I watch it happen, and I'm saying to you when you're in the room, I'm just asking you to protect the little mom and pop against the big, big bat monster that can always be in the room when it comes to money and dollars and city dollars. So yeah. thank you, thank you. I appreciate that. And let me say, as, as I said in my testimony, we will continue to administer the voucher program. And so many of the providers uh, where uh, care is reimbursed to that program are the kind of mom and pop providers you're talking about. And they will continue to have a rela direct relationship with ACS. Okay, thank you. So let's jump into juvenile justice right now. Mm -hmm. um, just to start on the same road that um, Chair Drone was starting on. You know, we understand that raised age has led to a rapid growth in ACS capital commitment plan for juvenile justice facilities. The availability balance for acquisition and construction for youth and family justice was $215.1 million um, in construction as of February 28th. However, actual year-to-date commitments for fiscal 29 is only $29 million as of April 30th. So my qu first question, knowing that, are you all satisfied with the pace of this construction? Does the executive capital commitment plan forecast commitments of the 97.9 million for DYFJ facilities in fiscal 19? And will ACS meet that forecast? And third, what do you expect your commitment rate will be in fiscal 2019? Will it improve from the lowly 8% that it is currently in 2018, from 2018? Uh, well, let me begin on the programmatic side, and then I'll ask Assistant Commissioner Wilkomer to talk about the, the fiscal side. So um, as we fa phase the work, as, as we uh, described previously, our first priority was to make sure that by October 2018, when 16-year-olds uh, began to come in to raise the aid into the uh, uh, close to home system, and more importantly, 16 and 17-year-olds on Rikers Island had to transition to Horizon. Um, to make sure that we had met all critical health and safety requirements in both of our secure detention facilities. And so that work was prioritized and that deadline was met. Okay. Uh, now our goal is to um, focus on addition, slightly less mission critical systems, but still important systems in those buildings, but also expanding programmatic and recreational space uh, at both facilities, but particularly at, at Horizon. Um, and that work is um, proceeding on course um, I don't know specifically about the expenditure rates. So I'll ask Assistant Commissioner Wolkman to speak to that. That's right. We're, um, as the commissioner said, we're working aggressively with DDC to make the improvements as quickly as possible, um, especially that they include sort of critical elements, including our programming space. I don't have um, a projection of our FY19 commitments in front of me today, but we're more than happy to get back to you with that. Okay, please. Um, as we are, no matter how they slice it, whether it's upstate, downstate, we are the model of getting this right for the rest of the state. So I'm asking us if construction is not on pace, light a fire under somebody, let us help out any way we can, because uh, you know, 29 million is not a lot of money that's been being spent right now or you have contracts for. So we need to know how that the other 98 million is gonna roll itself out and will you be on pace to actually spend it and build on it because we still got young people who have to be in the facility. Again, Holden and I, we did a few tours at Horizon and Crossroads and seeing outdoor spaces not coming together or indoor spaces not coming together. So we just need to know what track you're on and if you're not happy with it, who do we who do we talk to? So we, not, we all are happy instead of being not happy about this whole process that you all are spearheading as being number one across the state and making sure that these facilities, the monies get spent correctly. Yeah, no, I appreciate your concern and I appreciate your support and we will certainly report back to you if we need to. All right, thank you. Um, there's a new law that Corey Johnson sponsored, uh, Speaker Johnson, um, in regards to inmates in the direct, uh, Department of Correction to receive 21 minutes of free phone time. Um, so we just want to know for their privileges are every three hours. So we want to know how much phone time do young people in secure and limited secure facilities um, are receiving, and do they have to pay for any of these phone calls that they have to make out? Yeah, I mean, in, in, in juvenile detention, young people have never had to pay. They will never have to pay. Uh, also, a very important distinction, we never record any of their conversations. And third, in terms of how often they talk, they get a four floor of seven minutes a day, all of them. Say that for me again? Seven minutes a day, uh -huh. and they can actually earn more time based on their behavior. Okay, seven minutes a day, they're able to make one phone call. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. I guess you're keeping them busy enough that they're not trying to get on the phone, right? No, I mean, actually, many of them are doing really well, and they get actually get many more calls. Say that again? Many young people actually are doing well, and they actually get more than seven minutes a day. Okay. Do you know what that average might look like now? I can find out. Okay. Thank you. Um, I do want to transition to the close to home program. The ACS, ACS budget is close to home has increased 25.8 million over fiscal year to fiscal 2019 to 2020. I want to know is ACS operating any new close to home facilities with this funding? My, that's my first question. And my second question would be, what does ACS estimate the new population in close to home to be after the final phase of raise the age takes a place October 1st? Um, well, again, let me start with, with sort of where we are programmatically, uh, and then we can talk about the dollars. So uh, first of all, of course, as you know, um, because we talked about this quite a bit, in, uh, in the last state budget, all state funding for close to home was uh, eliminated. Mm -hmm. So the city uh, was required, and, and the mayor proposed, and the council fortunately agreed, to backfill about $30 million for uh, close to home funding to preserve the program. Otherwise, we would have had no close to home program. Right. Fortunately, we do. Um, now with uh, Raise the Age, we are anticipating, although we have seen, as you also know, uh, Chair King, we have seen um, very significant declines in the number of young people in the close to home program, uh, precisely we think because it's been so successful. So we have fewer young people being arrested in New York City, um, fewer being um, placed by the family court in the close to home program, and, and that's a good thing. Uh, but we also anticipate that with 16-year-olds now uh, coming to the program and soon 17-year-olds, uh, that we will begin to see some increase. <coughs> um, we have had to, um, as I said, work with the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice to try to predict and model what those increases will be, which is not simple because, um, as you know, the legal process, and even though 16-year-olds uh, are now in the juvenile system, they're handled differently in the court system under the law than younger kids. Um, and so we didn't know going into it how the family court judges or those uh, young people who might be uh, remain to be processed within uh, the other courts in, the, in a family part, a new, newly created family part, we didn't know how many of them would end up in, in detention, we didn't know how many of them would end up in the close to home program. And we're really just still in the first few months of that because uh, only a few of those 16 year olds have actually worked their way through the process to actually be placed in close to home even now because it takes some time to get through the court process. So we are continuing to refine those projections. Um, we, uh, we, you know, we believe that we have uh, sufficient capacity in the close to home program uh, for a, a period of time going forward to handle 16 and 17 year olds. Um, but we're closely monitoring that and uh, if we need to expand capacity in close to home, um, we will do that. We haven't done that yet, but if we have to do that, um, we are prepared to. Um, we did issue um, some time ago a, um, uh, a sort of request to see which providers might be interested in expanding their capacity, so we have a sense of where our expanded capacity might come from if we need it. Um, we haven't yet had to do that, but we are monitoring very closely to make sure that we uh, are able to keep up with capacity as it grows. I'm with regard to the, uh, the that, financing? That, that was... That? That was my answer to my second question. Okay. Uh, okay. Great. Oh, okay. Great. Um, so Thank you. Actually, that means there is no estimate, which is a good thing because it, we're saying that we're not looking to build on people messing up. We're looking to help young people before they even come into the system. So I like I like that we're thinking that way as opposed to preparing more jails because we're going to organize more people to go into a jail as opposed to no, nah, we're not trying to build on more because we want to keep them on the outside and have them be productive, go to a job, go to school as opposed to come into the system. So That's I'm looking right. at what you just said is the cup half. Three quarters full, another thing. Thank you. <laughs> and Commissioner, Good. I mean, uh, one, one thing that I think I was alluded before is that we actually made significant investment in alternative to placement programs. So we actually, you know, Raise the Age was an opportunity to think about what is it that young people, particularly at an older age, need to succeed in the community. And we have been, and we have talked about this before here at this forum, new capacity of evidence-based programs like multi therapy, emerging adults and multisystemic therapy for youth with problematic sexual behavior, which are new programs that actually allow in partnership for the, with the Department of Probation to support people in the community and make them accountable. Thank you. 
And from a financial perspective, um, to answer your question, uh, as the commissioner said, um, obviously we ceased receiving state money, and so um, to your point, there is a larger city tax levy investment, um, but our year-to-year -year, um, um, budget for placements in FY19 is 121 and actually goes to 119 in FY20. Um, and it's important to remember that the placement budget includes um, not the vast majority of it is our close to home program, both our non secure placements and our limited secure placements, but also aftercare services um, and the modest budget we spoke about um, to send kids upstate when they are court ordered. Okay. So we're not opening no new f close to home facilities then, any of this funding? No. We're not opening no, not up at new this time. Oh, okay. All right, good. Um, Commissioner, I just want your response to Chair Levin and myself letter that we wrote to you in the preliminary budget hearing. You said that ACS doesn't currently have a breakdown on the average cost per child in a close to home placement. However, in fiscal 2018, there were 139 youth in placement and 69 in aftercare, and the total budget for this year is 71.4 million. My question goes to 208 young people at 71.4 million dollars is $343,270 per youth. That's a, that's, a, that's a lot of money. So I just want to know, what are youth in close to home getting for that dollar? Mm -hmm. um, well, they're getting quite a bit. <laughs> uh, I mean, the, the, you know, the whole, and I'll, I'll let Deputy Commissioner Franco speak to this in more detail than I can, but um, the whole point is, as you know, the close to home program involves uh, not placing young people in large institutional facilities or pr prisons, as you, as you put it very well, um, but in small residential facilities um, where they are closely supervised. There's a very intensive staff to, uh, to young person ratio, and that's by design. Um, there are intensive therapeutic services for those young people, uh, intensive case planning for those young people to make sure that they can stay in communication with their families, in contact with their families, uh, to make sure that when they leave placement, because the goal is to have every child leave placement as soon as possible and move back into the community under our supervision, uh, to make sure that that transition is as seamless as possible back to their home school, back to their family, back to their community. So uh, the, the close to home program by design is very resource intensive. Um, it's also by design short term. You know, most, most young people only remain in close to home placement for uh, six to nine months. Um, and the goal is if we can provide intensive therapeutic services for a short period of time, we can restore them and return them to the community as quickly as possible. Thank you for that answer, and I'm going to ask you at a later date if your team can provide us. I'd like to like get a breakdown what just over through almost two hundred fifty thousand dollars gets. You know, you can say lodging is a hundred dollars, clothing is two hundred, health care, you know, the contract services to make sure that the money that's being spent that these providers are providing, and we're not overspending for an agency and not knowing whether or not they're delivering on the services that are supposed to be provided. So again, almost $350,000 is a lot per person. So we just want to get an idea of a breakdown of what we're actually getting for our buck. Yeah, we can um, provide that. And yeah. the next couple of questions I just have, and I'll be finishing up quickly. Um, according to, to your, you, provide, you pay your providers based on capacity rather than your census. Why have you adopted that model? Because the DOE is taking another model. They're going to pay providers based on who walks in the yeah. door, not based on how many you, you can take care of. Yeah, and I, and I think this is actually a really important point to keep in mind when you're thinking about public safety and juvenile justice. I mean, first of all, um, thank you for doing the math, about $243,000 per kid. It wasn't that long ago in 2011 when New York City used to pay, spend $279,000 per kid when it was under the custody of OCFS. So it's good to know that actually we're cheaper than it used to be. Uh, but a more important point, remember we were talking about public safety and you and I have been to some of the close to home sites. So it's not just about the amount of services that a young person needs, it's about ensuring that actually we have the infrastructure to ensure that those people are inside where they need to be, where they need to be at any one moment. I mean, when you and I went to see Brunner, you were particularly conscious about the importance of having people by the doors and by the windows and the different posts. Those things are, are fixed costs that we cannot minimize when you're talking about public safety. So even when you're running a group home that actually has eight kids or you have two kids, it's essential for us to sustain the public safety and have those positions where needed. I think the good thing, I think as uh, Assistant Commissioner mentioned before, now that we are ready to prepare to receive the significant number of 17-year-olds, we have the infrastructure to take them over. 
Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just a couple more, actually, like quick four. We'll be, we'll be very concise with these the next couple questions. And this goes to staffing. And the fiscal 2020 preliminary budget showed a headcount of 307, yet the executive budget showed, it, showed an increase of only 201. This is largely due to the removal of 90 positions, the 90 positions in the executive budget to achieve the savings of the 660,000 for fiscal 2020 um, and 1.3 million for fiscal 21 in the out, outer years. So my question goes to this. The 1.3 million in savings divided by 90 positions is an average sa savings of just 14,000 per position. How much on average were the state and federal government's contrib contributions to these salaries? Because I know you weren't paying anybody $14,000 to do any work. No. That's right. I can't give you an exact answer today, and we're happy to get back, but it, it's right that um, there is only a tax levy share associated with um, those positions and that there would be some state and federal revenue also associated. Okay. So if you please do, because we just we just wanted to know, because the removal of these positions, was because the saving is so minimal, 14000 mm -hmm. did it really make sense to move people out of a, these 90 positions when the savings was just 14000 a position? So we want to get some clarity on that, if you can help us break that down. And, um, we, can, we can certainly work on that. I would just note that, um, as with all citywide savings initiatives in this budget, we are still working with OMB to effectuate it. Okay. Um, so, so we can certainly loop back when we have actualized it. All right. I have to look forward to hearing it, because I know you didn't lose anybody on the ground, even if it was somebody who was organizing something in the background. Everybody's an intricate part of when it comes to helping children. So we want to make sure we're not losing any positions that deterred from that agenda, so thank you for that. Um, we know that the hiring up of youth development specialists is key to ACS headcount. Are you on track to fully operate Horizons by 2020, February, February We 20. are, we are. As I said in the testimony, we have hired to date 425 youth development specialists. Mm -hmm. uh, our goal by the end of the year is 700. We are on track to doing that. Um, uh, we, let me express my appreciation to you and the council. Uh, you have been tremendously helpful to us in recruitment and getting the word out about these positions. Uh, we think they're a great job and career opportunity for a lot of uh, folks across the city. Um, but yes, we are on track to meeting our hiring goals and we are on track to meeting the goal of assuming full responsibility horizon by the beginning of 2020. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, thank you, Commissioner, <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, um, this is my last question. Um, I'm glad to see that we're making progress with the council's request of se separate out juvenile justice contract for fiscal 2021. This category has 62 contracts and a total value of 102 million in fiscal 2019. Yet it's currently lumped together with general contracting, which we, I mentioned in my opening statement, and it's not transparent. So I need to know, can we do better? Can we get a commitment that how are you going to figure out to urge the mayor? How, wh what's the plan to break it out so we can see exactly what those contracts look like for 2021. We appreciate your concern, um, and we've certainly raised it with OMB since you've raised it with us, and we are having conversations with them about what the implications um, would be of going down that path. Okay. Well, um, I want to thank you, for, as Carol Burnett would say, I'm so glad we had this time together. But I want to appreciate all your answers. Um, we look forward to continuing working with you. And again, as I always say, the goal is having a real conversation about how do we make things right. And if you don't know something or something is wrong, and I go back to Council Member Chair Drum about visitation, if it's the right thing to do, then let's figure out how to do the right thing because he said it best. When sanitate, when you do an event in NYCHA and somebody's coming, they clean up NYCHA before you walk in the door. So we will never know what problems NYCHA truly had. And if you, no one knows you show up on any given day. So for us to show up to a horizon to say, let me just show up today and see what's going on here. We should be able, especially those of us who are on the committee and any council member, because we have oversight of it, you, we should be able to walk into anything that we're funding and we have oversight on it, and it doesn't have to be staged and planned before we walk into the door. Then we get the real truth of what's going on. Then we can come back and say, you know, we saw this. How did we correct it? But if systems hide it, they will never address it. So I think we, we, we're on the, council member Drummond, we're all on the right path of saying, letting council members walk into your facilities and say, hey, we're here, just welcome us in and move us around and move us out when you're at the end of our visit. So thank you, Council Member Drummond. Thank you, Chair Levin, for today's conversation. More importantly, Commissioner, thank you for joining us today. Thank, thank you very, very much. much. Uh, council Member Holden. Yes, um, thank you, Chairs. Um, first of all, thank you very much for the tours of uh, Crossroads and Horizons earlier. Um, and Crossroads was quite amazing. I was very impressed with it. Uh, the outside yard was great. Um, when are we, we, I think the end of this month, we're supposed to open at the Horizons, the, uh, the yard? 
um, Deputy Commissioner. Yeah, well, the good news is actually, sorry, the good news is that actually we were able to open up a outside basketball court at Horizons uh, about last month. Uh, young people are using it now that the weather is better. And we're working really hard with our partners at the Department of Design and Construction and others to kind of do the landscaping readiness for the grassy area outside that you saw so well at Crossroads. So, so the kids can go outside now, yeah, they're they, going out. That's right great. now they can, they're going that's, out that's to play wonderful. basketball. Yeah, because that was a huge problem with no. Horizons that I saw, especially with the weather getting nicer. Um, happy to hear that. Um, of the 425 uh, YDS workers, um, uh, how many are being trained at Horizons now? Well, none of them are being trained at Horizons. So they, they all, first of all, they go through their training in our academy. We have an academy right. where we do training for all of our youth but development says, specialists. I think in your testimony that they're observing. They're all now working uh, almost entirely at Crossroads. Some of them, a few work in um, uh, other functions like transportation and so on. And we have just sent, as of April, transferred a set of uh, supervisors, YDS supervisors, to Horizon to sort of oversee, shadow the work that the correction officers are doing, understand uh, sort of the differences between their work and the way they do it and ours, to plan for uh, the frontline YDS will be coming in in the next couple of months. So you, you don't think it's a good idea to try to have, um, uh, you know, like let's say uh, 50 to 100 uh, YDS train at, at the site at Horizons to work with correction officers? Or, oh yes, we will be doing that, or, yes. We're gonna do a very phased process. So phase one was the supervisors, so that when the line staff come, the supervisors will understand the structure, the framework, the context, and they'll be in a position to supervise. But yes, absolutely, the plan is uh, to begin having our work, our staff work collaboratively together with the correction officers and sort of take over parts of the facility piece by piece as we move towards full operation by the beginning of next year. Great, thank you so much. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair Levin. Thank you, Chair Drum. Um, so, Commissioner, I might be jumping around a little bit uh, from topic to topic. I'll try to keep it brief um, so we can let everybody go home um, or back to work. Um, whichever. Um, I want to first ask about um, the Fair Futures uh, proposal. Uh, it's comprehensive foster care model where young people are paired with a coach from middle school through age 26. The council put uh, uh, $10 million in a preliminary budget response uh, to go towards this program. Um, we have not seen it uh, added to the executive budget, um, but are hopeful that it will be um, added uh, by the administration uh, through budget negotiations. Mm -hmm. um, has ACS examined uh, Fair Futures as a proposal, kind of seen where it's um, been implemented at some of the not-for-profits that do it uh, through their own funding, um, and how do you, do you see it as a scalable mm -hmm. um, program, and what are your thoughts on it? Yeah, um, yes, we have. We <coughs> have, uh, you know, we're very familiar with the, uh, so the program components that are currently in existence that are pieces of Fair Futures, it's a much more comprehensive proposal. Um, we've had a lot of discussions with the advocate, and I, and I should say, I mean, we have been um, very impressed and I actually heartened by the uh, intensity of the advocacy for this. It's wonderful that so many uh, people from the council to the providers to young people who are out on the steps uh, right now um, are so committed to this. Um, it is, from our perspective, it is um, very consistent with a lot of the things we are already doing at ACS. We believe that um, developing the skills of uh, youth in foster care so that they can be successful in the workforce when they leave foster care and become adults is critical. Um, we have a lot, as you know very well, uh, Chair Levin, we have a lot of, of things in place and, and mm -hmm. the foster care task force recommended some additional interventions and, and thanks to you and your colleagues, we now have some funding for that as well. Um, so we're, we're very interested in the Fair Futures um, concept um, and we think it's a really interesting proposal and could potentially be very compatible with what we're doing and um, I'm hopeful that there will be discussions um, as the adopted budget is finalized between the administration and the council about how it could be supported. Um, have you been able to do a financial analysis of it to see how, you know, how it may, how it would play out if it was scaled up on a, on a financial? 
we've looked at the, um, the financial analysis that the advocates have done as part of their proposal. Um, we haven't done our own independent okay. financial analysis. Have, have you, do you have any comment on their financial analysis? Uh, uh, it's interesting. <laughs> um, it is, you know, obviously to take it to full scale because it involves uh, a quite an extensive age range and it, it is a universal uh, model for all young people in foster care beginning in middle school and who have left foster care up to age 26. Um, so it is uh, a fairly expensive proposal, as you know, in, at full scale. The advocates have estimated it at $50 million. Mm -hmm. um, we think there is some potential, you know, that could be sort of scaled up over time. Uh, we also think that it, there might be some potential to build on some comp program components already in place. And so certainly if, uh, if the administration and the council do decide to fund it to s whatever degree in the final budget, um, we are very excited about uh, implementing and, and working with uh, the providers and the council around the implementation of it. Um, would any of it be uh, fundable through state or federal dollars? Uh, potentially. Uh, certainly, f you know, for youth who are in foster care, there is certainly potential uh, to do that. Uh, for the older youth, I think it's more difficult once they're out of foster care. That, that's, you know, the, the primary source of, of federal support uh, is for young people in foster care, and the state support uh, for young people really ends uh, at, at age 21, even though we keep some young people in foster care beyond that age, but the state no longer contributes financially. So mm -hmm. uh, I think there's, there's potential uh, for the younger cohort, probably not for the older cohort. Okay. Um, I just want to confirm with you um, the $7.8 million for foster care, the kinship navigators at 3.3, family visiting 2.8, workforce employment 1.7. Um, our understanding is that that's, that's, uh, has been added into the budget um, post executive budget, um, but is, is, not, is, is not going to be coming from existing ACS funds, right? Those would be new funds. That is our understanding as well. <laughs> okay. All right. That's good. That's good. Um, uh, do we know if that's going to be baseline funding or is it a, <clears throat> a one-year funding? I believe that it <clears throat> will be one-year funding uh, as we get up and running and then obviously depending on, on what, and as you know, those were based on uh, foster care task force recommendations, which were fairly general. We'll have to decide exactly how we implement them. Mm -hmm. But initially, I think that is intended to be one-year funding. Okay. Um, the, the controller recently put out a report um, around the issue of uh, children being placed with foster parents who have not passed certain background checks. Um, is, can, I don't know if you're able to comment uh, on, on, that, on that report and if you're able to kind of comment on um, the issue kind of more broadly, does, does ACS have enough resources um, to do background checks or properly train foster parents and, you know, in an ideal world, um, if funding was no object, would you, would you be asking for, you know, more funding uh, or, or <laughs> allocating more funding to train foster parents in that regard? Yeah. No, I appreciate your asking the question. Um, because we were very concerned about, about that controller report. Um, let me say, first of all, as I said in the testimony, um, the safety of young people in foster care is uh, a top priority for us uh, from the day they enter foster care. And we are doing quite a bit to make sure that youth in foster care are safe. Um, we uh, actually go b above and beyond what the state requires us to do uh, to ensure safety. Um, we do an assessment, a safety assessment of every foster care placement. Uh, we, we do a review of every foster care placement. We have. Um, multiple interactions with the foster care agencies uh, to make sure that they are meeting all of our safety expectations. It's a core part of the oversight and monitoring that we do of foster care agencies. Um, so we have a great deal in place to make sure that kids in foster care, and especially in, in, in family foster care settings, are safe. Um, and we uh, believe we are doing everything that the controller uh, indicated we should be doing. Um, we did, ha we had a lot of concerns about the controller report, which we ex expressed to them in detail, and actually it, it is in writing uh, with the report, um, and happy to go through with you what our concerns were. Um, we were dismayed that the controller did not make any modifications to their findings or recommendations based upon uh, the concerns we raised, but um, no, we, we feel like we have the resources. We actually, um, 
uh, actually just recently began investing uh, additional funds, significant funds, up to about $6 million in uh, sort of assuring uh, safety in the discharge process because one of the areas where uh, we're particularly concerned that kids are safe is in the process of transitioning back to their families uh, in, uh, through the trial discharge and, vol and uh, visitation processes. So we've added resources to support that. So we do believe we have the resources we need to ensure safety. We think we're doing things. Obviously, it's something uh, we can never uh, you know, rest on our laurels about, so we're continuing to look for ways to enhance that. Uh, but we do believe that we have the, the um, oversight and monitoring provisions in place to make sure that kids are safe in foster care. Thank you. Uh, moving on to um, child care. Um, uh, so so uh, vouchers continue to be an ongoing um, uh, issue. And since uh, Early Learn is moving over to the Department of Education and ACS is retaining the voucher uh, program, what's the long-term vision for the, oper you know, for, the, for the operations of the voucher system? Is it going to change now that uh, Early Learn is moving over, or is it going to be able to get uh, additional resources or additional attention because um, it will be, you know, it will be the kind of uh, last remaining child care uh, portfolio in, at ACS? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, well, from my perspective, um, the voucher program uh, <coughs> is really a key piece of our primary prevention agenda. In fact, the reason why we built the new division of child and family well-being around the early education program is precisely that, that we see uh, early care and education as a very important primary prevention intervention to help families and parents um, successfully uh, care for their kids. So um, we, uh, as we, as the transition of the early learning program happens and we uh, look at the voucher program, one of the things we want to do is some strategic planning to make sure that the way vouchers are used in New York City is as well aligned as possible with our broader primary prevention uh, objectives. Um, one of the, as you know, many of the, many of the vouchers are um, used by families who are receiving uh, cash assistance from HRA and are required to participate in activities uh, and need childcare in order to do that. But many of the vouchers are also used by families that are involved in our child welfare system and where we've identified that a family needs that kind of support. And we want to make sure that those families have access to that service. And then, of course, uh, there are you know, lots and lots of other families in New York City that need child care for a whole range of reasons. So um, we, uh, as, as we continue to maintain and, and oversee that program, we want to make sure that um, we're using it as effectively as we can to meet mm -hmm. the needs of families across New York City. And, and um, you know, what, one, it, back in December, um, uh, we all saw uh, the, the Jasmine Headley, was the case in, um, in Brooklyn. Um, <clears throat> a lot of conversations around um, the, the uh, policing and HRA. Um, but one aspect of the case that, that doesn't get as much attention is that, that she was there because her voucher uh, was withdrawn uh, mistakenly. She wasn't, it was, she was entitled to the voucher. Um, and the only reason that she was there was that she needed to be able, she relied on that voucher um, for her child to be in childcare while she was at work and she had just gotten a new job. Um, and so you, I think it, it highlights um, you know, the need for some flexibility in, um, in, in the voucher system. And I realize that there are limitations because of, of what's mandated and not mandated and, and um, where there are federal funds available. Um, but, uh, you know, she, in her case, she was able to go back to work, and that's when. Uh, her HRA said you you no longer have access to your voucher because you're no longer going to be on public assistance, um, and um, which makes no sense. Obviously, if she's if she's at work is when she really needs uh, that voucher to be able to to send her child to 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 childcare so that she can go to work. Um, and so um, you know I think it's important that we are examining how. Um, uh, vouchers can work in a kind of flexible manner um, that are not entirely tied to um, uh, entirely tied to a public assistance case 
um, which may or may not continue based on someone's circumstances, or, uh, or an ACS case, you know, which, which may or may not continue uh, depending on someone's circumstances. And so, you know, non-mandated vouchers have been, you know, systemically or systematically a, a cut over the last decade. Um, there were, you know, many more uh, non-mandated vouchers in the system a decade ago than there are today. And, um, and so that's I mean, it's something we should, we should really examine um, so that people have a little bit of breathing room in their lives uh, as they're getting back into the workforce. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I very much appreciate and share your concern. Um, you know, obviously people, people's lives and circumstances vary. And as much as we can within the require, I mean, there are, as you know, there are federal and state requirements that apply uh, to vouchers that are at least mm -hmm. are funded with uh, child care block grant funds. So there are rules about eligibility and recertification periods and so on. But within those, uh, I certainly agree that we should be as flexible and as responsive mm -hmm. to the individual needs of families as we can be. Right. So, and, and following up on that, so there is the SCC, SCCF voucher, mm -hmm. um, which is a special child care voucher, um, had kind of replaced the priority five voucher, which is a non mandated voucher that has its own set of requirements. Um, one of the concerns that we have, and I would, I think it's important that we kind of have a a uh, clear picture moving forward in this budget cycle, but then in continuing on to the future budget cycles. Um, so that because the children age out of priority five vouchers every, you know, every month, there's a certain number of children that are aging out, do they reach age 13? Those vouchers are not being replenished uh, necessarily, and so there's a continual decline in, um, in the number of, of non-mandated vouchers within the system. And every year we kind of go back and, and try to re-up um, uh, what's been lost. But I, I think what I would love to see is the funding available up front so that we can backfill the vouchers that there is a waiting list, so we could backfill these vouchers as, as children are aging out so that because Frankly, you know, the mayor campaigned during his first uh, election to keep those the non-mandated voucher uh, number where it was at the time. It was at 12,000 at the time. Mm -hmm. It's down to 7,000 now. Um, so there's a lot. I mean, it's it's expensive. Uh, these uh, uh, each voucher, I believe, is somewhere in the range of 7,500 or 10,000 um, <clears> dollars. <throat> But, but at this point, we're, we're at a, you know we're at a net loss of you know probably four thousand vouchers or you know a third of the system since since January of 2014. All right. Well, let me say a little bit, and then uh, Deputy Commissioner Carlson can can elaborate. But I mean, our our, our goal is to make sure that we are fully committing uh, the vouchers that are available to us with the funding that we receive, and we mm -hmm. we I think we have done that successfully, and we certainly. Um, as children transition out of the program, um, we do um, offer those vouchers to other families uh, mm -hmm. as quickly as we can to make sure that they are being fully utilized. So I agree with you. Oh, okay. our, our goal is to do that for sure. Um, we are limited by you know the resources that we have. So if priority, if a, if a child ages out of a priority five voucher, a new priority five voucher is issued, or an SCCF voucher is issued. <clears throat> Yeah, it's an SEC. Can you just voucher. identify yourself? And Barbara we... Carlson, Interim Deputy Commissioner for Child and Family you Wellbeing. Okay. Do you affirm that your testimony will be truthful to the best of your knowledge, information, belief? Yes, I do. Thank you. Okay, so it's, it's, it's backfilled with an SCCF voucher. Yes. Okay, so it, 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 as we're moving forward in this budget cycle and then again on into the future, if we could have just kind of an ongoing conversation about making sure that those levels are you know, consistently tr striving to mm -hmm. go back to the to the January 2014 numbers, um, I think that that would be um, very helpful. Uh, and, and honestly, in light of the fact that, again, we I think some flexibility within um, I think that it's important that, and I think that it's important for for New Yorkers um, uh, across the city know that that's a that that's a resource that's available to them mm -hmm. uh, if they're going back to work. Um, uh, you know, if it's a, 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 a you know, one, one parent is working, uh, one parent is not, um, you know, just that there's, that there's some flexibility involved um, so that they can, so that they can have 
uh, reasonable and affordable childcare. Mm -hmm. um, so, and and uh, and <clears throat> my last question, Chair Drum, because uh, I do have a number of other topics, but we'll I'll have to follow up offline. Those topics, just for the public's um, understanding and for the record, the Children's Center, which we expect to have a, a, a hearing on um, in the near future. Um, savings, I think you addressed in your testimony, Commissioner. Um, and lastly, just around um, early childhood, I know that it's moving over to um, Department of Education, the Early Learn, but um, I would like to know from your perspective as the agency that does oversee currently Early Learn, um, the issue of pay parity, uh, what the impact? I know that you, this is a, this is a labor issue, so it's an OLR issue. It's a, you know the mayor's uh, been involved, and, and so I, I don't I don't think it's fair to put you on the spot to say that you know the administration's policy should be uh, this, that, or the other. The council put it in our preliminary budget response to for eighty nine million dollars. But I guess my question from is for ACS to answer is: Have you seen what have you seen as the uh, as the effects of not having pay parity between DOE, UPK, and CBO teachers uh, in the early learn system, and kind of what what has that done to the fact that there isn't pay parity? What has that done? What is, have there been deleterious effects of that? I imagine that there have been in terms of uh, you know uh, attrition or people leaving uh, one one you know, one program to go to the other. I, yeah, I'll take this one. Um, I, anecdotally, we know from our conversation with our providers that there has been attrition and that that's a key piece that underlies the parity argument. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't think anybody can um, say that that's not so. Right. Um, I can say, um, I can't give you numbers today. We can certainly look and see what, you know, mm -hmm. what we can come up with. But I mean, this is not just a problem in New York City. It's a problem nationally. And it's well known that wages are one of the things that can um, keep people in a job along with benefits and other things. Mm -hmm. So um, we know it's an issue and it's something that the, you know, that has been, um, I think, discussed in the city for many years. Yeah, it just, it has, I think it, it has this kind of, um, it, it, I, I worry about the early learning system as a system's kind of long-term health. Uh, you know, ideally a teacher stays at a, in their position for a decade. Right, and so that they're able to, or more, right? So that they're able to um, to grow as a teacher and um, and and get better at their job and and uh, and have some continuity uh, within their programs. And and I'm I'm worried that you know the, an exodus from a CBO as soon as a, you know as soon as a, a UPK job opens up at a the DOE facility, um, you know, that's paying significantly more with better benefits and shorter shorter days and shorter years, uh, and significantly more pay. Um, it just it just it, the the it it all kind of undermines the foundation of that early learn system, and I'm worried about the long term health of early learn, frankly, uh, in that context. Okay. So. Do you want to take this one, David? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't think that anybody would disagree. I do know that um, there probably are conversations happening as we speak to try to think about how to address some of these issues. So we mm -hmm. look forward to the outcome of those conversations. Okay. Um, okay, I want to thank you all very much um, uh, for, for all of your testimony, for answering my questions, and then uh, we'll, we'll continue to, uh, um, to talk moving forward. Thanks. Okay, thank you thank very you, much. Thank and you. I thank this panel for coming in. We're going to take a five minute break and then I'm going to have the Parks Committee hearing right after that. Thank you.
Okay, good afternoon. Uh, we will now resume the City Council's hearing on the Mayor's Executive Budget for Fiscal 2020. The Finance Committee is joined by the Committee on Parks and Recreation and the Subcommittee on Capital Budget chaired by Council Member Vanessa Gibson. We are joined today by Min Minority Leader Steve Matteo, uh, Council Member Barry Grudenchik, Council Member Andy King, um, Council Member Joe Borelli, Council Member Justin Brannan, and others may be joining us shortly. We just heard from the Administration for Children's Services uh, Commissioner, and now we will hear from the Commissioner of the Department of Parks and Recreation, Mitchell Silver. In the interest of time, I will forego an opening statement, but before we hear testimony, I'll open the mic to my co-chair, Council Member Gibson. Thank you, Chair Drum, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I am Council Member Vanessa Gibson of the 16th District in the Bronx, and I'm proud to serve as chair of the subcommittee on the capital budget, and I'm excited to be here this afternoon co-chairing today's executive budget hearing on a topic we all love, parks. Um, I'd like to jump right in and talk about the 10-year capital strategy. Uh, the subcommittee on capital budget has spent much of the last budget season working to address many of the shortcomings that we identified in the city's overall capital planning process, such as authorizations, and plan commitments uh, far above realistic spending targets, front loading of most of the commitment plans in the first five years, and really a lack of discrete budget lines for many of the projects listed in the budget. Uh, while we've made significant progress and certainly want to recognize many of the agencies and particularly the Office of Management and Budget on improving the capital planning process, there is still much work that remains to be done. This is especially true with the actual 10-year capital strategy. The fiscal 2020 through 2029 10-year capital strategy provided as part of the fiscal 2020 executive budget still fails to make clear connections between the city's planned investments and the guiding principles of the overall capital program, as well as providing an appropriate level of planned spending in the second half of the 10-year planning period beyond year five. Uh, this issue issue is true for many city agencies, including uh, the Parks Department, who we have here today. Uh, the City Parks 10-Year Capital Strategy projects $768,887 on average, with a drastic one-year increase in fiscal 2022. However, beyond fiscal 2026, many of the park projects are projected to cost the city $56,828 on average, with planned spending remaining unchanged for the remainder of the years. Um, this, for many of us, is really unacceptable. Um, the 10-year capital strategy must be a comprehensive infrastructure planning document that properly anticipates sources of finance for identified projects and outlines the implications of the strategy that impacts many of our communities. So I look forward to learning more today about the park's capital planning process. Um, Chair Drum and uh, we others will talk about the expense budget and many of our priorities, um, particularly making sure that we focus on staff and resources for the operations of all of our parks during the summer when we know we have a high population of families and children that are utilizing our parks. And also, we continue to want to strive to create a more comprehensive 10-year capital strategy, not just in parks, but in or many of our agencies as well. Um, I want to thank the Finance Division, led by LaTanya McKinney, and certainly um, my colleagues in government. And I'll turn this hearing back over to Chair Drum and welcome you, Commissioner Silver. Thank you very much. I'm going to ask counsel to swear the panel in. Do you affirm that your testimony will be truthful to the best of your knowledge, information, belief? I do. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Commissioner. You can begin. Good afternoon, Chair and members of the Parks Committee, Chair Gibson, members of the Subcommittee on Capital Budget, and other members of the Council. I am Mitchell Silver, Commissioner of the New York City Department of Parks and Recreation, and I am joined here today by a number of our senior staff, including First Deputy Commissioner Liam Cavanaugh, Deputy Commissioner for Capital Projects, Therese Braddock, and Matt Drury, our Director of Government Relations. I'm pleased to give you another update on the status of the New York City Parks, the steward of 14% of New York City's land mass, and manager of nearly 4,500 individual properties, ranging from parks and playgrounds to community gardens and green streets. 
During the preliminary budget hearing, I presented to the Council with a thorough overview of the work taken on by the agency, and today will offer a briefing on the Mayor's executive budget for fiscal year 2020. The Mayor's latest executive budget provides New York City Parks with an operating budget of $540 million. The FY20 Executive Tenure Capital Plan provides total parks capital budget of $5.22 billion. As the Mayor has noted, the budget is cautious and conservative. The Administration is aware of the uncertainty coming out of Albany and Washington and is adjusting those to new realities. Despite that, I believe that the current budget allocation gives us the resources we need to provide amenities and services that park goers love and enjoy. Additions to the capital budget include over $25 million in funding for playground state of good repair and, and synthetic turf maintenance, another $25 million for HV, HVAC upgrades to park facilities, and more than $36 million in reconstruction efforts of parks, storehouses, and offices, enabling these buildings to last for decades, and ensuring personnel maintain a strategic presence in the surrounding parks. These allotments support our ability to maintain and improve our facilities and guarantee that our parks continue to serve the public. Rather than go uh, than do a customary readout of a list of numbers as a budget hearing tradition, I'd like to tell you a quick story, and it's a story of two parks, Van Alst Playground in Queens and Playground 52 in the Bronx. These parks were both chosen to be part of the Community Parks Initiative. The initiative started with a simple question. How can we give every New Yorker in every neighborhood access to world-class parks? In selecting Van Alst and Playground 52, along with 65 other parks in the five boroughs, NYC Parks took existing assets and made target improvements, leveraging the agency's expertise and the community's desire to see something new. Van Alst, cracked asphalt multipurpose area, was transformed into a colorful and well-structured space for sports, including basketball, soccer, and track. Playground 52 will now benefit from ambitious green infrastructure, spray showers that allow kids to play in the summer heat, but aren't taxing on the environment, and completely revamped amphitheater. These dramatic changes are the end result of consistent vision and desire to improve parks that hadn't seen investment in two decades. Now I'm going to let you in a little secret. The story I told you isn't just a story of Van Alst and Playground 52. It's not even just a story of the other 65 completed and ongoing CPI project parks around the city. It's more than that as well. The story I told you is also the central vision of NYC Parks under this administration. The renovation of these parks are emblematic of the changes New York City Parks has accomplished over the past few years taking a look at existing underutilized assets and systems while finding new ways to improve them. The Community Parks Initiative, the Anchor Parks Initiative, our zone management pilot, all stem from that principle. In all cases, we took the resources entrusted to us and re-engaged with the space, ensuring that it could be reimagined and revitalized. You need two things to create this sort of change, vision and know-how. Parks has both. We created a new team, Innovation and Performance Management, dedicating to make sure that resources we've been given by Council and the Administration are put to the best use. We also collaborated with our partners at City Parks Foundation and our joint program, Partnership for Parks, to marshal resources necessary to give local parks the programming and support that their constituents deserve. In the same ways, we have committed to equip our parks for success this agency traveling along the same trajectory. With support from City Council and the Mayor, this agency is focused on delivering for New Yorkers, whether through initiatives like Parks Without Borders, Cool Pools, Movies Under the Stars, or through the dedication of our urban park rangers who this year celebrated their 40th anniversary. These are testaments to an agency that is evolving with the times, remaining true to our mission, but continuing to evolve and as we look toward the future. Thank you for allowing me to testify before you today and for your dedication to providing great parks and open spaces for all New Yorkers. 
We look forward to continue working with the mayor and the city council to create an equitable and sustainable park system. Now I'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Okay, thank you very much, Commissioner. Uh, let me start off by asking you a few questions about some budget issues. Uh, after the release of the executive budget, the administration agreed to restore the funding of $9.6 million for parks maintenance, $1.7 million for beach and pool season extension, and a million dollars for tree stump removal. Have there been any discussions with OMB about baselining the funding for the restoration of these programs? There has not been discussion at this point about baselining these, fund, uh, these fundings at this time, no. So as you know, uh, many of these workers are the lowest paid workers in the, in the system. And uh, every year, um, for many years now, um, they don't know whether or not their positions are going to be guaranteed. So we hope that uh, moving forward, we can work with you on baselining that. Um, can you talk about the, um, the overall impact of the restorations of these programs on parks of operations? Well, clearly, uh, the more resources we have, the better work that we can do. Having said that, we always work with the resources we have, but certainly for the, both the gardeners and the CPWs, add value to the overall maintenance and care for our parks. So we're very pleased and we thank the council uh, for the one shot for these positions. Uh, the pools as well, extending them for an additional week, uh, and beaches uh, allow the public to enjoy both beaches and pools for a lot longer. So we appreciate uh, all of the one shots that was offered to us by council and does in fact enhance the experience for our park users, as well as some predictability for our staff about their current work situation for the coming year. Okay, thank you. The executive plan includes 4.4 million in fiscal 2019 in PS transfers to OTPS for various program deficiencies, including the fleet contract shortfall, the deer contract increase, urban, he, urban heat island, and re, the retaining wall inspections. How will this additional funding be redistributed among those programs? And given this shortfall, has Parks requested that OMB increase in baseline funding for these programs? Just give me one second, Council. Sure. Uh, those were reimbursements for money already spent this year. If you're referring to uh, some of those, the contracts, and I'll just read it. One ten, you said. One ten. Okay. So, is that going to be in the next year's budget? Let, let me ask our budget uh, budget director from Parks Department, David Stark. And Mr. Starr, I have to swear you in also. Okay. I do. <laughs> Do you affirm that your testimony will be truthful to the best of your knowledge, information, belief? Yes. Thank you. So the, uh, the money for the DEER contracts will be in place next year also, and uh, the money for the vehicles, it was uh, uh, an increase in the cost for the contracts as well as baselining the cost that had been coming in for one shot for the past three years, so that we're in good shape. Okay, good, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, the hiring freeze savings. The executive budget includes savings of $3.3 million in fiscal 2020 and baseline savings of $3.6 million beginning in fiscal 20 from the, ugh, from the elimination of 63 vacant positions. What are the titles of the uh, positions that will be eliminated? Maybe Mrs. Starr should come. <laughs> yep. So uh, as you know, all CACs were given these targets uh, and that the title lines uh, will vary. We could see if we can get you a specific list if you like them, but uh, they all the titles do vary. So, it, I'm sorry, it, it's what? The titles will vary. The so, do you have the titles already or no? We can we can get those titles for you. Do you have the titles already? Right. Right. We'll follow up with you, but from what staff is telling me. The okay, the reason I'm, I, I'm a little insistent on this is because um, across the board, we are expecting OMB to give us uh, titles, and we have not been successful in getting titles, so that's why it's important to us here, okay? Uh, the executive budget, uh, excuse me, all right, so let's go down to um, minority and women-owned business enterprises. 
Uh, the city continues to be a strong advocate for minority and women-owned business enterprises by addressing historic disparities in city contracting and providing MWBEs with increased opportunities to do business with the uh, city. What are Park's uh, MWBE goals and what is your progress in meeting those goals? I'm sorry, our goal has been a citywide goal of meeting or exceeding 30 uh, percent, and we have met that target in, 20, in 2019. Uh, we expect to meet that target this year as well. We're very proud of our accomplishment with MWBEs. Uh, last year, FY19, for example, awarded $120 million in prime contracts and typically rate number two in the city for these awards. Uh, we have a very robust outreach. Uh, we work with our prime contractors to reach out and partner with MWBEs, and we'll continue on that same trend this year. We're very proud of our accomplishment of meeting or exceeding the goal of 30 percent. Okay, thank you. Uh, the executive plan includes $796,000 in fiscal 19 and $3.5 million in fiscal 20, uh, and in the out years for fleet contract renewal, renewals and the maintenance contracts. What is the size of Park's fleets? Well, uh, we have approximately 3,000 vehicles in our fleet. Uh, and what, what type of vehicles are primarily part of the fleet? It, it ranges. We, in three broad categories, light duty, which are uh, uh, sedans and SUVs, medium duty, pickups, light dump trucks, uh, vehicles like that. And of course, we have lots of heavy duty trucks, uh, packers or garbage trucks, um, forestry equipment, which is heavy duty, container trucks, front end loaders, construction equipment. We really have a, a range of equipment that's necessary. Do you consider things like the gators or what are they, is that what they're called? The gator, if they are not, uh, they're very valuable pieces of equipment, but they're not considered vehicles. They're not allowed to go on the road. Uh, they that's don't have licenses and things like that. So that's the difference if they're allowed on the road yes. or not. Okay. Um, what is the amount of funding that the agency spends on vehicle maintenance per year? It's about three and a half million dollars in contract spending. Uh, we do have our own staff that performs maintenance on the vehicles as well. I don't have the number you know, associated with that workforce handy right now, but we can provide it for you. Okay. Due to an executive order that calls for the reduction of agency fleets, the fiscal 2020 executive plan includes baseline savings of $110,000 beginning in fiscal 2020 from Park's vehicle fleet. How many vehicles will be removed from the agency's fleet in fiscal 2020? Uh, Councilmember, I don't recall the exact number. We, of course, uh, you know, intend to comply with the mayor's executive order, uh, and we'll provide you with the number and the types of vehicles we will. All right, we'll push. follow up with the letter. Yes. Yeah. Uh, the Anchor Park Initiative builds off of the CPI program and with direct capital funding to historically underfunded larger parks that are greater than six acres. One large park in each borough is to receive major capital upgrades like new soccer fields, comfort stations, running tracks, and or hiking trails. Can you provide an update on the department's progress with the Anchor Parks Initiative? Uh, four of the five Anchor Parks are now either in construction or will start construction soon. There was one of the Anchor Parks that right now is still in design, and that is in Fresh Kills. So all the other parks, they were being done in phases, but almost four of the five have already proceeded. Uh, Fresh Kills is the only one that's lacking a bit behind, but uh, all are proceeding on schedule. I, none of them are completed yet, though? Uh, no, the first one will probably be Astoria Park. Uh, that should be completed. Um, it could be sometime this year. So that will be the first of the four, and the others will start following relatively quickly. Okay. Uh, let me go on to a subject that uh, is every council member's favorite topic, tree stump re re removal. Yeah. How much funding does Parks have for tree stump removal contracts, and does the department track the number of tree stumps removed uh, by fiscal year? Uh, yes, we have approximately $3 million for tree stump removal uh, in the expense budget this year. That's thanks to the $1 million that the council added to our baseline funding of uh, $2 million. Uh, and we expect uh, to remove uh, approximately 8,000 stumps this fiscal year. We're on target. We've removed about 7,300 so far, and we will complete the, the spending and the removal by the end of the fiscal year. Okay. Um, do you know how many tree stumps were removed in fiscal 19? 
Uh, that's the, the 8,000 approximately. Okay. okay. Uh, and just by the way, let me point out, like in my district, and I think I've said this to the commissioner before as well, where we have trees that were cut down and even the stumps were removed um, because of some issues with Con Edison um, and um, uh, saying that there are wires underneath, um, we can't put trees in. I would still like to discuss that further with you, um, whether we can get trees with um, shorter roots or at least put a bush in there or something, because they're just sitting with nothing in them and they actually in some cases become like garbage pits, to mm -hmm. be honest with you. Um, and would love to have the opportunity to further discuss that with you moving forward. Councilor, we'd be happy to discuss that. There may be options to move the location slightly in one direction or another to avoid the infrastructure conflict, and we'd be glad to look and see if that's It's feasible. particularly um, happening in my historic district also, which of mm -hmm. course, you know, I have to have trees in my historic yes. district, so. Um, okay, a fair funding for parks. In our budget response, the capital called on the administration to increase the executive budget by $26.5 million to improve maintenance and operations, but this funding was not included. Have there been any discussions with OMB of adding any portion of the required $26.5 million to the parks budget? First, uh, we understand the passion of the whole Play Fair campaign, and many advocates would like to see increased funding for parks. There's already an all as a year on discussion about how we can increase funding for parks. So that happens both at the budgeting process, the new needs process, and that conversation continues. Uh, but after that conversation, uh, you now see the executive budget. Uh, as you know, this is a process that will continue on until the budget's adopted. But this is something that OMB is very well aware of. Uh, both the Playfair advocates as well as council made that message very loud and clear. Okay, so we will continue to advocate on that. It is a priority for us here in the council. And um, I have an issue also with a, um, with a problem in my district, and I'm gonna take a little uh, chair's privilege here. It involves Travis Park. Uh, you're probably somewhat aware with it. And I know that you used to um, go with um, your iPad and show people, um, as use it as an example of parks without borders. You made reference to that in your testimony as well. This is a project in my district that's been going on for 10 years. 10 years it's been going on. And um, I'm very upset with what's happening at this point. You know, we, we closed the street, we bought a piece of property um, from an, um, a neighboring private school. It almost doubles the size of that existing park. Um, we had four visioning sessions with the community. Um, tremendous input, you know, hundreds of people turned out for this. And um, a couple of months ago, uh, Howard Coppell, the owner of an auto dealership on the corner of um, 78th Street and Northern Boulevard, comes and tells me that Parks is changing the, um, the plan. And I said, what do you mean Parks is changing the plan? Well, they've come up with a, with a different plan for the park. I said, how did that happen? Okay, I had no idea that Parks had visited Mr. Coppell and the Garden School uh, along with DOT um, to change a plan that the whole community had had input in. And I don't know if that's ever happened before. Um, certainly, any time I've asked for a change or an addition to a park, even when um, my predecessor had funded it, I was told, well, you can't add because we're in the middle of construction and I would only slow the project down. So here we are, we're halfway through the construction of Travis Park, and all of a sudden I'm being told that they're gonna give Coppell Auto a driveway into the park. I, I just couldn't believe what I was hearing. Um, and I have to tell you, I don't believe that you know, driveways and cars are a safe thing for kids. It should not happen. Then I read in the newspaper that um, you're paying um, some hundreds of millions of dollars for eminent domain for Hudson Yards to build a park there one of the wealthiest areas in the city of New York. But in Jackson Heights, we're supposed to accept this compromise, is what it's called, and a compromise, not a compromise. It, this is something that was promised to our community, promised to our community after all of these visioning sessions that we had, okay? And now we're being told what was promised to us is not gonna happen and that this alleged compromise, it's no compromise, Coppell's gonna get what he wants, but we're not getting what we want, and we're getting no benefit from it, um, is happening. So I don't know if it's ever happened before. Have you ever stopped an, a design in the middle of construction before? 
designs have stopped uh, for various reasons, but first, let me just state that um, I want to apologize about how everything unfolded. Uh, as you know, this project preceded my tenure, but I was quite excited when I learned about the project of combining a street and uh, school property with parks property. It is actually a case study about what should happen to create new park space. Uh, given that the adjacent car dealership reactivated the legal curb cut, it changed the dynamics tremendously. There is no final decision. Mr. So Commissioner, do you have proof of the legal curb cut? Have you seen it? It is a map street. Have you seen it? I have not seen it. I have not seen it either. And I asked buildings for it, and I have yet, yet to see it. And, 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 and even that issue of the legal curb cut, you take, you're doing eminent domain in the Hudson Yards. Am I right? Are you doing eminent domain in the Hudson Yards? The administration, I believe, is doing eminent domain. For a park. Correct. Right. But why will you do it there for the richest rich of the rich of the world, but you won't do it in an immigrant rich community? As I stated, this is not a final decision. There are ongoing conversations. We're working with city. I Park. was told that the, that, the, that the, the revisions are being made. To my That's what I was told. Are, I was not given an option. No. Options were being explored, but no final decisions have been made. Uh, and another correction is that Parks did not have a private meeting with Capel uh, as we were exploring once this came to our knowledge. Uh, that there was a mapped street with now the configuration of the dealership changed. We start exploring options. But at this point, no final decision will be made, and we'll keep both you and the Commission, what do you mean you didn't have a private meeting with Coppell? Parks did not have a private meeting with Coppell. Oh, yes, they did. They were in, in a meeting with Dorothy Lewandowski and Joanne Amagrandi and Diane, and they had meetings. Well, to my knowledge, I will okay. go back and check, but I was told we did not have and a he, And here's the other thing. Coppell has another entrance, okay? And he just doesn't want to give it up. I mean, I, I cannot believe that the incompetence of the people that were involved in this. Uh, this is a 10-year project. And if you're serious about parks and the things that you say, this project needs to be completed as it was originally designed by your department. And I will reiterate that no final decisions have been made. Uh, this issue is being discussed at the very highest level, and we are trying to explore what the options are, and we'll make sure that we both keep you and the community informed. So if you're hearing as a final decision, right now there is not a final decision. We heard you and the community loud and clear. When will that final decision be made? Uh, I don't have a timetable. We can certainly get back to you. Uh, well, I'm going to tell you possible. this. I certainly hope it's before. The, I, it will happen before the budget, okay, before adoption, okay, because otherwise I don't know what I'm going to do. Understood. Uh, this is owed to the Jackson Heights community, and uh, we're not going to back down on this. And the only option is to proceed as was originally planned. Thank you. I'm going to turn it over to my co-chair, Vanessa Gibson. Thank you very much, Chair Drum. Good afternoon, Commissioner. And I want to first begin by thanking you and your team. Um, particularly, I always love to give shout outs because they're necessary. Um, but our Bronx Commissioner, Iris Rodriguez Rosa, and the Bronx team are amazing. Um, they do a lot of work. We've opened plenty of playgrounds, parks. We celebrated Earth Day planting trees. Uh, we've done a ton of things, and I look forward to our continued partnership. But I have to say that many of my community boards, every year during budget time complain about lack of maintenance staff and particularly PEP officers. Um, during the summertime we are in such greater need um, seasonal workers and many of the DC 37 workers but I cannot tell you going to my community board meetings in May and June are rough because they are expecting that during the budget negotiations we will always prioritize maintenance workers playground associates urban park rangers and PEP officers and so I think when chair drum talked about the fair funding for parks and really the City Council's priority in adding 26 and a half million dollars understanding that there is a real need. Um, I'm hoping that the administration understands the need and OMB and Parks Department will come to some 
resolution on how we can get as close as possible to 26.5. I'll actually take all 26.5, but um, I do know that this is a negotiations, but I cannot tell you how you know, much of a priority it is just from my perspective in the Bronx, and I'm sure my colleagues will agree with me. So I just wanted to add my voice to that, and you know, many of the advocates are here, but it's really, really important as we are heading into the summer season. So some of the initiatives that the chair talked about, I'm very grateful, the extended hours at our pools, um, obviously always a great thing, but I wanted to first ask a question about the capital strategy. Um, when we had our preliminary budget hearing a few months ago, um, we were told that OMB made a directive to all of the agencies to make sure that the 10-year capital strategy is really reflected over all 10 years and not just front-loaded in the first five. Um, some agencies have been making strides to achieve that, but others were still a work in progress. Um, so in the Parks Department 10-year capital strategy, which is about $4.6 billion, and of that $4.6 billion, 4.2, or 93%, is front-loaded in the first five years. So in years six through 10, we have a graph, and it almost goes like a flat line, literally. Um, and so what my question is, is will we see any changes in the 10 year to more accurately reflect a 10 year plan beyond year five, where we know that we will need to continue to invest in more capital projects and parks in the full 10 years? Council Member, I certainly appreciate the question. Uh, I'll have to get back on Sorry. the allocations over the 10 year period. Uh, I do know that uh, every year during a four-year strategy, we're always making those adjustments to make sure that there's a clear strategy going forward about how we'll invest in our parks. But in terms of the allotment over the 10-year period, it's something I'll have to get back to you, but we certainly take a very hard look at the four- and five-year time frame to make sure it's appropriately funded to achieve the strategy we'd like to see in our capital investment in parks. Okay. Um, is there a periodic time frame in which you do assess the budgetary accuracy of the capital strategy? Is that something that Parks Absolutely. does year after year? We do year after year. Okay, yes, good. Every year. Okay. So in terms of any just follow-up, can we expect something very shortly? Yes, we'll respond within the week. Okay, great. Um, Council Member Jonah is here, so I'm pretty sure he's going to ask about Orchard Beach, but um, as a Bronx member, I, I definitely wanted to ask about Orchard Beach since it's our prized possession in the Bronx, and we elected officials, including Speaker Carl Hasty, uh, the Bronx Borough President, Ruben Diaz, I mean, everyone collectively, the former council member, everyone has really collectively made sure that we invested in Orchard Beach because we know there's extensive work that needs to be done over several years. So in the capital commitment plan, uh, there is an additional $7 million in fiscal 2020. So I wanted to understand um, how much is allocated in the agency's capital budget for the Orchard Beach reconstruction, and is this properly funded? Do we need to look at more money for the full Orchard Beach reconstruction? Right. right now, the projects we have for the restoration of the pavilion itself and some additional work, uh, all that is fully funded. We expect okay. the project to start, uh, I believe, in 2020, and all work to be completed by 2022. 2020, okay. We're still in design, right? Uh, yes, this is EDC is working on our behalf on this project and we're still in the design phase. Okay, great. Um, I wanted to ask about another popular topic the borough commissioner knows well, how much my constituents love comfort stations. And some of the members have asked me in terms of how the price has tripled since 2011, where the average cost of a comfort station is $3.6 million. And back in 2011, it was about 1.3. Um, I know there are lots of unanticipated costs, things that you know we really can't anticipate that much, um, but is there any logical explanation that you could provide to help council members understand for future construction projects like how the cost has ballooned so much? And then in addition, the vendors in the city of New York that we work with that actually build out 
comfort stations as well as renovate. Have we looked at expanding that? Are we working with a few? Are we working with a larger number? How does all of this work and, and what could we say about comfort stations? Let me answer the second part first. Okay. Uh, we reach out to any qualified contractor to bid on our projects. We have to make sure that they qualify and that we will always accept the lowest responsible bidder and that is the approach that we take and we're always reaching out for new contractors, be them regular uh, primes or MWBE, is to our benefit to increase as many contractors as possible. In terms of your first question, we are as concerned as you are. Uh, we've seen these prices escalate. Uh, we reached out to the General Contracts Association to find out exactly why these prices are going up. It has nothing to do with delays once the contract's awarded, is that's what we're getting when we put it out to bid. And it's concerning us because we have two choices. We could accept that bid price, or we can reject it and rebid it out, but that means it may cost another four to six months in delay. We're finding that in New York, the prices are escalating. San Francisco is now, I believe, finally preceded New York City, but New York City is very high and very expensive to do projects. This is both for reconstruction as well as new comfort stations. What we're doing is we're now standardizing the design of our comfort stations so that it's not customized. We use the same design across the board so that we're hoping by putting it out to bid that it will bring down the cost. But this is something uh, that we would like to sit down to find out exactly what's going on. To some extent, it is somewhat out of our control. We put out to bid. The market looks at it and they're telling us this is what it'll cost to build a comfort station in New York. So again, I have rejected certain bids when they were approaching close to $4 million, but we had to tell the council members there's now going to be a four to six month delay because we had to rebid it out again because we found that price was too high. So this is something we're willing to talk more about with the council, but it is a concerning trend. And it's not just comfort station and parks, it's construction across the board in New York City. Comfort stations seem to be getting a lot of attention in headlines, but if you look across the board, whether schools, libraries, or any project, they're all seeing the same escalation across the board with construction prices and bids coming in. Okay. No, I certainly understand, and I think we're all equally frustrated. It's a booming industry. I mean, for those of us term limited out, we may have some options on building comfort stations in the future. Um, it's just frustrating, and I think, you know, while it seems like we're talking about bathrooms, but that's important to New Yorkers and residents, particularly parents with children. So in the same conversation, there was talk last year, uh, the City Council and Council Finance had been talking to Parks, the Borough Commission knows very well, but during the period of comfort station reconstruction, which typically is about a year or a year and a half, um, in the contract language of the contractor that's actually reconstructing uh, or renovating that comfort station, parents have asked about the idea of porta potties, portable bathrooms that could be provided in that particular park. But I know there's a cost, I know it's expense, but what about incorporating that in the contract so that the contractor will be responsible for the maintenance and operation of that portable? Uh, it can be looked at on a case-by-case -case basis. We want to make okay. sure that the park is secured uh, or whether that porta potty so to speak, can be secured in the evening. But we do it on a case-by-case -case basis. We can explore that as an option, and I accept that as a very good suggestion. Okay. And you talked about standardizing the design for comfort stations, but overall in park projects in general, the standardized process is also replicated throughout the entire design for all park projects, right? Have you guys made changes yes. internally? We are standardizing across the board. In the past, we had a lot of customized play equipment and play features that had to be fabricated. I was very concerned that that was increasing the likelihood of difficult maintenance, increased costs, and so we've now standardized all of our play equipment, comfort station designs, it's easier to get through PDC, it's easier for us to design one project after the other, so it has helped stabilize costs. We're still seeing the rise, but we're now stabilized and not increasing as much as we have. So standardization is good. You may not get a customized design like Domino Park, but from our perspective, our goal is to build as many quality parks as possible with a more standardized design, play equipment, comfort station, benches, et cetera. Okay. And a majority of the design is done in-house 
by the Parks Department, uh, which allows you a lot of leverage and opportunity to change the process. I think for the larger conversation when we have scoping meetings in our communities, um, you know, residents, we ask for everything because we know we're not building parks every day. But I will say that what I've seen, particularly in the Bronx, is that the standard design of parks has been changing. So where you have the opportunity to build the playground for smaller children, basketball court, I've seen fitness equipment incorporated into parks, and I think that's a great thing. And so that to me isn't an amenity, it should be a necessity. Um, if we talk about health and wellness, we talk about health disparities, I think fitness equipment should be a part of our overall scheme. So are those some of the things you're talking about in yeah. the design process where it's more standardized, but it also looks at creativity as well? Now let me clarify. Uh, each park has a budget, so although yes. we have scoping okay. sessions, we want to make sure we design it to live within the budget and not go over budget. We have changed our approach to parks. Rather than having an asphalt field, you'll see a lot more green, a lot more multi-generational with more seating. When we can afford it, we put in uh, additional adult fitness equipment. But the point I'm making is rather than customizing play units, for example, look like an airplane or railroad track, we use standard equipment we can purchase with a manufacturer versus having it fabricated. Same thing with the comfort station. We're going to a more standardized design that we can buy from manufacturer versus having it fabricated off-site. So that's the point I'm making, but we're now multi-generational parks, a lot more green, spray showers, multi-generational. That's the new design, but we put in it what is within the budget and what we can afford, and the public scoping is a tremendous asset to make sure we're getting it right. Okay. Uh, in your testimony, you talked about the Community Parks Initiative, uh, CPI, and I know there's $164 million average to do uh, reconstruction of about 30 CPI parks. Um, overall, we have two phases, phase one and phase two. So. I just speak for myself, but in the past year, I've opened Little Claremont Playground that you joined me in the Borough Commission, as well as Ogden Plimpton and Highbridge, and I really like the CPI initiative. I think it's great for smaller playgrounds in districts that have really been underinvested in for quite some time, and without this CPI initiative, I don't know that these parks would get any level of attention. Um, so my question is, how much uh, remaining work is to be performed in phase two of CPI? And of the total funding, how much have we committed so far to date? I don't know the numbers. I can tell you the number of parks. So there were 67 parks. The funding at the time was $318 million. We've now surpassed 40 of the 67, okay. and we expect to complete the rest of the 27 by 2021. So we're more than halfway, and I believe we're opening another two in June. Uh, so we're getting close to two-thirds completing the 67. And would you be open to discussing expanding CPI to address additional parks that could be in need? We are very open to expanding CPI, yes. Okay, great. I have one final question as I turn it back over to Chair Drum. Um, in the executive budget, there is a specific line item for the Bronx syringe cleanup crew, um, and this is $67,000 in fiscal 2019 and 269000 in fiscal 2020, and that's into the outer years for six city park workers positions to pick up syringes in the Bronx. So I wanted to see if you could provide a summary or an overview. Uh, what would their duties be? Are they only picking up syringes? And is the Bronx the only borough in which this is happening at this time? The answer is yes, we'd like to have more staff to pick up syringes. Uh, as you know, we have the disposal units that's only capturing about 10%. It's a pilot, it is working. Uh, but we do need additional staff to pick up the needles. And the answer is yes, you're correct. We're finding this uh, phenomenon, unfortunately, uh, in South Bronx. And so that's had been right now the epicenter of this syringe issue. And so we need more staff uh, out there to pick up these syringes so that they're not interacting with the public. Are the workers responsible for any other type of cleanup? I do know their primary responsibility is for syringes. Uh, the numbers, depending on the park, are quite high. And so okay. my recommendation is they focus primarily on picking up the syringes. Okay. It's not just one time. They're dropped there throughout the day. And so it's very important that we have uh, a full staff to address picking up those syringes in, I believe, about 13 parks in the Bronx. Okay. Do we identify the 13 parks just yes, yet? Yes, I can give you those numbers of 13 parks. We have them. Uh, 
All right, we can get you the specific Okay, that's cars. fine. I think it's okay, thank you. I'll turn it back over to the Chair Drum. Okay, thank you very much, Chair Gibson. We have been joined by Council Members Joe Nye, Levine, and Van Bramer, and now we're going to go to questions to Council Member Levine, followed by Joe Nye, and then King. Thank you so much, uh, Chair Drum and Chair Gibson. Uh, Commissioner and team, great to see you. Year after year after year, going back 20 years, the Parks Department is asked to do more with less. I, I hear that mantra every single year. You've been asked to innovate and find efficiencies and use technology, and I commend you and your team uh, for having been ever more creative in doing that. But at the end of the day, this is work that's powered by people. To maintain a park, it's, it, it requires people. And there's no way we're going to increase, we're going to improve maintenance if we don't have more people out there doing the work. There's just no, there are no more shortcuts left. And, uh, and, and that's why I've joined with the advocates, and, and Chair Drum mentioned this, in calling for dramatic increase in the funding uh, to make up for the cuts that have been endured by this agency over the decades. The agency... Uh, where, where the headcount is down some 30 plus percent from the peak in the 70s. We have one gardener for every 130 maintenance workers. I won't, I won't recite the statistics over, over PEP officers, which uh, are woefully inadequate, and the CPWs are really the front lines in maintenance. Um, and I, I, I want this hearing to be about uh, our, our goal of adding uh, very desperately needed staff to do this work. Um, but I, I, I am um, really upset that we're talking about losses to your headcount, um, which, yes, are being filled through attrition. But there, there, there's no more innocuous jobs to shed. And every CPW that you lose, it's just going to mean less maintenance done in a park. Um, it's going to impact the quality of maintenance if you lose even a few dozen workers because of, of just there's, there, there's no room to cut and there are no shortcuts here. Um, so it, it's just, it's imperative that we not cut the headcount. It's imperative that we restore what we lost over the decades. That really is the only way to um, to, to fix park ma park ma parks maintenance in the ways that we need to. And I know you addressed this with Chair Drum. Uh, I, I do want to pivot to capital for a minute. Um, you know, Hudson Yards is a bustling new neighborhood. It's got tens of thousands of new people who are going to be working and shopping and visiting and living there. So I'm very happy that we're going to get a new park there. But $375 million. Every single capital priority that I've probably articulated over the last five years, from completing river, riverfront access on the Upper East Side to buildings, building Queensway to 10 other things, could be done with $375 million. I don't think every important parks project I've advocated for combined adds up to $375 million. And this project, which again, I applaud, it came out of nowhere. I didn't even know it was in discussion until I saw it in the press. And I haven't found that my colleagues knew any more than I did. I'm not even sure the Parks Department knew. You probably can't answer that. But how did this $375 million emerge out of nowhere for one three-acre park when we have, and again, I, I, I support this park, but but we have priorities all over the five boroughs. There was not an open deliberative process on this. Where did this money come from? And can you uh, elucidate at all how a decision was made uh, for $125 million per acre in this one little park when we have so many big projects that are, are crying out for support around the city? Uh, Council Member, I appreciate the question. Uh, I'm sure the negotiation for this preceded my tenure, but it's something we'll certainly, uh, I'll inquire about and get back to you about how everything had transpired, but I don't have the answers for you today. So this was agreed to before uh, your tenure? 
as far as I do as you know, know the Hudson Yards project uh, that how this evolved proceeded at least before my tenure, so I'd have to get back to you on the particulars about how this uh, unfolded. I don't have answers for you today. I, I, I certainly never heard a price tag like that articulated. Uh, I'd, I'd like to dig into what the commitment was and what the financial commitment was. Um, who's building this park? Is it, is it your, your capital division or is this being? No, it's not our capital division, no. So uh, this is going to be built independently by uh, related? I'll have to get back to you on the specifics. I just don't know all the details about that. Okay, project. but as far as you understand, the money is coming from the city. That is my understanding, but it's something, again, I will have to get back to you on the details. Okay, this is just a massive project. Even by the scale of a park system, <laughs> where it costs $3 million to build a bathroom. This is a huge project, uh, $375 million for three acres. And I just think it's imperative that we understand, that the council understand, that the, that the public understand where the money's coming from, what was the, del the deliberation that led this to be a priority, and particularly who's building it and what the timeline. Um, it's really important that we understand that. Okay. Understood. All right, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you to the chairs. Thank you very much. Councilmember Joe Nye. Thank you, Chair. Um, it's so difficult to follow that line of questioning because I think we're all taken back by that dollar amount, uh, Commissioner. And I truly believe that I have faith in you that you're going to get back to us with some real explanations. That's a hell of a lot of money. It could have gone into so many other programs and it could have made differences for the entire city, let alone for a small area um, that very few will be able to benefit from. So I'm going to hopefully get you to come back to us with that information. I will come back to you with that information. I do want to continue on um, some of the questioning when it comes to the 90s the 150 maintenance workers, the $9.6 million that were stored, certainly it's not enough. Uh, we hear this throughout the city, and in particular in my district, I represent the largest park in New York City. We do not have it adequately staffed. Our parks are not being maintained. This is not this season. Parks, Orchard Beach is due to open this weekend. We know what the complaints are gonna be for the next several months. It's going to be about overgrown grass, lack of maintenance, lack of cleanups, um, illegal barbecuing, no enforcement, lack of tree removal, true impediments to the citizens that want to enjoy these open spaces. And I'm counting on you to make sure that the borough of the Bronx, and I don't want to over argue the need for my district compared to the others, because this is across the board. Perhaps we could use the $375 million from the Hudson Yards to properly fund Parks Department for all of their personnel needs and equipment needs, and we wouldn't have this discussion year in and year out, solve it for the next decade. But I do want to, we've talked briefly on the phone about the capital expenses, especially in comfort stations. We bring it up because what is the average square foot of a, of a, a comfort station? About 3,500 square feet. I just want to do some quick math with you. Is that the same size for Ferry Point Park? No, Ferry Point Park is larger. How much larger? Oh, I'm guessing only maybe three times the size. Okay, so then let's use the 3,500 on the average is three million now, because Ferry Point Park went as high as four million, I believe. We have not had something, no, comfort station of that size, we have not gone to four million. I believe Ferry Point Park has broken four million. No, four million, that's not, if you know there's somewhat of an amphitheater, it's elevated, it's about two to three times larger than a normal comfort station. So okay. it's not your typical, that's the customized design I was referring to that uh, Council Member Gibson, we don't do those kind of customized designs anymore. We go with a standard comfort station. So roughly it's about $900 a square foot using the 3,500 square foot model for a $3 million average price now for a comfort station. We build tenement buildings with elevators and roofs and all sorts of needs for a lot less per square foot. This is 
a few urinals, a few sinks, a storage area for main, no, no granite, no marble, no gold or silver at $900 a square foot. We're building hot luxury condos in Manhattan for less than that. Is this criminal? What is happening out there? Council member, I hear you and we have two options. The market is coming back, and we put it out to bid, and they're telling us this is what it's going to cost. I have two choices, accept it or reject it. Reject it. it. If, if the council member is prepared to wait the four to six months and then another four to six months to build it, that is something we can certainly contemplate. I have rejected high prices before, and we'll go back to the council members and tell them this will add four to six months delay as we rebid the project. Com Commissioner, council members have to be good stewards of taxpayer money. I don't think there's a single elected council member that will not make the argument that we should spend the limited resources wisely so we can get more out of the limited funding we have in Parks Department. I don't, and you can take a survey with me, I assure you they'll all agree to a delay and actually help you with the bidding process to make sure that more contractors bid, which is something that we spoke brief briefly about, and I have a meeting coming up with you on this. It is a joke. It's worse than a joke. It's actually pathetic and sad. And one of the issues I brought up on these comfort stations, and why comfort stations? Because it's nothing more than a bathroom, and it's not a nice bathroom on top of that. We should have been using prefabs. You looked at this six years ago, and I understand that no decision was made. It would have been a fraction of the cost at a fraction of the time, and we could have then hired the personnel that we need. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if you can answer on the prefab scenario. Why didn't we pull the trigger back then? We, I know we have a meeting coming up. We can go over the findings we found when we approached uh, the, the prefab. Uh, so I do know that meeting coming up will share with you uh, all, all the issues we found right. out. And it's very difficult to argue against something as small as a bike rack. Ferry Point Park, 6,000. Um, aqueduct, walk in Fordham Heights, I believe that was 1,500. But yet you can buy the same bike rack online for 450 bucks. How do we allow that to happen? When we accept the bids, it comes as a package. I wish we had the luxury of go through every item and pick and insert, but when you have a bid, it comes as a package. You accept the entire package. Uh, I don't know if there's a legal mechanism where we can start pulling apart the bids and isolating the cost of each item, but I'm just sharing with you the rules that I have to abide by. Either we accept the entire bid package or we don't. We can't cherry pick items we don't like and start examining the cost of each element. Uh, again, this is not unique to parks. I know comfort stations seem to be a poster child, but across the board in all agencies, we're all experiencing uh, an accelerating market when it comes to cost of construction. And Chair, my last question, thank you for the duration. Uh, Sixth Avenue, I believe it's called Little Red Square Park. It is a reconstruction of a park. They, the current work is going to be a two-year project. Staging areas taken up two blocks away, creating an impediment to five businesses. You have no access, no visibility, no view for a staging area two blocks away. You have just assured that those businesses are going to close down. One of the owners who recently opened up the restaurant after pumping hundreds of thousands of dollars into this restaurant, I said, I will make the repairs. I will do the work. I will not even charge the city because what you're about to do is bankrupt me. And the response is, you can't do that, we won't allow you, and there's nothing that you can do about it. Is this the partner that New York City is with our small businesses? 
Council Member, I'm not familiar with this particular construction project. When you say two years, that is highly unusual. Our construction is either a year or less. If it involves a building, it could be up to 18 months. But we'll certainly take a look at this one and get back to you. But I am not familiar with uh, this construction project, but we'll certainly follow up. There's dire straits for this business, so I appreciate a follow-up. And just a shout-out to my commissioner, Iris Rodriguez. The only complaint I have about her commissioner is she doesn't come from the Bronx. Aside from that, she's awesome. Thank Duly you. noted. Uh, we have another Bronx council member, Andy King. <laughs> yeah, Iris. <laughs> thank you, Chairs. Uh, and Commissioner, thank you again for educating us on the struggles you're dealing with um, in your department. Um, I have roughly about two or three questions. It goes back to the maintenance. I'd just like to know how do you decide the new the 150 that's brought on, how do you decide where they go? Is there a plan that you all have that when you open up new parks that you put maintenance people in there, you know, we call them parkies back in the day, um, to make sure that the, these new parks, as they open up, they just don't fall prey to elements and no one's in there constantly clean, keeping them clean? Well, the good news is 150 are already employed in the parks department, so basically they will now be continued for another year. So the gardeners that are in place will remain unless the borough commissioners, the chief of operations decide to place them somewhere else. They're already within the system, so they know how to deploy those staff. The same with the CPW, city park workers. They're already within our, our, our portfolio. We know where the allotment is, not portfolio, they're already within our uh, current uh, structure, and we know where to place them. And so within that, the borough commissioners and deputy, the chief of operations know how to deploy them uh, to the appropriate parks to make sure that they have the, the proper duties to do. So that's already taken care of. So as I understand, speaking with my commissioner, that you're limited with the number of bodies that you have to be at all the parks or any new parks. Well, the reason I'm bringing it up, because we just opened up a brand new park. It's beautiful. But when the kids come up there and we start a basketball with them, there's going to be debris. So who's going to be able to maintain their park, especially if we're kicking off the right. summer, if no well, one's regularly, regularly assigned to be there? To, to be clear, this agency has been very effective at using the resources that we have. If you look at the mayor's management report, every year, Parks Department meets, or most cases, exceeds mm -hmm. the target for cleanliness and condition, year over year. And it's something we look at at a monthly basis. If we see some modulations, we address those resources immediately. So across the board, in fact, I don't know if you remember this, but about two years ago, we shifted for the first time in our hot spot and high destination parks. We went from cleaning parks five days a week to seven days a week because I came to the conclusion if our parks are open seven days a week, we should be cleaning them seven days a week. So across the board, our numbers keep climbing on both cleanliness uh, and litter. Uh, and so now the parks are cleaner and we continually tweak and make sure we have the proper, uh, we have the proper resources and allocations in our parks to maintain that level of service. Next question. Uh, when it comes to whatever short budget you're trying to figure out, because the mayor say cut here, give us, do, do more with less. Do you have the opportunity to say, no, I can't do more with less. I need money, as, a, as opposed to just trying to conform and say, hey, listen, we just got to find those cuts when you know really you can't cut anything? Well, being management for probably about 20, 25 years, uh, my first role is to find out how to get the job done with the resources I have. I also understand the realities uh, that uh, the, the head uh, of the city, whether it be large or small, is under. The mayor was very clear about how cautious he wanted to proceed with the realities both in the state uh, and the federal government. And so my job is to help get the job done with the resources I have. Given more resources, I'll tell you, I'd be the first one to say, I will take additional resources, I will take additional funds to do the job I need to do, but I also have to work with my staff to make sure we get the job done with the resources that we have. And so that's where innovation comes in, efficiencies come in, and so I'm committed to make sure we keep the same level of quality service for all New Yorkers. Okay, thank you. My last question is this. Of course, we've all complained about the procurement process, the bid process, going out, taking decades sometimes to get some of these things accomplished. I think I mentioned this to you before um, about how maybe Parks Department looks at creating their own in-house infrastructure to deliver on park construction. 
as opposed to bidding it out. If you have your own concerted team on the 14th floor someplace, now every time you got a project you got to get done, you know those project costs are not going to go up because they are city workers, they're workers who work for the park, they're your own construction team. Is there a thought of ever trying to put a, a system like that in place so you're not held hostage to contractors who want to overprice, stick the city up, and then we're held at the mercy of their, because only if we can say no to them, and we say no to every project to get them to come down with lower bids, but now that we're at the mercy of them, they're just giving us numbers and we got to say yay or nay, but who loses at the long run? Communities who need new parks or need upgraded parks. So I'm just asking, is there ever a, a serious way, a thought of creating their own, your own internal system under you that y'all can manage without being held hostage to anybody else? We have done pilots where we used in-house staff to renovate comfort stations. Uh, it would take an army. We've heard the creation of a parks authority, and that would take state approval, uh, but we have experimented with in-house crews to do work internally. Uh, it took us uh, several months to do one conference station Staten Island as a pilot. We would need an army to shift gears, and so it's something we can talk about, but I'm not sure we can actually have a whole parks construction team for all the projects in the city of New York. We have 640 active capital projects, the largest of any agency. Mm -hmm. And so to have a workforce that can build, uh, we do about 150 at a time, uh, it would be a quite a large army. So it's something we can talk about, but I, I don't think it, it's, it's likely. Uh, I think if we keep figuring out how to lower the cost, go with standardized approach, have conversations with a general contractor to see how we can stabilize it, bring costs down, may be the better approach. Well, whatever that approach is, um, I heard a, a young man say a long time ago, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing, expecting different results. So we're still working in the same system, hoping that it would change. So I'm saying, how do we come up with a system that changes the game so no one can play the game the way they've been playing it and holding communities held hostage when we, we should be building parks and so, as opposed to people getting paid? Again, when you talk about a rack for 1500 we can get online for the city just got stuck up. So... Thank you for your testimony today, and thank you, and looking forward to us to figure out the, the madness of what you have to deal with each and every day. Thank you, Cheers. <laughs> thank, you. thank you very thank much, you. Councilmember King. <laughs> We're going to go back to Chair Gibson. Thank you again. Um, I have a few questions. Uh, the city has embarked uh, on a series of neighborhood rezonings, and in each of those neighborhoods, there's an expectation of potential population growth with X number of new units of housing, affordable, and others. Um, how does parks coordinate with the city, particularly DCP? Because if you have a neighborhood rezoning where you project anywhere from two to three, four thousand new residents, we expect expect and know that will be a burden on our open uh, space in our parks. So how does that work and does that mean that in a sense of areas that are seeing rezonings at a higher rate than others, would that be a priority for more staff because of the fact that you know those parks will be heavily used even more? I can tell you that the minute a rezoning is being contemplated, I'm very proud of this administration, parks is brought in on day one. And we have conversations about the open space resources in the area, if new park space can be, open space could be created or existing park space could be enhanced. Uh, anytime we do have a new park coming online, OMB is very good to make sure we have staffing levels for those new parks. Your questions about additional staff for existing parks, we do have cases where we can send out for seasonals to activate those parks in the summer with playground associates. So that's something we can certainly contemplate, and I, I thank you for that idea. But I can tell you with rezonings, uh, we're at the table early on giving input, and very often a lot of those recommendations are accepted, as you probably know from the Jerome Avenue rezoning, that parks plays a crucial role. People are looking, because density and open space go hand in hand, and we're very pleased a lot of those recommendations are accepted, in fact, are now being implemented as a result of those rezonings. Okay, well, no, I appreciate that, and, and as a member that went through a rezoning, all of that money was all capital, but we were also talking very, you know, deliberately around expense because we knew if we have 50, 60 million dollars for parks, we should make that equivalent to what that would mean in terms of staff. Um, and again, not just for those brand new parks because that's future staff, but the existing parks because in many of the cases of the rezonings, the housing is being built uh, before the parks are online. Well, in terms of the maintenance, I think we're okay because it's going to remain almost uh, the same, but 
we have our programming staff through our public programs division that are very flexible and can move around from park to park if we see them very crowded and want to offer some very unique services. So that's something we're very flexible at doing. Uh, we'll always keep an eye on maintenance. As I stated, we meet on a monthly basis. If those parks are not meeting their targets, we can easily make adjustments to make sure we meet those service levels in those individual parks. So it's something we monitor on a monthly basis, and if we see trends and changes, we'll address it either through programming or through additional maintenance support. Okay. Um, in the executive plan, there's $1.8 million of baseline expense funding for the pre-designed site testing analysis of capital projects. I'm not familiar with this process, so I wanted to know if you could provide me with an overview of what that looks like. Is it done in-house, and does every park project go through a pre-designed site testing analysis? Council member, thank you for that question. Nobody ever notices that one. Uh, because I figured it there's a cost the, to that. <laughs> there's one of the innovations of streamlining the capital process was that recommendation for pre-site investigation. Before I came on board, if a construction project would start, we could not investigate the underground condition because it wasn't capitally eligible. It had to be expense funding. So we go through design, we go through procurement, we go in the Bronx, start digging, we find a fire escape. The entire project comes to a halt. We have to tell the contractor we have to remove the fire escape or whatever else is underground before they can commence construction. This 1.8 now allows us to do pre-site investigation on sites we determine may have subsurface conditions. And so we're able to do about 40 to 50 sites a year, which means that are 40 and 50 sites that could potentially be delayed if we find something on the ground. So this was something I'd recommended. The administration gave us the 1.8 million, and we're able to do 40 to 50 sites pre-investigation so we don't get surprises when a contractor starts digging uh, to uh, renovate the site. Okay, that makes sense. And we're also talking about brownfield environmental work and things of that nature too? We do borings okay. and we do test Boring. the soil as well. So this has been, for us, a lifesaver, and it was the cause of many, many delays it, particularly in the Bronx, when they demolished a lot of buildings, they didn't take everything out. They just dumped it underground and poured dirt on top of it. So for us, it's been a huge benefit to do the pre-site investigation. Okay. We find the problems okay. before we start design, right. not when the contractors now starting to do the work. Okay, so you said 40 to 50 projects a year, so right. is 1.8 enough to start this work with our current portfolio, or would you believe that there would be money that would be needed moving Council forward. Member, we would accept more, uh, <laughs> but this allows us, so we're very strategic on how we use the 40 to 50. Staff is looking at old maps okay. and making a good estimate on where they think that 1.8 should be spent. Okay, okay, good. And I definitely want to keep talking about that. That was uh, something new, and I thought it should be a part of the conversation from the beginning, but yeah. I no, we started. We, we started back, I think, my second year. We made the recommendation, and it's been in place since, I believe, okay. 2015. Okay. And I wanted to ask a question about the synthetic turf reconstruction crew. Um, the fiscal 2020 executive plan, there's 678000 in fiscal 2019 and 827000 in fiscal 2020. And then in fiscal 2021, there's 747 uh, for seasonal synthetic turf reconstruction team that will replace all of the fields in the out years for basic repair and maintenance. So my question is, do you know how many seasonal employees that operation will require and in what parts of the city will they be operating? Oh, this team is something that I created. It's now a citywide team of synthetic turfs. We have about 180. Uh, in the past, we were relying on our MNO staff to maintain these synthetic turfs. We realized it takes real professionals to groom and monitor synthetic turfs and reconstruct them. So we have a rating system, and based upon the condition, synthetic turf has about an eight to 10 year life cycle. If you maintain it, it can go well beyond that period. And so they go across the boroughs and rate them. Both they clean them, maintain them, and in some cases repair them, but it's basically on a conditioned basis. So it's not borough by borough. They look at the 180 and determine which ones need to be replaced based on bad condition. And I can show you photographs, and if you see some of the bad ones, you certainly would agree those need to be done first. 
Okay, wow. Um, so this would, this just includes repair and maintenance, but what happens if it's in such poor condition there needs to be more than, you know, cosmetic work done? If there is a case of a full reconstruction, that down right. elevates to a capital reconstruction that could range for several million dollars to reconstruct the entire, they will determine whether it's a full capital project or whether it could be done with our existing staff. And okay. we hired a gentleman who leads up the team and didn't know there was a degree in turf management at a U Penn State, but he worked for the Yankees and Red Bulls and he knows how to really maintain synthetic turf. He's been okay. a great addition to our team. Okay, so I definitely want to ask a question for all my colleagues that represent the East River Park, particularly Councilmember Rivera. I know she's been working with you guys on this interim recreation plan. Um, there's 1.3 million in fiscal 2020 and 257,000 in fiscal 2021 um, and into the out years for the interim recreation. And this funding is being added to support the relocation of all the programming while the park is under construction. Um, do you have an idea of what the type of programming is that will be available to the public and is 1.3 million really enough? And most importantly, when is this expected to start for those well, of us that utilize that park? Well, we do believe the 1.3 million will be adequate. Uh, we're calling this really an enhancement. We don't want it to be interim. We believe this should be an ongoing uh, enhancement oh. to the Lower East Side. Uh, we've already identified the locations where we're going to do the enhancement. Uh, we are always flexible. We can ramp up if possible with existing resources. We're committed to the 1.3 uh, to do the initial work for the enhancements. And we're going to start that relatively soon. Okay. And of the 1.3, is is that PS and OTPS? Uh, is it's that 1 million in OTPS. 1 million. And then we have baseline two full-time playground associates, nine seasonal recreation positions to support the Playmobil. We have the summer sports experience and then general park programming. Okay, okay, great. Um, I wanted to ask about the water fountain lead testing. I think this administration has done phenomenal working with the council on all of the lead testing and lead abatement throughout the city, whether it's residents and public housing. Um, and so I was excited to hear the announcement on the news about testing all of our water fountains and the fiscal 2020 executive plan has 1.5 million in fiscal 2019 there's 2.2 million in fiscal 2020 and 200,000 in fiscal 2021 uh, the seasonal employees are repairing and replacing fountains that are found to be non-compliant with new lead regulations so my question is when will the results be made public can you give us an overview of the project how will be determining which fountains are getting tested um, and how many employees do you think you need to cover this full operation? Well, I'll answer the stats of the program. I'll let Commissioner Kavanaugh go over the specifics about the staffing. Okay. Uh, the results are on live now. They went online last night. So oh, uh, that's people, why I didn't see them last yes. night. <laughs> it went live uh, last night, so it's available to the public right now. Uh, what we're doing is that we have uh, a team going out that's doing testing. Uh, what they want, it, it, there's a period of time it needs to test them. Uh, once we test them, uh, that information goes online and then crews go out to do the necessary repairs. If it is found that there is uh, a, a negative reading on one of the fountains, it is now shut off and closed down until we can go out to repair it. But our expectation, it will complete the testing of all these fountains. The mayor is very committed to addressing this issue of, of lead and uh, we should be completed uh, by the middle of June. But right now, I can give you the website momentarily. Uh, it is nyc.gov backslash parks slash lead dash testing. Okay, lead dash testing. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Kavanaugh, if you wanna follow up on the staff resources. Mm -hmm. Uh, council member, we are testing all of the drinking fountains in the system, both indoor and outdoor. It'll am amount to about 3,600 fountains. The contractor began on May 6th. They have uh, tested, uh, as of this morning, a little over 1,500 fountains. Uh, we're starting to get the results. The results lag behind the actual testing. Uh, the process is, and you, you may see signs of this, they have to close off the fountain from, from use for a period of eight to, eight to 18 hours before they take the sample. So they cover the fountain the night before, they come back the following day, 
take the sample. They put a sticker on the fountain that tells the public that the fountain has been tested. Uh, when, it is, uh, when the lab results come back and uh, they're positive, we put a sticker on that says the fountain has passed uh, the, the test. If it does have an exceedance, there is another sticker on it that says the, te the, the fountain is temporarily out of service until it can be repaired. Um, so far, the results have been uh, encouraging. We, we do have some exceedances, but it's less than 5% of the fountains that have been tested. And while we will have all of the data on the website, the first iteration of the website just shows you which has passed and which, have, which fountains have exceedances. You can see that on a map. It's very clear. Uh, the, the, the ones that pass are in green. The ones that aren't are in red. We will be adding the specific data for each fountain as we go along. It's an enormous amount of information uh, that we have to put into a format that is easily understood online, but we are committed to making sure that all of the information is available about every fountain. And you say you expect this to all be completed by June or 3600? The initial testing. The, initial the repairs testing. are going to take more time. Obviously, it depends on, on how many fountains do need repairs. Uh, but the funding that was, the mayor provided in the executive budget is allowing us to hire 12 seasonal staff to focus exclusively on repairing those fountains. OK. And during the initial testing, what happens with the instances where those fountains are found to be non-compliant. They would be out of service, they're, or you would do a second test? They're immediately closed until we can make the repairs, take a second test, and confirm that they meet the standards. OK. And so while most of the announcement that, at least to my knowledge, we heard about this was really on the media, um, over the next few weeks, as we prepare for students leaving school in the summertime, um, I don't know if Parks has already done it, but I would love to see uh, some sort of a summary or, you know, just to give parents reassurance and New Yorkers that, you know, this is being done and, you know, should we urge New Yorkers to be cautious about drinking from fountains? I mean, I just want to make sure that, you know, we have all the information and if there are any inquiries, we have the answers that uh, a New Yorker may need. We have a lot of information uh, about the city's lead program, Lead Free NYC, uh, about the city's water system, uh, about the health impacts of lead on our website. So it's a, it's a good resource for anyone who is interested in information on this subject. Uh, in general, uh, drinking fountains are not a significant source of, of, of a lead uh, or, uh, or a risk of elevated blood levels by using fountains, but we want everybody to be confident that they can drink from our fountains and to use them uh, regularly when they're visiting our parks. And that's, that's really why we're doing this testing, to give people the confidence to know that the water is, is safe to drink. Okay, so do you know what the actual testing, um, does the contractor wait or let the water flow or does the, is the testing done as soon as they? they it, it, it's a standard protocol designed by the Environmental Protection Agency. There are two things that they do. They take the, uh, the initial, the first draw, that is the first water that comes out of the fountain is, is captured as a sample and tested separately. And then they do what is called a flush sample. They let the fountain run for 30 seconds, and then they take a second sample. And both samples are tested independently, and both results will be available on our website. OK, great. OK, thank you. That's very, very helpful to know. Um, those are all of my questions. And I guess just to summarize, um, I really, again, appreciate you, Commissioner Silva. You have been everywhere, all across the city. And I especially appreciate the priority and the attention given to the Bronx. Um, it's not always been the case. And so as a Bronx council member, I do recognize that you know this is really an administration and an agency that cares equally about all five boroughs. And that's important for me. Um, to the high bridge, pedestrian bridge that we opened a few years ago, which is the oldest New York City walking bridge that we have in the city of New York, to all of the parks we've renovated and opened. I really appreciate the work. But I certainly want to emphasize again from the council's perspective, you know, we don't want to lose focus on the workforce. The workforce is huge. The seasonal workers, the full-time workers, the associates, the rangers, 
everyone is super important. And I really think, again, the interagency coordination with HPD, with DCP, with all the housing, all the construction that's going on across the city, the expectation, the assumption that I always make are school-age children, my school district, and my parks and my mass transit. Those are the three areas in which I always focus on because you have to expect that people are you know, frequenting the local parks and we want them to do that. And I think as we continue to have these conversations, particularly around budget time, I just wanna make sure that we recognize the need for workers. Um, while I know you acknowledge that you believe that it's sufficient, I certainly always wanna say we can always use more. Um, and certainly my borough, we can always use more workers because they work really hard. And I find myself oftentimes, since we have such an eruption of homeless New Yorkers across the city, particularly street homelessness, um, they're coming out and they are in our parks and playgrounds. And these are truly New Yorkers that need help and sometimes they're not getting it and they use our parks. And so we have to deal with that. And there are times when we call upon parks because we do wanna make sure. Um, one of the concerns that we were hearing from constituents on the ground because of the needle and the drug usage that we've seen in some of our parks, some of our comfort stations were closing early because of that, because we believed that individuals would go and shoot up in the bathroom. And so that was happening. And so again, we deal with it on a local level, at a you know community level, but I think overall the message is, is that we all have to work together. Just as much as DHS is working on homelessness, we have to be a part of those conversations too, because they're using parks and many other places, because these are people that need help. So at the end of the day, I would love more workers. Thank you for your work. We look forward to our continued conversations over the next few weeks as we adopt a budget that is truly reflective of our priorities, which means more workers. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank, you, Thank you very much, uh, Chair Gibson, and I certainly hope that uh, we can work out this Travis Park issue. So I appreciate the fact that you've come in and uh, discussed the issue with us and, uh, and, and about all the parks as well. I have to read a statement, so and then I'm just going to finish after that. This concludes our hearing for today. The Finance Committee will conclude its executive budget hearing for fiscal 2020 tomorrow, Thursday, May 23rd, 2019, at 10 a.m. in this room. Tomorrow, the Finance Committee will hear from the Department of Finance, the Controller, the Independent Budget Office, and the public. The public portion of tomorrow's hearing will begin at approximately 12 p.m. in this room, and that's a change from what it was originally. We will begin at 12 p.m. For any member of the public who wishes to testify but cannot make it to the hearing, you can email your testimony to Finance Division at financetestimony at council.nyc.gov, and the staff will make it a part of the official record. Thank you, and this hearing is now adjourned.